Hello, hello. I believe we are getting to the point where we are now live on YouTube for episode three of Bright Green Live. Now, the first couple of minutes, I'm going to be doing a few technical things, just a bit of bits and pieces of admin to make sure that everything is running smoothly. So I can see there are some things going on my screen. That's good news. Uh, and if you just bear with me for one or two minutes, I will uh, be with you very, very shortly. So apologies, as you will almost definitely be able to hear me typing and playing around on my computer. That's all perfectly normal. That's just the usual turbulence of getting the show ready to go and getting making sure everything has gone out in all the places it's supposed to go out. So as I say, bear with me for just one or two minutes and I'll be with you very, very soon. Okay, it's perfect. That is step one of my admin done. On to step two. And it won't be long until we can get going proper with episode three of Bright Green Live. Thanks for those of you who are just joining us. I am just in the process of doing a few bits and pieces of admin to get the show ready. Please bear with me just for a couple of minutes and we will be able to get the show started properly once I am done. Uh, thank you for joining us. One minute and I'll be there. Apologies for the slight delay, just doing a couple of bits of pieces of admin. Once that's all out of the way, we'll be ready to go. Please, whilst you're waiting, let me know how you're doing in the chat. Um, and yeah, and let us know where you're watching in from and how you're doing any fun facts on how you're feeling on this slightly cold Sunday morning. I am just getting a few bits and pieces ready and we will very soon be starting proper. Welcome Adriana, thanks for joining us, great to have you uh, watching today. I think you've watched on previous episodes too, so great to have you back. If I've remembered rightly, if I remembered wrongly, welcome for the first time. Uh, thanks everyone for bearing with me. Just a couple more things to sort out and then we will be good to go. Brilliant, we've got a few people joining us on the stream now. Um, fantastic to see you all. Um, I'm on my last piece of admin, I promise, and then I'll be with you very, very shortly. Get yourself a cup of tea, get yourself nice and comfortable. You're watching the uh, slightly uh, fumbly start to episode three of Bright Green Live. And everything will be kicking off in around one minute's time. Apologies for you hearing the general laptop noises as I get everything ready for the stream. <clears throat> Also, apologies in advance, I've been coughing and sneezing all morning, so uh, you have that to look forward to. I'll do my best to keep it to a minimum, but just a bit of forewarning. Fantastic. Okay, I believe that is the last of my bits and pieces of admin. I'll just check one final thing before I welcome you all. That's not worked. Apologies. Aha, let's try that. Hold on a further two or three seconds and I'll be with you. Get some cup of tea, get some nice cup We're about to kick things off. Okay, fantastic. I think... I'll do for now. I'll sort out other things later on. So thank you all so much for joining me this morning. Uh, you are watching episode three of Bright Green 
live. Uh, for those of you who are new to the show, Bright Green Live is a show that streams on the second Sunday of every month, bringing you interviews with some of the most exciting guests from across the left, from social movements, from the trade union movement, from green parties. And in future episodes, we will be having some guests from culture and the arts too. We have an absolutely stacked lineup of guests to treat you all with today. Uh, before I introduce any of them, I have one thing to ask of you, which is that you scroll down right now and hit that subscribe button. The reason I'm asking you to do that is because if you enjoy this show, you'll enjoy all the other shows every uh, month that we put out of Bright Green Live, but also all the other videos, the interviews, the content that we're putting out in between as well. The best way you can keep on top of all of that is to hit that subscribe button. It means you'll get a little notification every time we go live, every time we put out a video, and you will have a wonderful time. So with that out of the way, I'm going to now briefly introduce our show for the day. So we have an incredible 10 guests joining us between now and 6 p.m. It's a long old slog. We're here for eight hours, but it's worth every minute. So kicking off the show in around nine minutes time, we have the co-conveners of the Scottish Green Party Trade Union Group, uh, Jen Bell and Niall Christing. The two of them are going to be talking about the work the Scottish Green Party Trade Union Group are doing to um, support worker-driven policies within the Scottish Greens, but also the role that the Scottish Greens in government have played in supporting the struggle and uh, fight of workers in Scotland. Following them at 11 o'clock, we will have Jo Bird. Now, Jo Bird is a councillor in the Wirral. She's a Green Party councillor, but she was first elected as a Labour Party councillor. So we're going to be talking about why she decided to join the Green Party, the differences in her experience of being a Labour councillor and now a Green councillor, and also what the wave of defections of councillors from the Labour Party to the Green Party of England Wales um, has means for the future of the Greens. At 12 o'clock, I'm incredibly excited that we have the editor of The National, Laura Webster, joining us. We're going to be talking about what her vision is for the future of that paper. And naturally, given the nature of that paper, we're also going to be talking a little bit about the uh, current strength of support for Scottish independence. Um, that's going to be a brilliant, uh, a fantastic, fascinating conversation. Uh, it's kicking off at 12 and I hope you will stick around for it. Later in the day, we're going to be joined by John Bosco and Wobo from the anti-privatisation campaign group We Own It. Uh, I'm going to be talking to John Bosco about NHS privatisation, uh, what it is, to what extent it's, ta it's uh, taken hold in the NHS, um, how we can fight back against it, and specifically We Own It's campaign to try and get local NHS trusts uh, to... Uh, end outsourcing in the NHS in their area. After John Bosco, we have Ami Dhaliwal, who is one of the two deputy leaders of the Wales Green Party. Now, in May 2022, the Wales, the Wales Green Party had record-breaking uh, results in the local elections. Uh, prior to that uh, set of elections. The Greens had just one councillor in Wales. They now have over half a dozen. We're going to be talking about the impact those councillors have been having in Wales since those elections and also uh, the future prospects for the Wales Green Party and what Welsh politics looks like in the future. Uh, still uh, still going at 3.15, we will be speaking to Chloe Naldrett from Just Stop Oil. Now, many of you will be familiar with Just Stop Oil. They are a climate campaign group that's focused on uh, direct action, quite provocative direct action, disruptive direct action. Uh, many of their uh, campaign um, initiatives and stunts and activities have garnered a lot of media attention. I'm going to be talking to Chloe about uh, Just Stop Oil's plans for mobilisation in 2023, in the new year that we find ourselves in. Uh, following Chloe, I have Tom Brake, who is the director of Unlock Democracy. And what we're going to be talking about is the proposals that came forward from Gordon Brown uh, late last year on the future of Labour, the Labour Party's policies on democratic reform. So we're going to be talking about what's in those proposals. 
specifically, we're going to be talking about uh, things like the proposed House of Lords reform, but also we're going to be talk talking about where those proposals fall short and the kind of democratic state that we want to build. Our penultimate guest will be Sonia Adasara. Now, Sonia is a NHS doctor and a campaigner. She's a um, very, very effective communicator in the media, regularly doing the media rounds uh, on campaigns around the NHS. Um, she's a leading uh, anti-privatisation campaigner and has been involved in campaigns to uh, oppose things like uh, the NHS surcharge for uh, migrants. We're going to be talking about the state of the NHS what's really going on in the NHS crisis, the issues that are underpinning the big industrial disputes that are taking place in the health service right now, and the role that privatisation has played in all of that. And finally, at the end of the day, I'm going to be speaking to Phelim McCafferty. Now, Phelim is the leader of Brighton Hove City Council. He's the Green Party leader of Brighton Hove City Council. And uh, he took over as leader 18 months ago. And we're going to be talking about the record of the Greens in the administration in Brighton Hove over the last 18 months and the prospects of the Greens uh, continuing to hold that administration after the May elections uh, later this year. So that's our show. It's an absolutely stacked lineup. I uh, very much hope you'll be able to join us through as much of the day as you can. Um, throughout the show, I'm going to be putting my questions to the guests that we have uh, throughout. But what's really valuable about this show is that you get to put your questions to our guests as well. So please, please, please do pop your questions in the YouTube chat for any of our guests and I will do my best to put them to them. Now, the easiest way to make sure that your questions get asked is to get them lined up nice and early. So if you have any questions for our first guests, uh, which is Jen Bell and Niall Christie, they're going to be join us, joining us concurrently, who are the co-conveners of the Scottish Greens, then please do pop them in in the chat ASAP and I'll do my very very best to get to them. So we have 10 people watching that's absolutely brilliant that uh, this early on a Sunday morning people are tuning in but I know that more people will want to watch this video and the best way to ensure that more people watch this video is to do just two things. The first of them is to hit that like button. By hitting like it means that it tells the YouTube algorithm this is the kind of video that people like to watch and it means that it'll appear in more people's feeds. The second thing that you can do to really make sure that more people get to see the show is to share the stream on your socials, preferably using the hashtag bright green live. Now, if you do all those things, it means that more people will get to enjoy the show. More people will be able to hear from our brilliant guests. And if you're going to enjoy the show, then many, many other people, I am sure, will too. So make sure that you share the show link and hit that like button. I will very, very shortly be joined by our first guests of the day, who will be Jen Bell and Niall Christie from the Scottish Green Party Trade Union Group. Please do let me know any questions that you want asked uh, in the chat, and I will do my best to come to them. Uh, so throughout the show, we are going to be speaking to a whole host of guests. They are some of the most important, interesting, inspiring people on the left of British politics. Um, and you have an opportunity to ask them questions. So make sure you get them in the chat. Um, throughout the show as well, I would really uh, love to hear your thoughts on guests that we can have on future shows. So again, pop those in the chat as and when. And I can see that our two guests, uh, first two guests are in the waiting room. So I am going to kick us off with our very, very first interview. Um, and as the two of our guests uh, join the call, and they should be joining imminently, and I just have to do the tech to make sure they're joining in the right way. And that is perfect. As they're connecting, as they're getting ready, I am just going to do a quick intro for them. So this morning, our first guest on episode three of Bright Green Live. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by the two co-conveners of the Scottish Green Party Trade Union Group, uh, Niall Christie and Jen Bell. So first of all, Jen, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hiya, thanks for having us. Uh, I am doing good. Uh, thanks for asking. And thank you so much, Niall, for joining us as well. Niall, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Chris. How are you? I am 
also well. I'm just having a little bit of a problem with my audio, uh, which I think is just on my end, but I think I've now fixed that. So that is great. So we're going to kick off straight away. Um, and obviously there's two of you on the the, the call. So uh, please do feel free to choose who wants to answer the questions and jump between the two of you. Let's make it as free flowing as possible. Um, so obviously we're having this conversation today um, at a time where we're experiencing an unprecedented amount of um, industrial militancy, of trade union action, of strikes, of industrial action. And that's the biggest kind of wave of industrial action we've seen in the UK for a generation. Um, I wanted to ask you what the Scottish Green Party Trade Union Group is doing at the moment to support workers in those struggles. Jen, do you want to go first? Uh, I sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing is um, raising money for um, the striking trade unions. So in August, we had Solidarity Fundraiser uh, in collaboration with the Rainbow Greens, and uh, we raised about £600 in um, the space of an evening. Um, and that was raising money for striking unions throughout 2022 um, and going forward. And what also we've been doing is, um, is basically approaching uh, tr uh, trade unions and collaborating with them to bring legislation through to the Scottish Parliament. Um, because we don't take their support for granted, um, we, really have to, we really have to earn it. And I'm sure now we'll be able to build on that. Yeah, I suppose it's worth saying, um, you know, Jen and I took over the, the co-convener roles in June. Um, since then, we've met with, I think, over 20 unions, um, which I suppose is a drop in the ocean of how many there are in, in the UK that are active at the moment, particularly with um, the amount of industrial action, like you said, Chris. But, you know, we have had meetings with everyone from Unite, who obviously are Labour affiliated, all the way to the IWGB um, and different branches of the UVW, who are independent. So, you know, we are trying to cover as many bases as possible. Um, and the other thing we're saying is, you know, we've had meetings with people at Unite, what Jen mentioned about the Get Me Home Safely um, campaign about legislation that, you know, Maggie Chapman, who's one of our MSPs and I think has been on Bright Green Live before, um, she's bringing legislation through the Scottish Parliament. You know, we, we had spoken about that with both Maggie and um, the team at Unite um, back in July when we first met them. And, you know, this is kind of built up over the last six months and Maggie's taken that on kind of full throttle. And, you know, that's that's not to even mention the work that gets done at council level, um, you know, in, with different green councillors across Scotland. So, you know, there is a, a significant amount of work that we we are, I see, my, I see us as facilitators really, um, because what we do is we put people in touch. You know, the Greens do occasionally have, um, whether it's a perceived one or a real one, there is there is a bit of a class issue with the Greens. You know, whether whether we're seen as the middle class um, kind of Green Tories or environmental Tories, or whether we're seen as just young people who have who are a bit too idealistic. You know, we we can't really win in that sense. So what we do is put a kind of definitive face on trade unionism and um, kind of working class values and um i suppose a point of contact so you know gmb got in touch with us during um one of their uh, disputes um in september i think and we immediately set up um a meeting with i think we had five of our seven msps who came along to that that was great and that meant the gmb had the direct, a direct line to our elected members so you know we we don't really um you know we aren't decision makers in that sense you know we we have politicians and um, kind of internally elected members should do that but I suppose what we do is uh, give workers a voice both both people who are green members in our trade unionists but also workers who we would want to be green members what would want to be green voters and you know should be green voters quite frankly. Aye because our primary purpose is to um, get greens involved in the trade union movement and to build those links um, coming out from us so that then they come back to us um, and creating that that mutual link um, because historically, trade unions might have been suspicious of uh, the green movement um, uh, at best. And uh, the best thing that we can do is just approach them with good faith and like build those collaborations and show that we are actually serious and sincere about working with them um, because they're not like our personal lobbying arms, they're not our personal piggy banks, they're fellow democratic organizations that we have to approach in, in good faith and um, push our mutual interests and show that green issues are not this kind of esoteric middle-class concern, but they actually are working-class issues. And you know, people at the, uh, at the bottom of, 
of capitalism are the ones who are at the sharpest end of the stick when it comes to these things. So you've touched on it a little bit there and I want to pick up on it a little bit more. Um, I wondered if you could talk about why you think it's so important for Greens in particular to support the struggle of trade unions. Um, because I think that um, Green values and, and trade union values are very similar. They're, they're intrinsically linked. Um, if you want a society that is based on social equity and local democracy, then you're going to want to support trade unions because we spend most of our lives in the workplace. Um, so having worker-owned, worker-controlled uh, workplaces is how we build democracy from the ground up and how we distribute wealth and, and power to historically marginalized groups within society. Um, and if workers aren't involved in the process of decarbonization, democratization, then what's going to happen is that we're going to sleepwalk into um, into a society where the usual suspects, the people who have benefited from colonial capitalism um, and environmental destruction just change their suits. And then the historic um, uh, structures of uh, inequality um, are unaddressed. I suppose it's probably worth saying, um, Chris, that obviously Jen touched on a lot of the kind of democratic side of things. There is the environmental side as well. And, you know, I've, I've written it down because I made some notes beforehand and I wrote down no jobs on a dead planet because I realise it's a cliche and I realise that, um, you know, it's something that if you're, if you're watching this this video, you're probably well aware of. But it's really worth saying that, you know, a lot of the worst offenders are the same people. Uh, the worst offenders when it comes to workers' rights, when it comes to pay, when it comes to conditions, are the exact same people who are kind of, uh, you know, just pushing, in, uh, you know, ecological crime. You know, the fact, fundamentally, these people should be in court for multiple reasons. Um, and you know, often, you know, if it's an environmental group like Just Stop Oil, they don't have a direct line to that. Trade unions give people a direct line to leadership of companies, to leadership of workplaces. Um, and it gives a level of accountability that just wouldn't be there otherwise. And it's it's fun, it's fundamental to the green movement that we have that direct line to leadership. Um, you know, look at look at the the you know, rail strikes are a perfect example. You know, the RMT have been out for um, well, I suppose months now. Quite frankly, is over 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 six months. They've been they've been um, they've been out and you know they've they've settled in Scotland, but there is obviously still the network rail issue. Um, and you know we have we we were out with we've been on picket lines with the RMT. We have RMT members within the trade union group who are very active. Um, they take a very strong line on this, which is great. But you know one of the reasons we should be supporting them is you know you've got John Bosco on from We Own It later on. You know real real ownership is a as a real issue. Um, we've got private companies who are the ones, you know, obviously there's there's the government have a say in this due to contract, but fundamentally we have private companies who are dictating what should be public infrastructure, which would make a massive environmental difference. And in doing so, they're absolutely shafting workers. You know, that that those those two things are intrinsically linked. And it's I suppose our job to an extent to show your kind of greener greens within the Scottish Greens and and you know, down south and um worldwide, I suppose there should be that kind of conversation but it's it's down to us to an extent to point that out and make sure that there's still a light being shone on that constantly and so oh sorry jen did i cut you off there oh i no i just wanted to add that um you know a central green issue would be uh having um good accessible public transport that is affordable for everybody and that's like a workers issue as well you know if you live in for instance um a car dependent city uh, the cost of owning and maintaining a car has a downward effect on your wages. Uh, if you're if you're on a low income, that's going to have a disproportionate effect on you and your economic opportunities and your ability to contribute to the local economy. Um, so, taking these kind of esoteric issues and translating them into um, concrete talking points um, that have a real effect on, on workers' lives. It's how we win the argument, it's how we uh, are able to push for these changes that not just uh, help the planet, but also help workers. So I'm going to, I've got two more questions I wanted to put to you, but before I go to them, I just wanted to, for everyone watching, encourage you to pop any questions that you have for Jen and Niall in the chat, and I'll try and pick up as many as of them as possible at the end. So before we go to questions from the chat, um, 
You've mentioned uh, the two of you, some of the uh, work that's already been done by the Scottish Greens, for example, the uh, Get Me Home Safely campaign and um, Maggie Chapman championing that in the Scottish Parliament from the uh, the work that Unite has done. And I wanted to sort of ask you whether there were any particular other areas of policy um, that you want to push for within the Scottish Greens to uh, shift the party's policy, but also to get MSPs um, pushing on at a parliamentary level. I, I suppose we're quite early this year. Um, so, um, you know, as as a Democratic Party, we have a cycle where policy can be kind of created and influenced by regular party members, which fundamentally that's that's all Jen and I are, which is, you know, which is great that we have that kind of voice, but it does mean that, you know, we will have to be prepared and, you know, we 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 have other jobs. We have um full-time jobs that mean that, you know, we have to we have to balance things. Um, and one thing we're really keen to do is it's only January, you know, we're only just over a weekend of the new year, but we're already thinking about um conference for next year and bringing forward policy ideas. So um that conversation is just about to start. Um, we have in recent months been talking to unions a fair amount about the National Care Service. So obviously for people who are watching from outside Scotland um, or who might not be aware, um, part of the um, Scottish Government's deal with the Scottish Greens is that there, there will be legislation brought forward on the creation of a National Care Service um, in Scotland in some shape or form. However, since the... Um, discussions have started at Holyrood level. Um, there has been some concern. There have been some concerns raised, but by unions, not just any any in particular, but you know the STUC, for example, who are obviously the membership body for unions, as well as Unite, the GMB, Unison, who have all been very helpful in getting in touch with us. Gillian McKay leads on that um, for the Greens at Parliament level. Um, we had uh, the last thing we did before we took a, a break over Christmas, um, and the last thing we did before we came on today, Chris really um for us although it has been a month was we can we hosted well we didn't we hosted the discussion um with a green councillor uh, uh claire claire miller um joy mckay and then we had representatives from unite the stuc in unison on to talk about the national care service and where we go from here and how we can improve it um you know i, I said earlier on we are we are largely facilitators but we do have a massive say in what we focus on I get the impression the National Care Service will be a large part of that, um, just because of how broad it is. You know, it covers adult social care, that kind of thing as well. And with things like the privatisation angle, um, or the privatisation versus public ownership angle, as well as, um, you know, collective bargaining, that kind of thing. You know, there, there is still, it is still up in the air as to whether any or all of that could be included in the National Care Service bill and whether it should be. Um, and I suppose that's going to be a, a big focus for us in the next few months anyway i would again you don't know what's going to happen there could be another pandemic around the corner but if i was to if i was a betting man i would suggest that that'll, that'll take up a fair bit of our time in the next few months was there anything you wanted to add jim um i um the only thing that i was going to add was um so at the um at our last autumn conference uh, we passed a motion supporting the stuc scotland demands better campaign um and that was a um that was a collaboration with STC, Poverty Alliance, Living Rent, um, a whole bunch of um, trade unions uh, operating in Scotland. Um, that was ahead of the uh, ahead of the uh, budget, um, pushing for uh, more progressive income taxation, new local taxation um, to redistribute wealth, um, property taxes, um, you know, uh, municipal energy companies. Um, fair work enforcement, a lot of things which um, were um, already in the uh, the Green Manifesto in 2021, um, and a lot of things that we went into um, and were pushing for when we uh, signed up to the Butte House Agreement. Um, and the way that I see it is that um, the SUC's campaign, the People's Plan for Action, um, is what gives more strength to the Butte House Agreement. Um, it gives more of a backing, um, so that it's not just uh, the the Greens are demanding it. It's also the Greens and the trade unions um, are demanding it too. And if we can be have a united front on that, we can push for uh, for more of that. Then we're going to get more out of it. Um, and there was some of that in the in the budget. Um, you know, there was a, I think a percent was raised on the higher and the top rates of income tax. Um, but 
I mean, there's more to do and uh, we can push further on that. Um, so that's what we're just going to be doing um, in the next couple of months is, um, is just making sure that this, um, this next budget is doing the most that it can to protect the people who are going to be hurt the most by it. If I, Sorry, I, can, I can come back yeah, in. Go ahead now, yeah. uh, w- one of the things, you know, we've been talking for a wee while now, and I think it's worth under, underlining that, you know, as well as the MSPs who do fantastic jobs, um, we do have, you know, a record number of councillors from earlier this year, which if you follow Bright Green, you'll be very aware of, which is great. What I would say is, we, as well as kind of big councillor groups in Edinburgh and Glasgow, and then a kind of smaller one in, in, uh, in the Highlands, we do have a lot of councillors who are on their own and who don't have the kind of necess- necessary expertise all the time to deal with everything that gets flown at them. Um, often they're in smaller branches. So, you know, like South Lanarkshire, for example, which is, you know, not traditionally a particularly green area, but we got a councillor there for the first time, which is fantastic. And that's nothing, that's due down to nothing but hard work there. However, we now have a councillor there who is on her own and, you know, short of the, the, the local branch and Gillian, who's the, the central MSP for the area you know, they're kind of left on their own. So one, one of the things we, we are looking to do is kind of support councillors as well. You know, it's, it's a lot of the kind of big, the high level work happens at Hollywood, which is just natural. But we do have excellent councillors and, you know, they put motions forward all the time. And um, they also sift through thousands of pages of paper every single week. And often that's on, you know, payments that will affect workers, um, settlements for the year or, um things that will affect jobs going forward. You know, the, these are important issues that we can help with and we can support with. And we, we have offered, and there's been a couple of instances so far where people have come to us and say, look, can you give us a hand? Because this isn't necessarily in my wheelhouse or, you know, simply they don't have time. Councillors are underpaid and overworked anyway. So giving them something that will require a little bit of background reading is a lot to ask. Whereas we're there, we already made, you know, union reps, um, people with expertise in that area, you know, they can come to us and we can help them out. Um, and that's that's something that I think that it, when it comes to policy, you know, Jen mentioned local democracy earlier on and affect and change at a very small level. You know, Hollywood's great, but it's a behemoth and it takes time. You know, we mentioned Maggie Chapman try to bring a bill through Parliament. That, you know, that isn't something that's going to happen in the space of a couple of months. However, we do have motions that can come forward that cancel every month or so, depending on where you are in Scotland. And those can be kind of put into policy almost immediately, which is, you know, it requires work behind the scenes and work for the councillors to try and get support from elsewhere because we don't have anywhere in Scotland yet where, um, and I say yet optimistically, we don't have anywhere in Scotland yet where the Greens have kind of a majority on the council or anything like that. You know, we are still, you know, in opposition or one of the smaller groups in any anywhere that we do have representation. But that's somewhere where people can see a very quick response um, on the ground and also if you live in an area you're more aware of what's going on so whether that's you know you'll get me home safely started off as a, a green councillor um motion you, like in the previous term it's not even something that's working on now it predates jen and i jen and i's term this is something that we're doing and we want to see more of that um quite frankly so i think that as well as um pushing at high levels you know taxation that kind of thing they're really important but making sure that uh, councillors um, all across Scotland have support from us is absolutely vital. And we do have a councillor rep, Dan Hutchison, who is one of the fantastic new councillors in Govan, um, and he's been he's been doing a fantastic job at keeping people in the loop. Um, but we we do need more of that. So you know, if we have any councillors who are watching, anyone who has a branch in Scotland who wants a little bit of support from us, you know, just drop us an email and um, get in touch, and we'll happily um, have a chat. That's not a problem. So there are loads of lovely messages in the chat of support for what you've been saying and solidarity, including from, uh, I think, members of your committee. So Bryce Goodall has said uh, solidarity to Jen and Niall. Uh, They're the equalities officer for the trade union group. Um, But we don't have in the chat yet is any questions. So this is my last final request for any questions for Niall and Jen before I put my last question to them. Uh, Please do get them in now so that I can try and put any that you want to them. Uh, So my final question for you is um, obviously the Scottish Greens are in a unique position uh, for Greens in the UK in that you're the only uh, Green Party that is currently in government. what do you make of the record of the Scottish Greens in government on workers' rights and on unions? 
I mean, I mean um, I'm happy to kick that one off, Jen. Um, I so what one of the things that Jen and I did when we when we first took over in the summer um, was that we started a review of the Beat House Agreement. You know, we're, we're a year, well, over a year in now into the Scottish Greens being in government. And, you know, I don't like to make assumptions because everyone has their own opinion on this. Obviously, it was put to a vote um, of members at that um, back in August 2021. But we are a year on now, you know, you would expect some sort of movement on things. And what we want to do is touch base with trade unionists in the Scottish Greens and uh, also the elected reps and trade unions um, to see what they thought of it, quite frankly. So um, over the last few months, um, and this is excellent timing, Chris, because we're actually going to publish it tomorrow, um, but we have been carrying out a review for the last um, kind of three or four months or so um, of you know what people think. So we've reached out to different trade unions. We've had national, national secretaries who've, who've um, kind of given us some feedback all the way to just you know our, our ordinary members of the trade union group in the Greens who are telling us what they think about the Greens record, what they think we, has been done well, which there have been uh, undoubtedly um, have been things that have gone really well. There have been also things that I would argue, and I think the consensus seems to be that the Greens could have gone slightly further um, on, th- on various things. The National Care Service is one. Um, there's particularly among... Um, people who work in the the care sector or in the health sector, there is definitely a concern that um, the National Care Service is not what was promised originally, um, not just by the Greens, by the SNP as well. And it's important that we make sure that the Greens are in held to account for everything that doesn't go well in the next four years and for the previous year as well. Worth saying, though, the Greens' re- re- responsibility, in my opinion, and I think um, in the opinion of lots of our members, is that we are there to to push the SNP to do things that they wouldn't normally do. Otherwise, what's the point of us being in government? We, we need to be pushing them to be more radical. Personally, um, I, I'm i not convinced that that's the case. I think that a lot of the things that we're seeing that are being bandied around as um, wins are things that could have happened anyway. For example, income tax going up by a penny and higher rates at the moment. You know, that's not... Um, in my opinion, something that the SNP would have been too scared to do anyway. You know, we are in a cost of living crisis and they do, the SNP rely on working class votes fundamentally. So, you know, that's something they would have had to consider anyway. Um, you know, we are much closer to what would be considered the default or the establishment position with um, the budget than what would be proposed by the STUC, for example. Um, and, you know, the Greens aren't used to being outflanked by Labour. You know, we aren't... Um, particularly on the left, you know, we have been the radicals in the room pretty much for, well, as long as I've been interested in politics, the Greens have been to the left of Labour on pretty much everything. Um, even even with, you know, a Corbyn government and let's, you know, there's no point in talking about the Labour leadership. Everyone everyone on this call knows that there are, there are flaws there. However, there are MSPs in the Scottish government who, who are Labour MSPs who are very good at what they do. And they have outplanked the Greens. And I think that that's made a lot of our MSPs uncomfortable because they aren't used to being the ones who are being challenged. They are the, used to be, you're, they're used to being the ones who are agitating. And part of that comes with now being in government. So obviously there is um, a lot of pressure on people to, you know, there's the kind of secrecy element to the Scottish government where, you know, things need to be under wraps all the time. There is the, the working with another party that, again, is a new thing for us. Um, however, what I would say is, you know, we, we have we got some wins in the Bee House Agreement and some of those are already coming to fruition. You know, we have workers representation on college boards now, um, which um, Ross, Ross Green announced at um, the end of last year. We, we have things like uh, conditionality and public contracts where workers' rights will be prioritised. You know, those are all extremely, extremely valuable. However, we do have, you know, people who don't work in the public sector, don't work in education, who will be... You know, quite frankly, let hung out to dry by policies of the Scottish government, and unfortunately, the Greens have to take responsibility for that. Now, we we are in we are in we are in government. We have ministers, and we have MSPs who will be voting through budgets, will be voting through legislation that will affect the day to day lives of people across Scotland, um, in rural areas, in cities, everywhere who who are already struggling, are struggling more than they have done possibly their whole life. Particularly for people, I'm I'm almost thirty. Um, you know, this this is the most financially unstable I've been in my adult life. Um, and that'll be the case for a lot, a lot of people. Um, and for the Greens to kind of, uh, quite often there's a lot of uncritical support for what the Greens are doing in government. 
Um, and again, I would I would I would underline that this is my opinion, not the opinion of the trade union group as a whole. Um, I would underline that I think there could be a lot of, lot more done. And quite frankly, if the Greens are uncomfortable with what the SNP are proposing, you know, no one's tying us to government. You know, that's something that there is a democratic mandate that took us into government, and there is the mechanism there for that to be reversed. Whether I think that's the case and whether I think that's what needs to be done at the moment, I'm not entirely sure that is. However, I would say. The, the, the review of the Beat House Agreement that we will be publishing tomorrow, and that has been kind of that we've spoken to dozens of people, and actually more than half of the Scottish Green councillors responded to us, including some MSPs as well. You know, even the even the responses from elected Greens who have power in Glasgow, Edinburgh, the Highlands, even a Holyrood. You know, we have a very clear concern that what was promised is not it, it does not go as far as people would have hoped. And that we are compromising day in day out at Holyrood, and I think that there's um, conversations that need to be had about where we go from here. Just you know, we're only eighteen months in; there's three and a half years left. So you know, we have to we have to address that as soon as we can. And the whole point of the Be House Agreement was to um, use the Greens' unique voice in in government to, like I said, to push the S and P to do more than they usually would. Um, but you know, it is a discussion worth having. Like our are we getting the most out of this agreement? Um, is this um, is this agreement doing? Um, is it serving our objectives? Um, one of the things that uh, came out of the of the budget, um, like now said, the the one p increase on the higher and the top rate. Um, if the higher rate threshold had been moved from forty three k to forty k, it would have raised six hundred ninety million. And ten percent, the only ten percent of people in Scotland pay the higher rate or the top rate. So uh, I looked at that and I couldn't understand why that wasn't even considered, why that wasn't even touched. Um, it's, it, it baffles me, quite honestly. Um, and it just shows that there was a lot more that could have been done in the budget, but it wasn't. Um, and, you know, we, we in the Greens have this unique responsibility, we have this unique position to push the Scottish government to do more, to go further, to go faster. Uh, and no one else in the in um, Scottish Parliament could do that. Um, so, so I it's it is a discussion worth having. Um, and whatever comes out of that, um, hopefully, it means that we can um, we can achieve more of what we want to do um, and do the most for the workers in this country. I, I suppose, um, Chris, just just to quickly jump back in, if that's okay, I think. You know, Jen mentioned whether that was considered or not, you know, lowering income taxes. And, you know, that's not even to mention things like wealth taxes that, you know, would raise millions and millions of pounds across Scotland or, you know, the, the much delayed and much maligned, um, you know, local taxation. Um, so, you know, we, we still suffer under council tax, unfortunately. You know, that's something that could really be ad addressed with Greens and government. And, you know, we've got three and a half years, we're a year and a half in to an agreement. You know, those are things that need to be addressed. Not to say that, those discussions weren't had, you know, I have no doubt that we have MSPs who are, you know, as far as I'm aware, Ross Greer is the one who talks to John Swinney um, about, you know, what is going to be happening on legislation, the budget, that kind of thing. Primarily, they go through those two individuals. Um, you know, I have no doubt that Ross has mentioned those things to John. Like Ross is a, Ross is a socialist and has been a member of the Greens long before I've been a member of the Greens. But one thing I would say is that, you know, I, I actually, I, I think that sometimes the main issue with what I feel with the Greens in government is I think they underestimate their own power here. Um, you know, I think that they could play their hand a little bit more boldly. And, you know, the SNP rely on us. You know, we, 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 need, to, we need to understand that a little bit more. We, I realise that there is a negotiation and there has to be some sort of um, accommodation of what the SNP's views are on certain things. However, I do think we need to have a little bit more confidence in ourselves. I think that that's, um, that's fundamental. And we have excellent staff at Holyrood. We have excellent party staff. We have excellent MSPs. There's absolutely no reason that we couldn't be, um, quite frankly, pushing the SNP back, putting, pushing them to the edge of what would be, you know, a radical cliff. They quite often creep up there. They don't often jump off that and take take any kind of leaps. The Greens need to be the ones who push them, quite frankly. So uh, we've been talking for just shy of half an hour. So I have... I'm going to put one question to you from the chat, if that's okay, but only one. Um, 
and it's completely different to what we've been talking about so far, but uh, hopefully uh, we'll give you some useful insights. Um, so Bryce Goodall asks, what are your thoughts on EU workers' rights being stripped? Jen, do you want to take this or do you want me to go ahead? Uh, you go ahead now. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's two the two prongs to that. Um, thanks for the question, Bryce, I suppose is is the first thing to say. Um, there's there's two prongs to it. The Greens are, I think, um, it's, wor- it's worth saying that the Greens are fundamentally in, in favour of the, the European Union. Um, again, myself and other people who are trade union members will know from... Um, the lengthy discussions that everyone had in 2016 around the EU and whether, whether it's worth staying in the EU. You know, I, I voted to, to remain. Um, however, I was in the not insignificant cohort of people. And I think that there was, you know, a large body of people from the Green Party of England and Wales, as well as the Scottish Greens who say that, we, you know, there needs to be fundamental overhaul of the EU before um, the Greens, before yeah. Scotland was to go back in as an independent country or you know, I don't think, unfortunately, that there's any kind of uh, case to be made at the moment democratically for the UK to re- to return. Um, but I would say that if Scotland was independent, that's something that could definitely happen. I do think there needs to be fundamental reform. Um, and I, I do think that those concerns that were raised in 2016 are now being borne out. Um, you know, we have, um, you know, essentially what is a capitalist system in, in the EU, which, you know, has fundamentally been set up in that way that does not have workers' rights at its heart. You know, the EU is great on many things. You know, the, you know, freedom of movement, for example, fantastic. Environmental re- uh, regulations, also really good. You know, those are two things that we've noticed are contributing to all the issues that Jen and I mentioned earlier on. Cost of living crisis, worker shortages in the NHS, the care service shutting down. You know, those are all things that have been affected by Brexit and the lack of EU protection. However, one of the things the EU doesn't protect and does not prioritise is ordinary working people like me, like Jen, like Chris, like you, Bryce. You know, I think those are things that we need to be um, critical of. You know, again, I mentioned the Greens and the SNP. You can be supportive of the Scottish, the Greens in government, but you can still be critical of it. I think as Greens, as people who support the European Union, we also need to be critical of the European Union and where it needs to improve. You know, those are things where, you know, Green, what are the, you know, Greens are fundamentally internationalist in our nature. You know, we, we need to be, looking to, you know, not just the EU, but further afield, particularly in, you know, kind of lower income countries and um, what we've traditionally been termed the third world, things like that. You know, these are areas where the Greens um, in Scotland and across the world, quite frankly, we have, we had a global movement. We need to make sure that these things cross borders. Um, and I think that the EU, as much as they say that, you know, uh, freedom of movement is a fantastic thing. They still see borders. They still see the, the hoarding of capital in their states as, something that is fundamentally a good thing. What they don't see, uh, what, what the way that they don't see it, and the way I think a lot of Greens see it, or should see it, is that the EU is a place where workers can be protected, workers can have power, workers can have a voice at every single level of government, all the way from Brussels down to a local town hall in, um, you know, a, a very small town in the north of Scotland. You know, that's the kind of thing that should happen in the EU. It should happen. You know, that's the kind of power that people should have. That's the power workers should have in the EU. Unfortunately, I don't think that happens at the moment. Definitely doesn't happen in Scotland. It doesn't definitely doesn't happen in the rest of the UK. But even for states that are still in the EU, I don't think it happens either. And that's that's a very, very disappointing thing. And honestly, I think it is the case yeah. of, of, a, of a trade-off, you know, like um, these systems are never going to be perfect, but uh, we really have to be pragmatic about how we align ourselves as a country. Um, and personally, I think that Scotland's interest would be best served in the European rather than in the United Kingdom. And uh, unfortunately, because of the result of, um, of how Brexit went, that is basically uh, the choice Scotland has. Um, and um, when you look at the... Uh, at the structures of the European Union, um, individual member states have more of a say than, say, Scotland would in the United Kingdom. Um, but like I said, like these things aren't perfect, and um, you know these systems are only as good as the people who end up in charge of them and then and then use them. Um, so either they could be used to advance workers' rights, um, they can be used for environmental protection, or they can be used for um, for destroying those rights and for destroying our environment. And um, ultimately, it's um, 
it is a trade-off. And um, I do think that, um, you know, like Niall said, we are an international movement. We should be reaching across borders um, and coordinating across it, um, across borders, across national lines is, um, is ultimately going to be a lot stronger for us um, than being tied to um, being tied to a Brexit that the majority of people in Scotland didn't vote for. So we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much, Jen and Niall, for joining me today. Thanks, Harvey. Thanks, Chris. Thanks very much. So that was uh, Niall Christie and Jen Bell, who are the co-conveners of the Scottish Green Party Trade Union Group. Uh, I found that conversation fascinating, interesting and insightful. Um, I would love to hear what you thought about it in the chat below. Um, please do leave your comments in the chat on what you thought about it. So that's the first very interviews of the day out the way. We still have eight more amazing guests to come today. And next up at 11 o'clock, we will be joined by Jo Bird. Now, Jo is a councillor in the Wirral. She is a Green Party councillor, but was first elected as a Labour Party councillor. And we're going to be talking about why she decided to join the Green Party the difference of experience she's had as a Green Party councillor versus as a Labour councillor, and also what the wave of defections from Labour to Green going on in council chambers across the country right now means for the future of the Green Party of England and Wales. So we're going to be kicking off that conversation at 11 o'clock. Now, I'm very, very sorry, but uh, I slept badly last night. And although I'm two coffees in, I need coffee number three to keep going with this stream. So you have to bear with me for a few minutes whilst I go and make a coffee and I'll be back very, very soon to carry on. Uh, so you get to look at my bookcase. You can tell me all about your favourite books on it whilst I'm gone. And I'll see you in about two or three minutes time once I've had uh, once I've made my third coffee. See you very, very soon.
I am back and I have my uh, third coffee of the day ready so that I'm suitably caffeinated for my next interview. Uh, so those of you who are just joining us, thank you so much. Welcome to episode three of Bright Green Live. We have an array of guests joining us throughout the day for interviews, conversations, discussions about a whole host of issues. We're going to be bringing you some of the most important, influential and interesting people on the left from across the UK. We just had a discussion with Jen Bell and Niall Christie, the co-conveners of the Scottish Green Party Trade Union Group. Uh, that uh, conversation, you can rewind back in the video and watch it back if you wish to. Um, I'm just going to have a look at the comments in the chat and see what people thought of it. So Elite Sabre Coaching says, great discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. I believe you were here with us last time. So welcome back to the show. Um, Bryce Goodall has said loads of positive comments about Nile and Jen and Dave has asked loads of questions and put loads of thoughts about the relationship between uh, the Greens and the Labour left and how the Greens uh, can attract uh, people from the Labour left. Those are great questions and comments and they are perfect for our next interview which is with Joe Bird who is a Green Party councillor who was previously a Labour Party councillor so I'm sure we can get into the weeds of lots of that discussion uh, in that interview coming up in just three minutes time. Um, so there's 10 people watching the show right now. However, there's only three people who have liked the video. I'm telling you off now, you need to hit that like button because if you're enjoying the show, then many, many other people will too. And the best way to make sure that they see the video is to make sure that it appears in more people's feeds. And you can do that by hitting the like button. It'll appear in more people when they're scrolling around YouTube and it will help out the show. And it means that the interviews that you're enjoying, other people will too. If you haven't already, please do also hit that subscribe button. And of course, share the show on your social medias, preferably using the hashtag Bright Green Live. So as I said, our next guest is Jo Bird, who is a Green Party councillor in the Wirral. Uh, she's formerly a Labour Party councillor. and We're going to be talking about her decision to join the Greens, uh, what the wave of defections from Labour to the Greens across the country in council chambers means for the future of the Green Party of England and Wales, and much, much more. If you have questions for Joe, please do line them up in the chat and I'll try and put as many of them to her as possible. It's much easier for me to get to them if they come in early. So please do pop them in the chat as soon as you can. Thank you to the three people who have been extremely obedient and hit that like button. I appreciate your obedience very, very much. You are very kind, generous, and I am grateful. Uh, so in about two minutes time, we're going to be kicking off with our second interview with Joe Bird. Now, there were lots of things that we had that we discussed in that conversation with Niall and Jen a few minutes ago, um, including the uh, Get Me Home Safely campaign and the work that Maggie Chapman MSP is doing in the Scottish Parliament to get legislation passed, which would which would require uh, free transport for late night shift workers. Um, we talked about various the bits and pieces of trade union greens working with trade unions. Uh, this is a theme that we've been exploring quite a lot on Bro the first few episodes of Bright Green Live. So on episode one, we spoke to Matthew Hull, who is the Green Party of England and Wales, is trade union liaison officer and a former chair of the Green Party trade union group. Um, and on episode two, we spoke to Maggie Chapman specifically about that legislation she's trying to bring forward. So uh, after today's show, you can go back on our YouTube channel and watch any of those interviews as well and keep the your, your interest peaked in the relationship between Greens and trade unions. So I can see that Joe has joined the call now. So I'm going to let Joe in from the waiting room. And as Joe is connecting to the call, I'm just gonna do a quick introduction to who Joe is. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted next on Bright Green Live to be joined by Joe Bird. Now, Jo is a Green Party councillor in the Wirral, and she was first elected as a Labour Party councillor, but has since joined the Greens. And we're going to be looking at and exploring and talking about the reasons why she did that. Uh, before we get into, into any of that, uh, Jo, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing today? Great. Thanks, Chris. How are you? I'm good. I'm a little sleepy. I slept quite badly, which is not good news for an eight hour live stream, but I'm on coffee number three and hopefully we'll get through it. Um, so to kick us off, I wondered if you could just talk us through a little bit your uh, why you decided to join the Green Party. Yeah, thanks very much. And thanks for this invitation. Bright Green Live is a fantastic offer that you're making to the to the wider left and the green movements. 
I joined the Green Party for a variety of reasons, personal and political. I come from a long tradition of eco-socialists who are Jewish. My great uncle Wolfie was on the Kinder Scout trespass 90 years ago. Um, I was raised in the Woolcraft folk. With, our motto is span the world with friendship. Um, and some of us, um, we, in my early 20s, we were, I was part of the Earth First group. We were taking non-violent direct action about roads and airports, defending local green spaces. And some of us started a housing cooperative in Manchester, which is still going today. We worked through the Radical Roots Network. For a long time, for decades, party politics didn't offer any solutions to the problems that my communities were facing. The parties were bland, corporate, pro-war, pro-private profit. And I put my time and energy into the cooperative movement, helping groups of people to start and run democratic social enterprises, businesses for the common good, renewable energy, food, finance, farming, um, football, all kinds of sectors. And then in 2015, Jeremy Corbyn mobilised for the many and not the few. And I was living in Northern Ireland at the time, but almost everybody I knew in England was joining the Labour Party. <laughs> they said join. And I, and I did join because it seemed to me to be the best chance in a generation for social and environmental justice. I stood as a candidate back in England. I moved country um, in uh, 2018 and um, was elected in a by-election later that year. And it's quite it's quite a journey, really. Um, so from from Labour to Green, because we all went mass trespassing over those years. We were up up to the mountaintop, and we saw that another world is possible. And uh, no one really can take that away from us. But we were also devastated by the the general election defeat of twenty seventeen. And we were betrayed by the Tories within the Labour Party. And the Ford report and the Labour files have shown that broadcast the evidence of that and shown what we on the left know to be true from our own experience. D during that time in May 2021, I was re-elected with 61% of the vote as, as, a, as a local councillor. And, and I was like, oh, sugar, what have I got myself into? What the feck am I going to do now? Because the Labour Party was turned into crap. Um, particularly under Keir Starmer. Um, I was suspended twice. Um, I was had a dozen disciplinary allegations made against me. I was smeared in the media by the Labour Party. I was investigated. I was told to shut up about the racism that I face as a Jewish person. And meanwhile, um, Jewish people like Jackie Walker and recently Naomi Wimborne and Dreesi and myself, we were like disciplined, we're 31 times more likely to face disciplinary action than any other member. I won every case, by the way, and eventually they basically had to change the rules of the Labour Party and apply the rules retrospectively to finally expel me, which happened in November last year. 21. And every day I wake up glad that I'm out of that hostile environment. Um, it was a kind of creeping fascism and, and still is to say like, no, you can't debate anti-Semitism or racism. You can't talk about it. You can't discuss what's going on in front of your face and issues that are affecting your party and your communities. Because we have to have a, a freedom of expression. There has to be a time and a place to discuss everything because that's how progress is made. And still large parts of the left are waiting for waiting one year, two years, three years for Jeremy Corbyn to start a new party or for members of Unite and Uniton to say we want a ballot on our political levy. We want to choose how we, which party we fund, if any, with our money, um, our political uh, levy money. And I'm too impatient for personally, but also the issues our communities are dealing with. We can't wait. We can't wait anymore for a, another magical <laughs> um, party to appear on the left. And besides which, we already have one. I looked around. Um, it's the Green Party. You know, the, the local Green Council is where I am on the Wirral. We were vote, they were voting to save local services, whereas Labour were voting to close the libraries in my ward and voting for other cuts. And um, I checked the facts, I had a look at the Green Party website, what Green Party leaders were saying, and actually you're consistently arguing and promoting social and environmental justice. And I thought, yeah, that's that's what I'm about to. That's what I was 
that was the mandate on which I was re-elected and elected to serve my communities on. So yeah, I joined the, the Green Party 10 months ago. It's going very well. It's not a day that I'm, I'm very glad about it. Oh, I, don't, yeah, I don't regret it at all. Our past, like, like thousands of people, you know, 200,000 people have left the Labour Party. Our past is red and I think our future is green. So there's lots of things that you've talked about there that I want to pick up on. Um, but the first of um, the first of that is is some of the stuff you talked about there was about, you know, people on the left waiting for a new political party to be set up or various of the projects that people are kind of hoping for. Um, and lots of other socialists who were in the Labour Party have since either left party politics altogether or they've joined other smaller kind of fringe parties, whether that be like the Northern, Northern Independence Party or other small groups. Uh, but you chose the Greens. So I wondered whether you could delve a little bit more into why you didn't choose one of those other routes of dropping out of politics or joining one of those more uh, one of those other smaller parties. Yeah, thanks. Great question. And it's and it's a debate that we've been having on the left, personally, politically, family, friends, colleagues, you know, for the last few years. And everyone makes their own choices and we're not all on the same journey. But um, but I, I did consider the other options as well, obviously. Um the um you know, the it's the, the smaller parties have no track record of winning elections. They're they don't have any councillors that have won election or MPs. Um, it's, it, they don't really seem a credible, viable vehicle. And and they're very prone to infighting um, or, and splitting. And um, yeah, not of interest to me. I, 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 I think, you know, we want, a, we want system change. We want a collective Res collective answers to social environmental justice so that means we have to work with a lot of people even those we disagree with on some issues or have different tactics on on other issues whatever um a lot of people have put their time and effort into the trade unions which is completely fine brilliant you know, and we're seeing the results of that in the industrial action strikes that are taking place in all kinds of sectors all over the country and what's missing from the most of the, the trade union action there is a political answer as well as an industrial answer. I'm not, we're not seeing that their, their political responses, it mostly. Um, it's clearly not tenable to stay in the Labour Party and change it from within. That's what a lot of people argue, especially if they want more votes within the Labour Party. Um, but, you know, it's awful. It's it's racist. It's um, the disciplinary processes are clearly uh, weighted against nat natural justice and that's all well documented and also it's it's policies for when it's in government it's austerity light for want of a better word and I actually think it'll be worse under Labour because they have because of the trade union some trade union affiliation gives it Labour cover some people and um, one of the options I looked at was looking at you know putting my time and energy into single issue pressure groups um social movements NHS and housing uh, public ownership that kind of thing it's which and I think it, that's absolutely um a great choice to make and valid but I'm willing and able to be the public face of a, of a political party and and um a lot of people want me to do that <laughs> like thousands of people voted for me to do that and it um if I wasn't doing this as a sort of front-facing politician I would be more involved in a in a kind of single issue pressure group um and I also looked at the uh, an idea that Ken Loach put out recently which is to to stand as an independent to have a network of independent Labour councillors and MP candidates across the country and I was independent for four months after Labour expelled me um, and we had a network of of similarly independent councillors only one was elected as an independent others have been expelled or resigned um the, the one was uh, Stephen Smith in Knowsley, won a brilliant campaign. And there's an exception that proves the rule, really, along with um, Mayor Luftor Rahman and the Aspire Party in Tower Hamlets. They're the only examples of independent from wider political party, independent candidates who've won election 
Um, so it sh- that shows how difficult it is. And I had a lot of conversations with people like, why don't you stand with me and be an independent counsellor too and or, or in their in their communities? And it's so daunting. Like you to get elected, you really do need a, a tried and tested election machine backing you and behind you and being being part of that community. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't think that's really a, a viable route, you know. Apart from exceptional characters like Ken Livingstone did it um, for like um, Mayor of London, Jeremy Corbyn will undoubtedly win election if he chooses to stand again as an independent. But for most people, um, yeah, you need to you need to be part of something bigger. A lot of people have retired from or disengaged from party politics. That's their choice. I'm not a commentator. I'm an activist. Um, it's the Green Party is not for people, it's not a pressure group for grumpy people or a therapy session. It is a political party. We aim to win elections, we aim to ch- make positive change. That that's why I joined the Green Party. So you just, touched on it. Oh, yeah. sorry, sorry for interrupting. Carry on. Just um, so these these debates that I'm sure a lot thousands of people have in across the country, there's a few evidenced reasons people come up with about why they don't want to support the Green Party. Um, and I just want to go through those because I think they're worth rebutting and nailing. Um, one is that there's about nine, one um, reasons that people give for not supporting the Greens. Stand, the, the Greens stand against Labour. Well, yeah, that's what political parties do. As If they're serious in a democracy, we aim to stand to win hearts, minds, votes and seats and to get access to positions of power to make positive change. And we believe we can make more of that change through the Green Party than the Labour Party. It's a democracy. The voters decide that at the end of the day. Another argument is that um, Greens don't win MPs. And yes, it is difficult in the first past the post system. Um, The Greens have one MP, Caroline Lucas, brilliant, been an MP for many years and hopefully we'll get more. The um, It takes work, it takes hard work. It's not a kind of uh, glamorous thing. It takes a lot of knocking on doors, putting leaflets through. And the Greens have the best chance of winning MPs where the majority of the local wards have voted for a Green councillors. So that's the the building blocks of winning Green MPs. And it's not impossible. Caroline has shown it it can be done and, and hopefully there'll be more like Carla in Bristol. A third reason is that the trade unions are not affiliated to the Green Party, which is true. But it's also true of Labour. Most trade unions are not affiliated to the Labour Party. There's 50 who are trade unions part of the TUC, and only 11 of them are affiliated to the Labour Party. Most are not, including the Bakers Union, the RMT, education unions like the NEU, um, health unions like the RCM, PCS. They're not affiliated to the Labour Party. It doesn't you know, political action doesn't require that affiliation. Um, I would hope that the Green Party does allow uh, trade union branch affiliation in the future going forward. And that's something we could come back to internally. I think the Green Party will be open to that. A fourth reason is a quite specific one about the um, bin strike of GMB members in Brighton. Um, And I don't know what the Green led council at the time kind of say about how they, manage those industrial relations to get so bad to that the bin strike bin workers went on strike and it was resolved within three weeks um i don't think there's much more defense to that fifthly the um a lack of diversity in the green party leadership particularly all the public facing parts of it and uh you know when caroline lucas did propose a cabinet of all white posh women um at one point which she admits was wrong she got it wrong it was a mistake and there was things to learn from that and the green party like all other political parties need to be taking a lot more concrete action to increase the diversity of its membership and its representatives um the a couple of people say like that when I looked into the like Ken Livingstone said that he would apply for membership of the Green Party and then um seemed to be refused. Um I don't know if he did actually reply. And certainly the the official and the the widespread welcome for all kinds of lefties is, is very apparent to me. And I was very welcome, and lots of other people have been welcome too. So I don't think that's a, a credible barrier. Um, the yeah, there's a um, 
else? Oh yeah, some people say that the Greens joined in the witch hunt against Corbyn, and every time I ask for evidence of that, I don't get any. It's it's a myth. It's a rumour. There are some a couple of specific attacks on a on Andrew Miller and Ken Loach by prominent Greens, and again, when they're asked for evidence, there isn't any that's put up. So those kind of malicious allegations need to stop. But it's not true that the Greens took part in wide, in um, witch hunting against Corbyn, and I've seen no evidence for it. I'm very alert. I'm hypersensitive to allegations and um, the tactics and the you know the, the the history and the current practice around witch hunts. So, yeah, and so similarly, the um, the around the dis suspensions, no fault suspensions, whatever you call them, or, and disciplinary action around in, within the Green Party on particularly on trans rights and um, sex based rights dis disagreements. And I don't yet know enough of the history of that, but I do know that the the disciplinary process within the Green Party is a lot better than the Labour Party, which doesn't take much, but it's still in the Green Party, it's much more based on natural justice. It's more human mediation as an option, for example. You know, people talk to each other rather than kind of megaphone allegations at each other. Yeah, and and that's kind of, you know, that's about it. That's <laughs> it's a very short list compared to the evidenced reasons not to support Labour, which we all know very well. Um, so I can't actually see many good reasons for not, not supporting the Greens, you know, one step at a time, join the Greens if you're interested. The Green Party's number one core value is that we are a party of social environmental justice, which supports a radical transformation of society for the benefit of all and for the planet as a whole. So. If you agree with that, then I would say join the Green Party if you want to be politically active, because together we're stronger. So I want to pick up on some things that you touched on a little bit throughout that answer mm. and one of your earlier responses. And you, you know, you've talked quite uh, extensively there about the negative experiences you've had uh, when you were a member of the Labour Party. I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about how your experiences as a Green Party member and a Green Party councillor contrast to your experiences in the Labour Party? Thanks. And I've written um, a popular article for Bright Green about this. So uh, we can uh, check that out too. The five things I learned since I've joined the Green Party. One is that lefties are very welcome. Um, unlike in the Labour Party where we're blamed, expelled and candidates are removed lefties are very welcome in the Green Party and promoted where we've got um, contributions to make. For example, I'm now on the um, Policy and Resources Committee at Wirral Council, um, where my finance and budget expertise is put to very good use, um, whereas and Labour uh, were just not interested in, in promoting me over, above the backbench in any way. Um, and that's just my experience. The, the, the second reason, Greens put evidence before loyalty. There's no whip in the Green Party. You can actually um, put your local residents first. Um, um, you can vote differently to each other. Green councillors can vote in different ways, as my Green Group has done. And there's no disciplinary consequence to that. Um, in the Labour Party, if you vote against the whip, the party line, then you're disciplined. Um, the, and, and if you're very loyal, then you tend to get promoted into paid positions. And that's a key way that Labour... Um, exercise power and control and so so greens have to consider the evidence on every vote or every decision that we make rather than just being voting fodder and, and going along with the party line the third reason is that greens have really good policies much better than labor's um currently labor policies for example we're supporting the real living wage we support um frontline services not cutting them all the stuff around the climate is fantastic, you know, zero ca carbon, taking action towards that. The Green Party supports boycott, divestment and sanctions against Israeli abuses of Palestinian human rights, which is complete contrast to the Labour Party, who you know, actively defend the, the um, state of Israel and, and the abuses that come currently and previously with that. Um, and it's a key signature issue. It's a key issue, that one. Um, it's a, it's a, and it's clear water between the two parties. The fourth reason is that candid the Green candidates work 
hard all year round to win hearts, minds and votes. No green councillor has had an easy journey to become a green councillor. <laughs> There's always been it's a safe seat for one party or another or a highly contested political seat. We don't take votes for granted. Um, Labour in a safe seat, you'll be lucky if you get one leaflet just before election time. So that's that's a big difference. Greens do the work. And um, the, the, there are a the fifth, fifth big difference, I think, is, is is around equality, diversity, inclusion. So Labour has gender balance criteria. So you can get gender balanced red Tories rather than um, ungender balanced ones, <laughs> you know, um, whereas, and that's enshrined in the Labour Party rule book, whereas there's encouragement within the Green Party for gender balance and racial balance, um, but it isn't kind of hard mandated. And I'd just like to add, you know, in the last year, I've not had to deal with a single disciplinary case against me, barely even any allegations against me. And that's a complete contrast to my lived experience in the Labour Party where there were so many. So. so I have a final question for you. But before I go to that, I just wanted to remind people that uh, if you have any questions that you want me to put to Joe, please do pop them in the chat on YouTube and I'll get as many of them put to her as possible. Um, so before I come to the chat, um, there's been a flurry of Labour councillors over recent months who have defected from Labour to the Greens. Um, obviously, your case was slightly different because you had a, a window where you were independent between. Um, but there have been lots of instances where we've seen um, Labour councillors either becoming independents and then becoming Greens or doing the, the switch immediately from Labour to Green. And it's happening on an unprecedented scale. Um, defections within like, with, with, for, elect, for elected uh, politicians it's, it's, it's a pretty rare thing it's a pretty big step for people to take and yet we're seeing it happening across the country where uh, increasing numbers of Labour councillors are joining the Greens. I wondered if you had any thoughts as someone who has made that journey on, um, on what this means for the future of the Green Party. Yes it's a very exciting development about 20 former Labour councillors are now Green councillors um, and, and I've brought people with them as well. I think the future for the Green Party in, down this road is very exciting and, and positive and to be welcomed. Recent um, re recent councillors who've joined uh, include like Councillor Ekua Bayunu, Heather Skipstead, Kevin Freer, and last month, Lou Cunningham in, in Leeds. Um, Matt Zarb Cousins has joined the, Labour, the, joined the Green Party from the Labour Party. He used to be the spokesperson for Jeremy Corbyn. On, on the Wirral, my patch, um, the whole dynamic has changed. It's it's brilliant. it's a brilliant place to be. I'm so happy about it. The, and um, so in the active Labour left, about a third of those people in the last year or 18 months have joined the Green Party and become active or actively supporting Green candidates against really quite nasty Labour candidates. A third of the former Labour left have, have become kind of like Labour loyalists, for want of a better word there. They're showing, in my opinion, their complicity in the awful stuff that Labour does by continuing to pay their money to the Labour Party and even be active in, in the, the local Labour Party. And a third have retired from politics altogether. You know, that, fair enough, that's their choice. What, what's happened within with the Wirral Green Party is, so we've, we're, we're now putting up 15 candidates in, in five target wards. We've got all our elections in May and there's 15 candidates. Um, broadly, a third are former Labour, a third are um, long time Green members and a third are relatively new to party politics but have been inspired to join by, by the growth we have on the Wirral. Um, we have a big electoral test in, in the Wirral and, and other parts of the country where um, about half a dozen uh, former Labour councillors are seeking re-election as Green councillors and it's never happened before. We hope we all win and your help on the doorstep is, and the, on, on the stomp will be absolutely very welcome. Anyone who wants to, to join former Labour councillors who are now standing as, as Green candidates. It's really important that we win. So to former Labour members who were um, unsure about the Greens, I would say check your facts, have a look at the Green website listen to what your Green leaders are saying, you'll hear them um, supporting striking frontline workers. And I would say talk to your local Green councillors and, and have that conversation, see what they say to your concerns. Um, 
And to, to Green Party members, long time existing ones, I would say be kind to incoming Labour members. We're, we're very motivated by justice and we've been some, through some hardcore political trauma. Um, we're hurting, but we, we want justice to win out. Um, some of our comrades died with malicious allegations hanging over them. Um, and you know it's 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 been it's been awful what we've lived within the Labour Party, but like but like with welcoming refugees, you know treat us well, give us information, give us access to integration, and we'll pay back your generosity many times over, and we'll grow the Green Party in all kinds of directions. Thanks. A beautiful note to finish that on. I have an amazing question that's come through on the chat, which uh, leads, which which uh, follows from that really, really nicely. Um, so Rosie has asked, do you have any thoughts on what local Green Party activists can do to help encourage and welcome more disenchanted left Labour councillors over to the Greens? Um, well, firstly, keep doing what you're doing, putting out putting out the green messages um, winning elections, Chris, your your election in 21 was inspiring for me and other people. You won election against Luke Akehurst of We Believe in Israel, and you won it at the ballot box. That's what we're. That's a key part of what we're about. Um, so yeah, number one, keep keep doing what we're doing, and and just and you know keep the door open for when people are ready to make an approach. Make those approaches yourselves as well, if, uh, if when you think it's appropriate. Particularly, um, there's a number of people who've been removed as candidates, and um, they're they're in, interested in joining and, and standing. You know, because one of the key bottlenecks for the Green Party is a shortage of candidates. So you'll be looking at people who you think would make a good Green candidate, and a lot of them are no longer in the Labour Party. And Rosie's got a follow-up question for you, which is, um, what 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 should we be doing to make sure that if someone does defect, who's a councillor, um, that we support them uh, properly once they have defected? I guess both in terms of their elected position, because you know if they defect from the Labour Party, one of the experiences that a lot of ex-Labour councillors have is the viciousness and the vitriol of uh, people who are still in the Labour Party, and um, but also as you talked about to to get them re-elected as a Green. Yeah, so actions speak louder than words. Um, accepting people as as Greens on the same basis as anybody else. You know, we, we're signing up to Green values and principles, and we're an equal member like anybody else. Um, so you an act, active defence is is good, but it doesn't have to be like very wordy. It just has to be they're part of the Green Party. <laughs> they're a Green councillor now, or they're a Green candidate, or whatever. Um, when I when I um, joined the Green Party, so three Labour councils stood up at a full council meeting and called on me to resign and call a by election. Whereas when other Labour councils had gone independent, they stood up and applauded them. So it's very partial. It's very selective who they support and who they don't support, and it's very hypocritical. Um, of course, members of my ward, people who live in my ward who elected me, not a single one of them called for me to resign and call a by election. They were more than happy to put it to the test at the next local election when I'm, when I'm a candidate. And some Labour defecting councillors from Labour to Green don't want to stand again, and that's totally fine. You know, just, um, um, there's just the it, friendly and in, integral, for, I don't quite know how to answer the question. Like, and my experience has been massively positive. Um, when, when there's concerns, they're talked about, when there's something to do, we do it together. Thank you so much, Joe, for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. You're very welcome. Thank you. Bye. So that was Joe Bird, who is a Green Party councillor in the Wirral. Um, over the last 30 minutes, we've been talking about uh, her experience in the as a Labour councillor initially and now as a Green Party councillor, why she joined the Green Party and so on. For those of you who have just seen joining us right now, you can rewind it and watch that interview in full on the stream. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts and your responses to that conversation with Joe. I always find uh, the conversations that I have with Joe really, really interesting and insightful to understand the nature of the Labour Party and the experience for socialists and left-wingers in the Labour Party and the difference that, 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 that people have experienced in the Greens. Um, 
So we have uh, just shy of a dozen people watching right now. That's absolutely brilliant. Uh, please do hit the like button if you haven't already. Uh, it means that this video and stream will appear in more people's feeds. If you're enjoying the interviews we're having, other people will too. Um, and also, of course, share the live stream on your social media, preferably using the hashtag Bright Green Live. So that's our second interview of the day. Uh, for those of you who are joining us relatively recently, uh, the first interview we had was with Jen Bell and Niall Christie, who are the co-conveners of the Scottish Green Party. You can rewind to about 15 minutes into the video to watch that interview if you wish to. Um, coming up, we still have an absolutely stacked lineup of guests throughout the rest of the day. And I'll just give you a quick rundown of what is yet to come. So our next interview is with Laura Webster. Now, Laura is the new editor of The National, uh, the newspaper in Scotland. It's the uh, a, a newspaper that supports Scottish independence. And we're going to be talking about her plans for that paper and also the current levels of support for independence in Scotland um, and uh, the role of that paper in the campaign for Scottish independence. We will then have John Bosco and Wobo, who is the lead campaigner at We Own It, which is the anti-privatisation campaign group. We're going to be discussing NHS privatisation, what it looks like, the extent to which uh, it's infected our health service and how we resist it. Uh, following that, we have Ami Khar Daliwal, who is a who is one of the two deputy leaders of the Wales Green Party. Throughout our conversation, we're going to be discussing the impact that councillors in Wales have been having since their election in May 2022. For those of you who don't know, the uh, Greens in Wales have historically um, underperformed in electoral terms relative to their Scottish, English and Northern Irish peers. Uh, the big game-changing uh, momentum shifting election took place in May 2022, in which uh, over over half a dozen Green councillors were elected. We're going to be discussing what impact they've already been having and the future prospects, electoral prospects of the Welsh Greens. At 3.15, we will be joined by Chloe Naldret from Just Stop Oil, uh, the campaign group, climate campaign group, who is known, which is known for taking uh, very disruptive and eye-catching direct action uh, as part of their campaign for climate justice and to end the extraction of oil. We're going to be discussing Just Up Oil's plans for mobilisations throughout 2023. Following that, we will be joined by Unlock Democracy's director, Tom Bray, and we're going to be discussing the Labour, the proposals that have been put forward by Gordon Brown for the Labour Party's policies on democratic reform. We're going to be discussing whether those uh, proposals are sufficient to reform uh, Britain's broken democracy. We're going to be discussing proportional representation in elections and much, much more. Our penultimate interview will be with Sonia Adasara, who is an NHS doctor and a campaigner, uh, particularly a campaigner against privatisation, uh, but a whole host of issues. She's a well-known media performer, and we're going to be discussing the current crisis in the NHS, uh, what's underpinning the industrial disputes that are taking place in the health service right now, and the role of privatisation in all of that and more. And finally, our final guest today will be Phelim McCafferty. Now, Phelim is the Green Party leader of Brighton and Hove City Council. He's the only leader of a council in the country where the Greens are the sole party in administration. He's been uh, leader of the council for 18 months, and we're going to be discussing the Greens' record in that administration and the impact they've had on the city. So that's our guests for the rest of the day. It's an absolutely incredible lineup. Thank you all so much for being with us throughout. Please do stick around for as long as you can. Uh, if you haven't already, please do subscribe to the channel because if you enjoy this stream, you will enjoy every other episode of Bright Green Live that will be taking place uh, in the future every second Sunday of the month. And you'll get a notification every time we go live if you hit subscribe. But you'll also see all the other videos, interviews and other content that we're putting out by subscribing. So please do scroll right down right now. Hit that big 
I think it's red button. It may now be blue. Who knows? You'll know when you get there and press the subscribe button so that you don't miss out on anything. Uh, you can also make sure that you don't miss out on everything Bright Green by heading to our social media channels. So on Twitter, we are at BrightGRN. On Facebook, we are facebook.com forward slash BrightGRN. On Instagram, we're instagram.com forward slash bright green online but also at bright green online which is the normal way you navigate there we're also on mastodon uh we're bright green on the uk server if that's a means of you being able to find us um we're all the socials that's where you'll find all of our articles our videos being posted as and when they come out so you won't miss out on anything if you follow us there uh so who uh, for those of you joining us we are between interviews right now uh, our last guest was Joe Bird, a Green Party councillor in the Wirral, talking about why she joined the Green Party uh, and the difference in her experience as a Labour councillor, which was she was first elected as, and as a Green Party councillor that she now is. And prior to that, we interviewed Jen Bell and uh, Niall Christie, the two co-conveners of the Scottish Green Party trade union group. You can rewind the video and watch them at your leisure. Um, and our next interview is going to be with Laura Webster, who is the new editor of the National Newspaper. I would love to hear your thoughts on all those uh, interviews we've had thus far and also to see your questions for our next guest, Laura Webster. Please do line them up in the chat. Um, and also any questions that you have for me, I'm happy to answer any of your questions throughout. And I'll try and read as many of your comments and questions out throughout the day. You can also share them on the hashtag Bright Green Live. Now, uh, before that last interview, I said I was getting my third coffee of the day. Uh, I am now extremely caffeinated and you might be able to tell from my general hyperactive demeanour. Uh, but unfortunately, that coffee has gone right through me. Uh, so I am going to take a quick break. Uh, we'll be back in a few minutes time and we'll get going with our next interview very, very soon. Please do line up any questions and comments in the chat that I can get to when I return. So I'll be back very, very shortly and I'll see you very, very soon.
Hello, I am back. Um, and I have an apology to make, which is that I have my chat settings on a odd setting. So I missed some of the comments that came through in the um, chat during the last interview. And I'm very, very sorry uh, to those of you that I didn't come to your questions for. That's solely because I didn't see them. So I apologise to Steve C, who is a friend of Bright Green Live, uh, has been a uh, a, a consistent viewer of the show who asked a question to Joe and I'm very very sorry that we didn't um, get to ask your question but hopefully it was picked up by the questions that we did ask and similarly apologies to Dave Callow uh, for not putting your question there but again I think we covered uh, both those questions which were about uh, how we, Greens can encourage more Labour members, councillors, supporters to defect to the Greens. Um, so if you're just joining us, you're watching episode three of Bright Green Live. We have a stacked lineup of guests still to come on the show. I'm going to do a brief bit of admin for maybe 30 seconds. So you're just going to have to look at me uh, fiddling with my computer uh, and then we'll get back to the show in short, in a short time, in whatever that phrase that has eluded my mind is. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, if you haven't already hit the like button, it means that it'll, the show will appear in uh, more people's feeds if you're enjoying the show other people will as well so make sure you hit the like button so that more people see it uh, if you just give me all of about mm, 30 seconds i'll be with you very very shortly that's the wrong thing uh apologies i the, one of the, one of the benefits of doing these live streams is i'm the sort of person who in my day-to-day -day life just talks to themselves um, and as such, I'm pretty good at narrating what I'm doing and talking at the same time as <laughs> doing other things. Um, but occasionally you'll hear some slightly odd comments as I'm trying to fix things. Uh, one more thing to do and then I'll be with you again. Cool, that's now done. Uh, so apologies for that brief intermission as I did some admin. That is now complete, I think. Yes, it is. Uh, so we are ready to get back to it right about now. Um, so thank you everyone for watching. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to have so many of you joining us today. Uh, please do get your comments in the chat. I'd love to read out as many of them as possible. Um, and also line up any questions for our guests throughout the show. Uh, and any questions you have for me, I'm as always keen and happy to answer any questions that you have. So throughout the rest of the day, we still have seven guests to come. Uh, it's a long old day over the next uh, six hours. We have seven more people who will be joining us to talk about various things. The first of which is Laura Webster, who will be joining us in about 10 minutes time. Uh, Laura is the new editor of The National, uh, the Scottish newspaper. We're going to be talking about her plans for the paper, as well as uh, more broadly, uh, the role of that paper in the campaign for Scottish independence and the general strength of support for Scottish independence as well. Following uh, Laura, we have John Bosco Wobo from We Own It, the anti privatisation group. We're going to be discussing NHS privatisation. Uh, uh, the extent to which it's infected our health service uh, and how we can combat it. Uh, particularly, we're going to be looking at where in its campaign to get local NHS uh, bodies to end outsourcing in order to save lives. Uh, later in the afternoon, we have Amikar Daliwal, who is uh, one of the two deputy leaders of the Wales Green Party. She'll be, they'll be discussing the um, uh, the success that the Welsh Greens had in the 2022 local elections and the impact that Green councillors have been having in Wales since then. We then have Chloe Naldrett, who's joining us from Just Stop Oil, uh, the Climate Campaign Group, to discuss their mobilisation plans for 2023. Following that, Tom Brake will be joining us. He is the director of Unlock Democracy, a campaign group that is fighting for a better, fairer, more democratic sister, uh, setup in the UK. We're going to be discussing the uh, proposals that came out from Gordon Brown on, Labour, on, on what Labour Party's policy on democratic reform should be. And uh, we're going to be discussing what those proposals are, 
whether they go far enough, and we're going to be talking about proportional representation, of course. Our penultimate interview will be with Sonia, Sonia Adasara. She is a NHS doctor and a campaigner, and uh, we're going to be discussing the state of the NHS the current crisis that the NHS is experiencing, the industrial disputes that are going on in the NHS and what is underpinning them, and also the role of privatisation in driving some of the problems and how we fix the NHS. And finally, our last interview will be with Phelan McCafferty. He is the leader of Brighton Hove City Council. He's been the leader since the Greens took over the administration uh, about 18 months ago. We're going to be discussing the Greens' record in administration in Brighton Hove um, and the prospects of the Greens keeping hold of that council after the May election. So that's our lineup throughout the rest of the day. Please do get your comments and questions coming in for them. So this is episode three of Bright Green Live. We've had two other episodes so far, as you would expect, considering this is episode three. Um, and we've had a whole range of amazing guests on those shows. On our YouTube channel, you can find all those previous episodes, and you can also see individual clips of the interviews that took place um just last night we published the full hour-long interview with michael chesson who is a uh activist and an author he's been a big part of a number of important movements over the last decade including this 2010 student movement uh he's been a key player in momentum and another year of his possible and he wrote a book called this is only the beginning the making of a new left from anti-austerity to the fall of corbyn uh which is a book which chronicles the left throughout the 2010s um its uh successes its pitfalls the nature and shape of uh the left and also its future uh that interview it's on our YouTube channel. It's a fascinating uh, conversation, I think, um, and discussion about the state of the left over the last decade or so, and also its future. So after you've watched today's show, you can go on our YouTube channel and you can see that, along with all the other interviews with our guests in previous shows. Now, Bright Green Live streams uh, every second Sunday of the month, uh, with one exception, which is going to be the March episode, because uh, we're going to be doing that on the third Sunday of the month as a result of Green Party Conference, uh, Green Party of England and Wales Conference that is taking place on the second Sunday. Uh, so we're going to be a week late on that. But normally we're on the second Sunday of every month and we already have some guests lined up for our show in February. Now, the February show is going to be on, I think, the 12th of February. Uh, let me just check my little calendar and make sure that is correct. Yes, the 12th of February will be the next episode of Bright Green Live. And we already have two amazing guests booked for that. We have Molly Scott Cato, who was a Green Party MEP uh, from 2014 to uh, 2020, uh, when uh, the ME when Brexit formally happened. And... Um, she is going to be talking about the Green Party's response to the cost of living crisis. Uh, we also will have the General Secretary of the uh, PCS Union, Mark Sawatka, joining us on the next episode. Mark Sawatka has uh, been General Secretary of the PCS for, I think, two decades now. Uh, PCS, obviously, is the union which represents civil servants and other public sector employees um, and a number of uh, different sectors are currently experiencing strikes from the PCS union. The border force strikes that took place over Christmas, uh, DVLA uh, staff, others have been walking out in disputes over pay and conditions. We're going to be talking about all the different disputes that are going on uh, with the PCS union at the moment, as well as the wider trade union movement and the wave of strikes that are taking place across the country. So both those interviews with Molly Scott Cato and Mark Sawatka, you'll be able to see on the next episode of Bright Green Live on February the 12th. So make sure you hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss out next time we go live. And also, of course, put it in your diaries and make sure that you're here then too. Um, so you may or may not be aware, but Bright Green does not have the backing of billionaires and big business. We rely solely on the kind and generous support of people just like you. Now, if you enjoy Bright Green Live, if you've enjoyed these shows, I know there are some people watching who've been uh, watching, who watched every single episode live, which is fantastic. Um, even if this is your first time here, 
if you are able to, please do head to our donate page to set up a regular donation. We ask people to donate just five pounds a month uh, to keep Bright Green running and to grow uh, Bright Green as well. There's a link in the description of this video to our donate page. You can head there right now, which is bright-green.org forward slash donate and set up a regular donation. Uh, it means that we can keep putting out uh, Bright Green Live. We can continue with other videos and interviews and content that we put on our YouTube channel. And of course, all the articles that we publish on our website as well. Uh, all of our coverage of the UK's Green parties, of the Labour movement, of social movements and the wider left. Um, we have big plans to grow and expand throughout 2023. But we can only do that with your help. So if you are able to head over to our note page right now and set up a donation. Um, so we're going to be kicking off with our next interview in just five minutes time, which will be with Laura Webster, who is the editor, the new editor of The National newspaper. Uh, the National, for those who don't know, or perhaps outside of Scotland, is uh, the primary newspaper that supports Scottish independence. Uh, we're going to be talking about her vision and her plan for the newspaper, but also what role the National has in the wider movement for Scottish independence. And we're going to also be discussing um, what the current level of support is for independence in Scotland and uh, what the prospects are of an independent Scotland uh, in the near or medium near future. Uh, so all that is coming up at 12 o'clock. Um, if you have questions for Laura, please, 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 please do get them in the chat nice and early so that we can, uh, so I can put as many of them to her as possible. Um, I've changed my settings on the chat. So anyone who missed out last time, I will see your comments this time and we'll make sure that we put them to her. Uh, so any questions for Laura on the national, on Scottish independence, on Scottish politics more broadly, get them in the chat nice and early and I'll get as many to many of them to her as possible. Um, as always, please do get any other questions uh, for me or for any of our other guests in the chat as well. And any comments or reflections on the um, on the interviews that we're having um, and any other thoughts that you want to put in there as well. I generally like hearing how people are doing, uh, where, they're, where they're watching from, uh, how they found Bright Green, anything like that. Get it in the chat and I'll get as many of them read out as possible. So as always on Broke Green Live, I have a, I've set a challenge. Um, I want to get us to 50 likes on this video by the end of the stream. Now we're on track. The video currently has 12 likes and we are just two hours in. So we have six hours still to go. That means that for those of you who are watching, who haven't yet clicked that like button, you still have time. Uh, but make sure you do it often and early and get clicking like right now. It means this video will appear in more people's feeds. If you're enjoying the interviews that we're putting out in the show, other people will too. And we also have a target. I want to get Bright Green to 475 subscribers by the end of the day. We started on 446 and I'm just going to do a quick check now to see what we're on at this stage. We are currently on, drum roll please, as my refresh happens, 454. So eight people have subscribed since we started. That means you need another 21 people throughout the day. As easily doable, please do hit that um, subscribe button. I can see after I ask people to click like, someone has unliked the video, which uh, may be an error that they previously liked it, tried to do it twice and have unliked it or it may just be that they don't like being told what to do which i guess is fair enough uh, uh yeah so we're down to 11 likes which is sad times but uh we're gonna get to 50 by the end of the show with your help now in just three minutes time we're going to be joined by our next guest who is laura webster the current editor the new editor of the national newspaper we'll be discussing scottish independence uh her vision for the paper and also uh the role of the national in the wider movement for independence um please get your questions in the chat for laura and we uh i'll put them to her as long as they get in early enough that i can see them you can also put your questions on the hashtag bright green live and again i will try and get to as many of them as possible um thank you to dave callow who has shared uh the live stream on twitter uh, you're a superstar please do, uh, others, please do keep sharing and please do get your questions on the hashtag Bright Green Live. 
Um, thank you to Laura, who just retweeted the stream. You are a star and you will be joining us momentarily. And I can see that Laura has just entered the call. So I will let her in and we'll get started with the interview a little earlier, which means hopefully we'll have a little bit more time to discuss things. So as Laura enters the call right now and as she connects to the audio and gets set up I'll just do a brief introduction so Laura Webster is joining us right now and Laura is the new editor of the National uh Laura it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us how are you doing I'm great thank you thank you very much for having me and um, just to let you know I'm, I'm getting over the flu so my voice is a little bit shaky but I'm sure I'll get through it it'll be okay you and I both, I've been sneezing and coughing all day. So oh, no. uh, everyone, thankfully, uh, diseases can't be transmitted via YouTube. So I think all of our viewers will be safe. <laughs> um, so obviously you have uh, recently uh, got a new job at The National. So firstly, congratulations uh, as on your new post. Um, to start things off, what's your vision for The National now you're editing the paper? So I've been at the National for coming up on five years this year and I started off as a sub-editor so I learned a lot from just proofreading the paper every day and then I was our digital audience and content editor for the last year. I've been the news and features editor and as of last month I'm now the editor. So uh, yeah I absolutely love this newspaper. I love that we're the only pro-independence daily newspaper in Scotland, like we're giving a voice to the movement that needs to be heard. So I think that is the key thing, is that we do represent those voices within the independence movement across the broader independence movement. And um, I really want to put a focus on representing the grassroots as well. And um, I think there's so much exciting stuff going on with campaigning movements in Scotland that are not directly linked to the um, like the SNP and the Scottish government. There's, there's tons going on. Uh, I want to be a space for new writers and young voices to come on board uh, because we have to represent a vision of a progressive independent Scotland. We have to give something to people that they want to vote for and they're motivated to get involved with. Uh, and I think there's lots of ways we can do that. So I'm excited we'll be unveiling some new columnists in the next few weeks. Uh, and I think another key part of it as well is that I really want to reach out to the Labour yesers. So we know from polling that about a third of Labour voters in Scotland are pro-independence and their views are not being properly represented by their party. So somebody needs to stand up and say, look, there's a space for you within this independence movement. It doesn't have to be um, combative. We don't have to say, no, you're not part of this. Like we want you to be part of this. So that's going to be my big focus in the year ahead is reaching out to them and the trade union movement and making sure that they feel their voices are heard. And, uh, you know, these people are still voting for Labour, although they believe in independence. So how do we represent those views? Um, another thing is because I've done this digital role in the past, I'm really keen to introduce a bit more multimedia focus. So about a year and a half ago, we launched our national TikTok, which has done really, really well. And um, I think there's obviously a lot of space for young people who maybe don't want to read the paper every day in full, but they like little snippets about what's going on in the independence movement. So that's been really successful for us. And hopefully we'll be launching a video podcast as well uh, along the lines of what would an independent Scotland do? So that'll be every two weeks and we'll be interviewing different experts in different sectors about how an independent Scotland could do things differently to what's going on right now. So, for instance, we could be talking about the NHS. How could we better fund our NHS and make sure these waiting lists are down uh, in an independent Scotland or how we could um, help with the strikes, for example, um, how we could better pay our workers and make sure they're getting the, the respect that they deserve. So I think that'll be a really exciting opportunity to put forward how we could do things differently in independent Scotland, because for the past few years, a lot of the focus has been on this constitutional wrangling back and forth, which can be a little bit off-putting to people. They feel, why are you so focused on the Supreme Court and you know how Section 30 works when we could be talking about actual domestic issues that are going on so I'm very excited to continue the work that we've already been doing so well but just build on that a little. So there's loads that you've talked about there that I want to um, come back to and um, that last point about the constitutional wrangling uh, we've already had some questions come through in the chat about that so I will pick that up towards the end but before <laughs> sure. I do that 
Um, I wondered if you uh, could talk a little bit about the the role of the national in the wider movement for Scottish independence. So you said there uh, early on that, you know, the national is the only daily paper that supports independence. And obviously uh, the paper was sort of born out of the um the the 2014 referendum and the the kind of uh the intellectual and uh organizational um uh things that came out of, of that particular particular moment um but what role do you see the national having in the wider campaign and movement for independence i think there's a few so obviously on a day-to-day -day basis um the media here in scotland and across the uk more so is quite hostile to independence so our real main role is just making sure that we represent the, the voices that are pro-independence. Uh, I think that's it's still a challenge, honestly. And um, even in some sort of journalism circles, people kind of look down on the national because it is that alternative viewpoint. But somebody has to say it. I would absolutely love if more of the unionist kind of papers decided to be more vocal and give more of a space to independent supporters. They don't have to come out in full favor of it like we have but it's healthy to have different views represented. And um, so I love that we do that. And I think that is our, our main role, but obviously moving towards um, India F2, hopefully um, and further campaigning, it's really important that there's a space for a debate about different issues on independence. So I take that really seriously that there's lots of different views within the movement that need to be heard, um, especially on some of the bigger issues that maybe don't have solid, solid answers that everybody can get behind yet, like currency, uh, making sure that we can give people the space to debate that because there are lots of different views on it. And if you go to the main kind of unionist papers, they're only ever going to give you the negative view about, you know, why it wouldn't work. But we have to be able to give people a voice to explain, well, there's this position, there's this position, these are the benefits and these are the disadvantages. So I think uh, we had a really interesting piece from Richard Murphy after the, the last uh, independence paper came out about currency. Now he's really opposed to the Scottish government's plan to move to a new currency as soon as it's practicable. Uh, he argues that it should be a new currency from day one. And so these are the really interesting conversations that I think the national has a really important role in being able to, to kind of platform. And also just celebrating the positives about Scotland. I think um, this is a huge problem that we have in the media in Scotland is a real a kind of reluctance to talk about the positive things that happen here, um, not specifically to do with the government or the SNP or the Greens or anything like that, but just positive stories about Scotland, whether that's about businesses or amazing charities. Uh, I think it's important that we're able to kind of platform those stories and show that there's so much to be proud of in Scotland and there's so much amazing stuff going on. So that doesn't often get heard enough in the kind of mainstream titles. But yeah, that's what I see as, as our role. So you touched on um, something there that I wanted to pick up, which is, I guess, differences and disagreements within the independence movement. And there are some pretty stark differences, uh, I'd say, on uh, not just the uh, the vision for what an independent Scotland would look like, but also on a whole bunch of other issues um, sort of internally within the movement. So for the most obvious, most recent one that's kind of uh, hit the headlines has been the... Um, the, the pretty significant internal disagreements within the SNP over uh, the Gender Rec Recognition Act reform and on trans rights. Um, there's also obviously the, 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 the two parties of government in Scotland at the moment, the SNP and the Scottish Greens, have pretty fundamental differences on a whole bunch of things, whether it be, you know, on uh, an independent Scotland's membership of NATO, um, a whole bunch of other issues. Um, as 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 the 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 daily newspaper of I guess the independence movement or the only one that does support independence, um, how do you see the paper covering those different disagreements and differences within the movement? Well, I think we've had quite a bit of experience with doing that already. So obviously, um, if we go back to the Hollywood election and Alex Salmond launched the Alba Party, and that was obviously quite a big moment for the the movement because until that point things had been pretty settled. There was the SNP and there was the Greens and then there's smaller fringe parties as well. Um, but having such a person who'd been such a significant uh, figure within the movement go and do his own party, there was obviously a big kind of schism that, that happened because of that. 
and um, quite a few thousand uh, members of the SNP have switched over to ALBA. And obviously you want to represent the views of the, the majority, but it's also important to kind of give the space to make sure that conversations um, from ALBA are heard as well. So that was a bit of a challenge for us going into that election because it was, it was so different to how we've been used to doing things. Um, but we've just made sure that we kind of send our reporters to cover conferences um, across the country from all kinds of organizations and all of the parties. Um, on gender recognition, I think um, the, the most people in the SMP, I think, support uh, the, the changes for gender recognition reform, but obviously that was quite um, a controversial topic um, for a lot of our readers, like not everybody was on the same page, whether that's right or wrong. And basically, you just have to kind of platform it in a way that isn't going to harm any uh, specific groups or minority groups. And I think we did a really good job of covering it. We have people at Hollywood every day, uh, unfortunately, staying until well after midnight some nights because the Tories were making sure that everything was as disrupted as possible. But yeah, I think it's just making sure that you're giving a broad, a broad kind of um, section of, of viewpoints across the movement. And um, I think it's healthy, actually, for the independence movement to have all of these groups in different representatives, because it's, it's a challenge for the SNP to be able to be this broad group that can represent everybody's views, because there's so many different opinions within the movement. Of course, that's going to cause a lot of tension. So I think it's good that it's split up into different places now, because there was a lot Lot of tension pre-2021 uh, Hollywood election and I think that was causing a lot of issues for the, the party and, and stealing a lot of kind of focus on what they wanted to talk about and what the other groups wanted to talk about so yeah it, it works it works now I think it works there's still a lot of division within the movement and um, a lot of that I think is just kind of Twitter scrambling because when you go to independence events and you have people from SP, Alba, the Greens, these other groups and um, people aren't shouting at each other and um, it tends to just happen online. It's a general I think lesson for most of politics there uh, not just the independence movement that the shouting tends to happen on Twitter. Um, so I've got a final question for you before I move to some of the questions from the chat. Uh, but before I go there, I just wanted to, um, uh, for our viewers, please do get questions in the chat now um, so that I can put as many of them to Laura as possible. Um, so my final question for you is um, around levels of support for Scottish independence at the moment. I wondered if you could talk through your kind of assessment of uh, how strong support is for independence at the moment. Sure, I think we're in a quite a good place just now. So most of the recent polling has shown that we have a, a slight majority. Uh, that's been mostly after the Supreme Court decision. So for those who are unaware, the Supreme Court basically said that uh, the way that devolution is set up, uh, Holyrood cannot hold an independence referendum without explicit permission from Westminster. And that in itself has caused a lot of conversation about uh, how is this a voluntary union if the, uh, one of the partners is not allowed to leave without the other's um, explicit permission. So I think that's actually opened up a bit of dialogue about where we go next, because before that, like I was saying earlier, there was a lot of constitutional wrangling back and forth. And now we know, OK, these are the provisions that we're working under. There has to be a Section 30 order or we need to figure out some other kind of way forward. So the SNP is holding this special conference on March 19th in Edinburgh, which is going to be looking at how they do the de facto referendum. I think that is a bit of a contentious subject. There's a lot of disagreement on the right way to do it. So getting everybody into one room and kind of forcing them to figure it out, I think will be quite advantageous for the independence movement. And uh, the other thing is I did read some quite interesting polling analysis recently, which suggested that this boost in support for independence is maybe not directly linked to the Supreme Court, it's more to do with the terrible governance from Westminster. Uh, I don't think that would be too much of a surprise to anybody, but the way that the cost of living crisis is, uh, the government's hostility to migrants and refugees and trade unions, all of this is very much at odds with the kind of political culture in Scotland right now. And it does make England and Scotland feel like very separate places with very separate ideas of what we need to do. 
So Brexit has had a massive impact too. And people are, are aware that we have big challenges in Scotland with, for example, being able to staff our industries uh, properly because we have fewer EU workers and Scotland has a declining population as well. So being able to kind of put forward arguments in favor of migration um, and bringing in more people to Scotland, um, it, it stands very much in opposition to what Westminster is, is all about right now. Um, but on the other side to that, Labour are not really inspiring any hope here in Scotland either. I think Keir Starmer doesn't really get Scotland 100%. And some of the, I mean, that's saying it lightly, but I'll be diplomatic about it. Um, I think, for example, he made some comments last year towards the end of the year about there being too many foreign workers in the NHS. And that really got a lot of people's backs up here in Scotland because... I mean, where is that coming from? If anything, we need more people from further seas. Like we need there to be more people in the NHS to make it work effectively. Now, obviously there's a whole conversation to be had about the fact that we need to be training more people in the UK, but that in itself goes along with, you know, it's harder for people to get into nursing or um, study medicine than it used to be, especially in England. So all of these kind of comments, they really do feel support for independence. And they make it seem like there's not an alternative if we stick in the union and there's a Labour government, which it looks like there will be, will there really be any kind of substantive change? And for most people with Keir Starmer in charge, I think the answer to that question is no, very much no. And um, the UK government also kind of steamrolling parts of devolution is a bit of a big issue here as well, which feels support. So the most recent example being it looks like they might challenge the gender recognition reform bill in the Supreme Court. And obviously that could go either way. But most kind of legal experts are saying this is not really an issue of law. This is an issue of just them wanting to uh, fuel this culture war and, and look like they're in control. But ultimately that will backfire. And whenever there's these issues, it happened with there was the children's rights bill last year as well. Um, people really, really dislike the idea that Westminster can just veto Scottish legislation that they see as being well within the rights of devolution and should be possible under the Scotland Act. So all of these things come together and I think that they they really help the, the cause. Um, obviously, the way the cost of living crisis is, um, Scotland is an energy rich nation and people can see that because we have oil and gas and obviously that's not really the path that we want to go down but we also have this massive renewable capacity and the fact is that there are people in Aberdeen who can't afford to put their heating on despite the fact that their resources have been what's been getting the UK economy uh, to the, this point over the years. So all of that really draws attention to the fact that we should have control over our own resources and our own institutions uh, and I think that will sort of power the movement going forward as well. So I said I'll go to the chat, but I have actually got one question to pick up on something you talked about there, which is uh, around the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. So obviously you kind of made the case there that um, that there won't be significant difference if we do get a Labour government in the next couple of years. Um, I guess one one argument that I guess people, uh, unionists and Labour supporters often talk about is um, the uh the role of kind of political reform within the union um and so we've just recently had gordon brown's uh, set of proposals for the labor party policy which includes things like slightly more devolution not just at a national level but also at a regional level um and a whole bunch of other stuff and i wondered if you think that um if those proposals that gordon brown has come out with or any other wider package of kind of democratic reforms um would dampen the kind of mood and support for independence uh, not at all, to be honest. I mean, the day that the report came out, we were sitting in the newsroom and we were going through it. And our initial thought was just, is this it? Is this what they see as radical change for the way the UK works? Uh, in my view, it really doesn't go far enough. Um, abolishing the House of Lords, fantastic. We should have been doing that for much longer. Like this should have been done already. But the, the reality is Labour have been talking about abolishing the House of Lords for what is it, 112 years or something like that. 
why should we possibly believe that they have any intention of doing that now? Um, and obviously the report that Gordon Brown did is just a series of recommendations. Keir Starmer could just ignore it. Keir Starmer has broken his promises several times before. What happened with the 10 pledges? So we have no real reason to have any faith that those changes would happen at all. But in general, it just isn't going far enough. And it's not the kind of change that we want to see here. Uh, there's a, you know, people have a real passion about um, the border, um, the borders situation. And if we can't have control over our own borders, and not in the sense of Brexiteers, but in the sense of being able to decide on migration and migration targets, that is a huge part of Scotland's future. If our population keeps declining in the way that it is, we're going to have big, big, big problems further down the road, and we're already seeing them now. So that is the kind of radical change that we need. We need to have control over immigration, and we need to have control over things like the welfare state. And it's, it's fine that we have some benefits that we can give out here now. That obviously does make a difference, but it's mitigating the damage that's coming from Westminster. And just being able to do these little bits and pieces around the edges, it's not going to make any significant change. And I just don't see people energized by it at all. I mean, obviously, my kind of the responses I was picking up when the Brown Report came out was from the independence movement, but there was also a lot of constitutional experts saying this isn't radical enough and this won't make significant change. So it's not just coming from yesers who are saying that. So we're going to delve into lots more about the conversation about the Brown Report later in the show when we have Tom Bright uh, from Unlock Democracy on. So we're going to be picking that in more depth. Uh, but while we've still got Laura, we've got a great question from the chat uh, from uh, Dave Callow. And so I said earlier we'd talk about the constitutional wrangling a little bit. And Dave's question is about that. Um, so Dave says that they fully support Scottish independence, but obviously the Westminster government is getting in the way of this. Um, how does the, the independence movement circumvent uh, the Westminster government on this? I think this is the big challenge that we have. Um, obviously, support is strong right now. And with a campaign, it could probably be taken up a lot further. But how we actually get to Indiref2 is the big talking point, And it now has been for several years. So as I said before, the Supreme Court says um, pretty explicitly that we need to have a Section 30 order from Westminster. So right now, the SNP's plan is to use the next general election as a de facto referendum. So 50% plus one would be enough to start negotiations. Now, of course, there's a lot of questions around how that would work. And that's why they're doing that special conference later in the year, because the UK government could ultimately still turn around, even if there was 55% or something crazy for the SNP at Westminster election and say, well, we're just not going to negotiate with you. And then what do you do at that stage? So it, it's not necessarily going to to take us to that point of definitely this will secure independence but there's lots of conversations that will be had about that in the coming months so as well after the election I think some people would hope that um, Labour would potentially grant a section 30 order but Keir Starmer has been really clear that that's not something he plans to do he said no deals with the SNP at all so it, it seems unlikely that um, the SNP would offer their support to a potential Labour government, whether that's a minority government or a coalition, uh, if there wasn't going to be that Section 30 order returned. So I think it would be more likely that you would see a Labour Lib Dem coalition if it came to it that Labour needed that support. So yeah, it's all up in the air right now. I'm afraid I don't have a strong answer for you, but when we do, I'll let you know, you can read all about it in the National. I was just going to say that the best way you can find the answers to these questions is to read The National. Uh, so for our viewers, please do do that. Um, Laura, I'm going to let you get on with the rest of your Sunday. As always, it's been brilliant to chat to you. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Chris. It's been fantastic. Cheers. So that was Laura Webster, who is the new editor of The National. Uh, I'd love to hear what you thought of that interview in the chat. So please do let me know there. Um, we've had lots of conversations about Scottish independence and the movement for independence on Bright Green, both on our on our YouTube channel and also on our website. Um, Laura is one of the voices that I think is one of the most interesting and insightful and is obviously so close to it now as editor of the paper. Um, so I found that inter interview particularly insightful um, and I hope you did 
two. Um, so we've been streaming for about two hours. We have just shy a dozen people watching. Uh, we have 14 likes of the video. Let's get that rolling up. So if you haven't already hit that like button, it means that more people will see this video in their YouTube feeds and more people will get to enjoy and experience the interviews that we're putting out throughout the day. Um, you can also hit the subscribe button, which means that you won't miss out on any of the other interviews that we're putting out over the course of the coming weeks and months, including the next episode of Bright Green Live, which will be on February the 12th, and also other uh, content videos, interviews that we are releasing on our YouTube channel. You'll get a little notification. You'll see everything on your YouTube feed if you hit the subscribe button. Now, uh, before we move into the rest of our interviews, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about one of the other things that Bright Green has been doing recently on our YouTube channel, and that's about the 2024 London mayoral elections. Now, the Green Party of England Wales is in the process of selecting its candidates uh, for the London mayoral election and the London Assembly election, which will be taking place in a year and a bit's time. And as part of our coverage of those selection processes, we have interviewed all three of the candidates who are in the running to be the Green Party's candidate for London mayor next time around. So three candidates are in the running. There is Benali Hamdash, who is a Green Party councillor in Islington and also the Green Party's spokesperson on migration. Uh, there is Zoe Garbutt, who is a councillor in Hackney, and Scott Ainsley, who is a councillor in Lambeth and also a former MEP. Now, on our YouTube channel, you can find interviews with all three of those candidates. And this is a really important selection process for the Greens. The reason that it's so important is because the London mayoral candidate becomes de facto one of the most prominent Greens in the country throughout the whole of the, the election campaign. They get some of the most high profile broadcast gigs. They end up being in the media loads. They'll get big slots at party conference and there will be uh, someone that lots of people, journalists, voters, others will be following on social media. So it's a really crucial election. And that's why Bright Green decided to do an in-depth interview with each of the candidates so that members of the Green Party have a proper um, detailed, thorough understanding of the candidates, what they're putting forward on their platforms, and also a little bit about their background and personality too. So after today's show, or at some point in one of the breaks, you can go to our YouTube channel, just click the bright green button, and you can see those three interviews. They're in a little playlist, so you should be able to find them nice and easily. I found the conversations really interesting, and I think all three candidates have a lot of um, unique things to bring to the contest um, as well. Alongside our coverage of the London mayoral elections, we're also going to be providing lots of coverage of the London Assembly selection process for the Green Party. Now, there are 24 candidates in the running for the 11 places on the Green Party's list for the 2024 London Assembly election. So for those of you who don't know, the way the London Assembly is elected is that there are 25 members of the Assembly, 14 of which are elected through first past the post in mega constituencies, huge constituencies covering huge parts of London. The remaining 11 members of the Assembly are elected proportionally through a list. And now the Green Party's only ever won seats on the Assembly through the list. So currently it has three seats. Uh, so Sean Berry, Caroline Russell and Zach Polanski are all members of the London Assembly elected through the list. Now, the 24 candidates who are putting themselves forward uh, have a real chance, some of them, of being elected to the London Assembly. Now, the London Assembly members are some of the most senior elected politicians that the Greens have in the country, probably only behind Caroline Lucas and a couple of local council leaders in their seniority. So those selections are also really, really important. And it's a really interesting set of elections this year. Firstly, because all three of the current Assembly members are trying to get selected again. So Sean Barry, Callum Russell and Zach Polanski are all seeking reselection. You also have a bunch of other high profile candidates in the running as well, including all three of those candidates that I mentioned earlier for the London mayoral position. Uh, so Zoe Garbutt, Scott Ainsley and Benali Hamdash. And of course, you have a raft of councillors across London who are also in the running, the likes of Nate Higgins and Danny Keeling in Newham and others from Richmond, from Lambeth and elsewhere as well. So there's a huge number of high profile, capable Greens in the running. There's also a really interesting dynamic in that London Assembly election. Uh, so currently in the selection process, there are, as I say, 24 candidates 
Now, 20 of them are standing on a joint ticket. They're standing as a slate, uh, and that ticket includes the likes of Caroline Russell, Sean Berry, Zach Polanski, Zoe Garbert, Nate Higgins, a whole bunch of those candidates. And they're standing on a joint uh, slate. And on the other hand, there is a other, another slate, which is comprised of three candidates, which includes the Green Party's former deputy leader, Shara Ali, and the Green Party's current um, equality diversity uh, equality diversity coordinator, sorry, um, Zai Neal. And those two, this is the first time that I'm aware of there has been such open uh, slates standing in those selections. You'll notice that 20 plus three does not equal 24. There is a final candidate who is not standing on a slate, uh, which is Benali Hamdash, but Benali is widely seen as being sympathetic and akin to the uh, 20 person strong slate. Um, now, I think this is a really interesting dynamic and I'm really interested to see where this selection process goes. And I would love to hear other people's thoughts as well. If you have thoughts on that, please do put them in the comments if you're a member of the Green Party and have views. But also we're going to be covering the London Assembly elections on our website throughout the campaign. So uh, throughout January and the start of February, we're going to be publishing articles written by those in the running to be on the London Assembly list. And also the mayoral candidates, their supporters, and really trying to delve into the real kind of crux of the issues um, that people are talking about. So you can find, as I say, the three interviews with the London mayoral, the people trying to be the Green Party's London mayoral candidates on our YouTube channel. Just hit the bright green button at the end of the show and you'll be able to find them. And also on our website, bright-green.org, throughout the campaign, you'll be able to see uh, articles, interviews, analysis, etc., with all the people in the running for the list and the mayoral election um, on there as well. So... Thank you so much for indulging me and my talking about the London Assembly and mayoral selections for the Green Party. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us, uh, make sure you hit subscribe, make sure you hit that like button. Uh, so I had two targets at the start of the show. One was to get 475 subscribers. We are currently on, bum, 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 drum roll as my page reloads, 454. So we need 21 more to go. If you're watching and you're not yet subscribed, hit that subscribe button right now. I'm also trying to get to 50 likes on the video. The reason I ask you to like the video is because it means it appears in more people's feeds so if you haven't already hit like we still have 36 of those lovely little thumbs up like buttons uh, to go if nothing else if you don't care about it all it, the, main, the main thing it does really is it gives me a little dopamine here as I see the numbers go up and hopefully you feel good about making me feel good and you get a little bit of pleasure and um, happiness from clicking the thumbs up button um please do share the show link on your socials um on the hashtag bright green live um and get comments and questions coming in the chat we have an amazing lineup of guests and i would love to put lots of questions to them so please do pop them in the chat and also any questions you have for me any feedback and thoughts on the show so far so just to give you a quick rundown of what we have still to come. So our next interview will be with John Bosco and Wobo, who is lead campaigner at We Own It. We Own It is the anti-privatisation campaign group. We're going to be talking about NHS privatisation. We're going to be talking about the impact it has, the scale of it in the health service and how we resist it. Uh, following that, we have Amy Cardaliwell, who is one of the two deputy leaders of the Green Part, the Wales Green Party, um, and we're going to be discussing the role, uh, the impact of the flurry of Green Party councillors in Wales that were elected in May 2022. Uh, we then have Chloe Naldrut from Just Stop Oil discussing uh, Just Stop Oil's mobilisation plans throughout 2023. Tom Brake uh, after that is the um, Director of Unlock Democracy, the Democratic Reform Campaign Group. Um, the conversation we had with Laura Webster earlier touched on some of these issues because what we're going to be talking about is the Labour Party, the report that Gordon Brown, Gordon Brown put forward into uh, Labour Party's policies on democratic reform. We're going to be looking at whether those proposals are sufficient, what a true democratic state would look like, and of course we'll be discussing proportional representation as well. Our penultimate interview will be with Sonia Adasara. She's an NHS doctor and a campaigner. We're going to be talking about the crisis in the NHS, what's causing it, the uh, big issues that are underpinning the disputes, the industrial disputes in the health service right now, and the role of privatisation in all of that and more. And finally, our last guest of the day will be Phelan McCafferty, the Green Party leader of Brighton Hove City Council, 
we are going to be discussing the um, the record of the Greens in administration in Brighton Hove in the 18 months that they have been running the show. And uh, we're going to be also talking about the prospects of them getting re-elected in May 2023. So that's the rest of the show. As I say, please do get your comments, questions, thoughts in the chat. Um, one of the strange things about this experience of, of hosting these live streams, is even though I'm talking to loads of people throughout the day, even though I can see there's loads of people watching, it can be quite a lonely experience. The best way to make it less lonely for me is to get comments, thoughts, questions in the chat. Happy to talk about anything, happy to put any of your questions to our guests, but only if you put them in the chat because I can't read your minds through the internet. So put them in the chat, get them on Twitter, um, and I'll try and get as many of the your comments read out, as many of your questions put to our guests, and if you're asking questions of me, as many of your questions answered as well. Uh, so I'm going to take a very well before I before I take a break. I just wanted to uh, I'll do some shout outs to people who have been commenting and sharing. So. Uh, Vix Lowthian, uh, a friend of Bright Green, a previous guest on Bright Green Live, and of course the Green Pot of England and Wales' education spokesperson has just tweeted to say that uh, she is loving this episode so far. I am too. I'm sure lots of other people are. Uh, be more like Vix. Share the link to the live stream and uh, make sure that other people can see it. Meg Shepherd Foster, also on Twitter, says another fantastic lineup on Bright Green today. Uh, Meg is listening while catching up on work. Um, we're going to be live streaming for the next six hours. Yes, we are indeed, Meg. Although five and a half now, we are another half hour down. Um, and uh, let's just check the hashtag. Uh, thanks again to Dave Callow for sharing the link to the live stream earlier. Um, and we've had lots of good comments coming through in the chat so far. Uh, so Rosie was praising uh, the interview that we did with Joe Bird earlier and was really grateful for Joe's thoughts on how we um, how Greens can convince more Labour councillors, supporters, activists to jump ship and join the Greens. Um, and Elite Sabre Coaching earlier in the day uh, said we had a great discussion with Jen Bell and Nile Christie uh, from the Scottish Green Party Trade Union Group. You can rewind in the stream and watch any of those interviews back um, at your leisure. Um, so the interview with Nile Christie and Jen Bell was at 10.15, one with, so probably about 15 minutes into the show, into the stream. Uh, the one with uh, Joe Bird was at 11 o'clock. So again, you can scroll back to about an hour into the stream and then the one with uh laura webster that we just had was at 12 o'clock so again two hours into the stream you can scroll back and watch that uh so i'm going to take a quick break uh i'll be back very very soon what i would love is to see a flurry of comments and questions for me to respond to in the chat when i return so please do get them in there and i will see you all very very shortly
Welcome back. I have returned. Um, hope you uh, have enjoyed the show so far. If you're newly joining us, if you're watching episode three of Bright Green Live, a monthly live stream where we uh, interview uh, guests from across the British left, from the uh, labour movement, from social movements, from green parties and a wider uh, portion of the left and we have a whole range of guests uh, from a range of different backgrounds today we have thus far had three of our uh, nine interviews we've got a packed afternoon still to come uh, the interviews we've had so far have been with Jen Bell and Nal Christie of the Scottish Green Party Trade Union Group they're the co conveners of the Scottish Green Party Trade Union Group and uh, we discussed the work the Scottish Green Party Trade Union Group is doing, the, uh, the the role of the Scottish Greens in government in supporting worker struggles, why Greens in general should support trade unions and the uh, struggle of workers, the rise of industrial militancy in the UK and a whole bunch of other things. That was our first interview. If you want to scroll back and watch that, you can rewind the show. Uh, it was on at 10.15. So if you go to about 15 minutes into the video, you should be able to find that. Uh, we then had Jo Bird, who is a Green Party councillor in the Wirral. Uh, she was on to discuss the um, role, well, not the role, uh, clearly my caffeine has worn off. Uh, she was in there to discuss her reasons for joining the Green Party and the contrasting experience she's had as a Green Party councillor to that which she had as a Labour Party councillor and also the uh, impacts that the wave of defections from uh, Labour to the Greens in city councils and borough councils and district councils and whatever else across the country is having on the Green Party. Uh, following that, our third interview was with Laura Webster, who is the new editor of The National, the newspaper, the only daily national newspaper, the only daily newspaper in Scotland that supports independence. We talked about her plans for the paper, the role of the paper in the movement for Scottish independence and uh, levels of support for Scottish independence within Scotland. So those are our three guests so far, and we have, as I say, six more interviews to come. The next of which is with John Bosco and Wobo from We Own It, the anti-privatisation campaign group. We're going to be talking about NHS privatisation, its impact, the scale of it, and how we resist it. Following that, we have Amy Carr Daliwell from the Wales Green Party. They are the depth leader of the Wales Green Party. And we're going to be talking about the um, flurry of Green councillors that were elected in May 2022, the impacts they're already having, and the future electoral prospects of the Welsh Greens. We then have Chloe Naldruck from Just Stop Oil, the climate campaign group, talking about, we're going to be discussing rather, uh, the Just Stop Oil's plans for mobilisation throughout 2023. Uh, following that, we have Tom Brake, the uh, is a former Liberal Democrat MP and now the director of Unlock Democracy, the Democrat Reform Campaign Group. We're going to be discussing the uh, proposals that Gordon Brown put forward to change the Labour Party's policies on Democrat reform. We're going to be looking at whether they are sufficient and we're going to be looking at uh, proportional representation and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, our Panorb interview will be Sonia Adasara, who's an NHS doctor um and a campaigner we're going to be discussing the crisis in the nhs and um the industrial disputes that are taking place in the health service right now the role of privatization all that and how we fix the health service and finally our last interview will be with phelan mccafferty the green party leader of brighton hove city council the only leader of a group council in the country where the greens are in sole administration we're going to be talking about the 18 months that he's been in charge of brian hove and the record of the greens in administration so that's the rest of our show an absolutely stacked lineup of guests i am sure you will agree and we're going to be talking to them until 6 p.m today uh, throughout the live stream um, thank you to everyone who has liked the video thus far. Um, if you haven't already, please do hit like. We've got a target of hitting 50 likes by the end of the show. We're currently on 17, so we've got a long way to go. 33 still to go. That is my math skills uh, on display. We're also aiming to get 475 subscribers by the end of the day. We're currently on 454, so 21 still to go. If you're just joining us, you haven't liked or subscribed yet, please do hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and everyone will have a good time. Uh, throughout the show, we're going to be taking your questions and comments and putting them to our guests. So make sure to get them in the chat. It's easier for me to get them put to our guests if they come in earlier. 
So get your questions lined up for our next couple of interviews. Also, any comments or feedback on the show so far and any questions that you have for me, I'm happy to answer as well. Uh, if you haven't already, you can follow Bright Green on all of the social media channels. On Twitter, we are at BrightGRN. On Facebook, we're on Facebook.com forward slash BrightGRN. On Instagram, we're at Bright Green Online. And on Mastodon, we're at Bright Green on the UK server. Hopefully that will allow you to find us. Um, apologies, we have different handles on all those channels. It annoys me to no end that someone has the at Bright Green handle on Twitter um, and they will not give it to us because it would be much, much easier if we had a sensible handle. Um, as you may or may not be aware, Bright Green does not have the backing of billionaires and big business. We rely solely on the kind of generous donations and support of people just like you. If you are able to, please do head to our donate page where you can set up a regular donation of just five pounds a month or whatever you can afford. Um, you can find the link to that in the description of this video. It's also uh i'm gonna go in the chat very soon and it is bright-green.org forward slash donate your support your donations is what allows us to broadcast bright green live on the second sunday of every month and also is what keeps us uh publishing all the articles that we put out on our website and all the other coverage that bright green provides we can only do it with your help so please do if you are able to set up a donation and that link will be in the chat imminently um if you give me one second to type uh it's in the chat now click that button click that link and you will be able to set up a donation thank you to the two more people who've hit like that's hugely appreciated um gave me a little dopamine hit hopefully gave you some joy as well pressing that button um to let you know what's coming up on future shows so our next show will be on the 12th of february and we already have two amazing guests lined up for that show. We currently have the former Green Party MEP, Molly Scott Cato, joining us. Um, she is going to be talking about the Green Party of England and Wales' response to the cost of living crisis and how uh, the Green Party would tackle it. We also have Mark Sawatka, who is the General Secretary of the PCS Union, joining us. Um, we'll be discussing the uh, wave of industrial action and strikes that are sweeping across the nation uh, in a general sense, but also in a very specific sense about the range of uh, industrial disputes that the PCS is currently engaged in around pay and conditions over things across the country. PCS is the union that represents civil servants and other public sector staff. Um, so, for example, the border force strikes that took place over Christmas, the DVLA strikes, a whole bunch of other strikes that are taking place. Um, it's been the PCS union behind them. So we're going to be discussing that and more. It's absolute honor that we'll be joined by a trade union general secretary on Brett green live the first time we will be that episode will be on february the 12th and you can catch it on our youtube channel get it in your diaries but also if you haven't already hit subscribe and then you won't miss out on the show so we're still on 454 subscribers that's disappointing i told you to subscribe and you haven't obeyed my orders uh you can <laughs> it doesn't cost you anything hit that subscribe button and you won't miss out on any of our other videos uh little comment from steve m says cheers folks i'm assuming that's a cheers to bright green might be a cheers to all of you watching uh but cheers to you steve m as well uh thanks for joining us and thanks to all of our um regular viewers who've been with us uh throughout other shows as well steve c i've seen in the chat uh meg foster i've seen uh tweeting vix laudian i've seen tweeting as well um vix i interviewed on the first episode of bright green live which is on our youtube channel you can go and catch that um at your leisure the interview is uh in the the main video itself but also there's a standalone uh, video of the interview. We discussed the big issues in the school sector right now. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, Vic Slavian is the Green Party of England Wales Education Spokesperson and also a member of the National Education Union. Uh, we discussed the uh, ballots that were taking place um, of the National Education Union, the NAS UWT, and the uh, National Association of Head Teachers, who are balloting for strike action over pay and also conditions. Um, and the ballot, I believe, closes tomorrow for the NEU 
and the NS, NAS, I think. Uh, but very, very soon we're going to be finding out whether teachers will be going on strike, which will be a massive escalation of the wave of industrial action if that does take place. Um, so if you want to know the background behind those, you can go back and watch that interview with uh, Vix at your leisure. So coming up next on the show, we have John Bosco and Wobo from We Own It. We're going to be discussing NHS privatisation. And I, I should probably declare an interest with that interview in that I used to work for We Own It. So for two and a bit years, I was We Own It's press and comms officer. Um, they're a fantastic organisation uh, that campaigns against privatisation and for public ownership of public services. Uh, very recently, they had a massive victory, of course, um, in the battle to save Channel 4 from privatisation, with Michelle Donnell and the Culture Secretary confirming that the government was no longer planning to sell off Channel 4. We Own It was one of the organisations that led that campaign uh, to resist that sell off alongside uh, trade unions like Equity, the Actors Union, um, and also, sorry, then. If anyone from Equity is watching, I very, very apologise. You don't call yourself the Actors' Union anymore, do you? You call yourself the Creative Workers' Union. I may have got that wrong, um, but I believe that's the case. Uh, the Union for Creative Workers um, and a whole bunch of other organisations, including loads of independent production companies that uh, have worked with Channel 4 over the years, and they fought a campaign and that campaign won. We Own It um, has also been involved in loads of other campaigns that have uh, been really successful, have uh, saved public services and assets from being sold off. They stopped NHS professionals being sold off in 2017 or whenever it was. They um, stopped uh, a whole bunch of the privatisations and are publicly making the case consistently for our services to be in public hands where they rightfully should be from the railways to our water energy uh, the whole shebang uh, so i'm incredibly excited to be joined by my former colleague john bosco uh, very very soon on our next interview uh, please do get your comments and questions lined up for john bosco uh, about the nhs privatization of the nhs privatization more generally models of public ownership anything you want to ask him john bosco is a great guy and he'll be able to answer them If you haven't already done so, please do share the show link on your social media channels. That helps us massively to reach more people. If you've enjoyed the interviews that we've been putting out throughout the day, um, then you will have someone else on your Facebooks or your uh, Twitters or whatever, or other uh, whatever other platforms you use. He will also enjoy them. So make sure you do that. Uh, as you might be able to tell, as my words are getting more confused and I'm stumbling and things are getting a little messy, I my my third coffee has now definitely worn off. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is go and make another coffee so that in time for when John Bosco joins us, I will be sufficiently lucid and sufficiently awake in order to be having the conversation that we ought to be having. So uh, I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Just going to make a coffee. Uh, I'll see you very, very soon.
Coffee number four is at the ready, and I am at the ready for the rest of the show. Thanks to everyone who's joined us. Uh, we You're watching episode three of Bright Green Live, uh, a monthly show bringing you interviews with key figures from across the left, uh, the Labour movement, social movement, Green parties, and so on. Uh, we're going to be streaming until 6pm today, so we're not even halfway through. We still have six fantastic guests to come, so make sure that you stay tuned. Um, thank you to everyone who has hit the like button and who has subscribed. As I keep saying, we've got an aim of getting 50 likes by the end of the show on the video and 475 subscribers. Since I last asked you, two fantastic people have hit subscribe. We're now on 456 that means we just have uh, 19 to go uh, on the subscribers list. So please do keep them rolling in. Hit that subscribe button right now. Do as you are told. So our six remaining guests for the rest of the show are first up, John Bosco and Wobo from We Own It. Uh, we then have Amikar Daliwal from the Wales Green Party, deputy leader of one of the two deputy leaders of the Wales Green Party. We have Chloe Naldrup from Just Stop oil uh, tom brake from unlock democracy the nhs doctor and campaigner sonia adasara and finally Phelan mccafferty the green party leader of brian hove city council that's all coming up throughout the rest of the show if you're just joining us and you've missed the earlier interviews don't fear you can rewind through the video and watch them you can catch the interviews with now christy and jen bell uh 15 minutes into the show talking about the Scottish Greens and the relationship between Scottish Greens and trade unions. You can scroll back uh, to about an hour into the show to catch the interview with Joe Bird, the Green Party uh, councillor in the Wirral, uh, talking about why she joined the Green Party and the difference between her experience as a Green councillor to that uh, that she previously had as a Labour councillor. And you can watch the interview with Laura Webster, the new editor of The National, talking about her views, her vision for the paper and support levels for Scottish independence and much, much more about uh, two hours into the show at 12 p.m. Thank you to the person who just gave me a dopamine hit and hit that like button. We're now on 20, so we just have 30 to go. If you haven't already, please do share the link to the live stream on your social media channels. If you're enjoying these interviews, other people will too. And of course, uh, throughout the show, we're going to be putting your questions to our guests. Uh, so please do get them in the chat nice and early so that I can read them and any questions and thoughts you have for me. I'd love to take feedback from the show uh, on the show. So please do get uh, your reflections in the chat and also um, any suggestions for future guests. We will do our best uh, to book them. So let us know who you want to see on future episodes of Bright Green Live and we will try and book them. Um, thank you to everyone who uh, has done all those things that I've asked of you thus far. Thank you also to Chris TT, a uh, great musician and a friend of Bright Green's previously appeared on Bright Green shows in the past who has pointed out the typo in my tweet. Uh, we are not love on YouTube, as I claimed. We are live on YouTube. Thanks, Chris TT, for your pedantry. Much appreciated. Um, if you're not familiar with, with Chris TT, go to his music. It is fantastic um throughout the uh coming months bright green is going to be publishing a number of articles on the green party's selection processes for the green party of england and wales candidates for the london assembly and also for the london mayoral elections both of which are in 2024 you can find uh, our coverage on our website, which is bright-green.org, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. But also we have interviewed the three candidates who are standing to be the Green Party's candidate for the 2024 London mayor election uh, on our YouTube channel. So once you finish with the show, you can go to our YouTube channel and find those three interviews. We spoke to Benali Hamdash, who is a councillor in Islington and also the Green Party's spokesperson on migration. He also ran the uh, Green Party's 2021 mayoral campaign. He was their campaign manager. Uh, we spoke to him about why he's standing to be the mayoral candidate, his experience, his background, a whole bunch of other stuff. We also spoke to Zoe Garbutt, who is a councillor in Hackney. Um, she is well known for her work uh, as a councillor in su supporting 
uh, trade uh, workers and their campaigns and struggles, particularly delivery riders. Um, the interview with her is on our YouTube channel. And then finally, Scott Ainsley, who's a former Green Party MEP and a councillor in Lambeth. Uh, we spoke to him very recently, and I think that interview was published just yesterday with Scott. So once you're done with the show, you can go and find out about all the people who are seeking to be the Greens candidate for London Mayor in 2024. It's one of the most important internal selections for the Green Party. Uh, the reason that I say that is not because I you know, have a particular... Um, uh, a particularly London-centric view. I despise London, uh, but nonetheless, uh, as a result of the way our politics and media works and the nature of that election, the London mayoral candidate is one of the uh, will be one of the Green Party's most prominent figures uh, once selected. And so that selection process is really, really significant because that person is going to go on and do loads of uh, media appearances. There'll be you know, a uh, major spokesperson for the party throughout the, the run up to that election. They'll be one of the Greens that has the biggest social media following. So who that person is really, really matters for the Greens. Um, and also other parties, obviously, but we're focused on uh, who the Green candidate will be. So um, we wanted to make sure that members of the Greens had an informed view on who that candidate would be. So that's why we're putting out those in-depth interviews so you can watch them at your leisure. I would love to be kept company by your comments in the chat. Uh, please do let me know what you thought of the show so far. Um, previously, loads of people have asked me questions on previous episodes, and none of you have asked me any questions so far, and that's really sad. I'm I'm happy to answer any question under the sun. If you pop it in the chat, I'll do my best to answer it. But of course, most importantly, get your questions in the chat for our guests who are coming up soon, particularly our next two guests, John Bosco and Wobo and Amy Cardaliwell. Um, so that I can put them to them. The easy, the, it's easier for me to get to questions if I see them earlier, so that the sooner you get them in, the more likely it is that they will get asked. So our next guest will be joining us in around 15 minutes' time. Apologies for the slight gap in the show. Always on booking these, it's hard to get uh, everything lined up perfectly. So unfortunately, we do have this slightly longer gap, which means you have to hear me talking more. Apologies. But the, the second half of the show is going to be absolutely rampacked. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so we have a whole sway of interviews lined up for the second half of the show, which hopefully will be a bit more smooth in terms of the running from one show to the other. I may not even have time to grab coffee between the interviews, um, which we'll see how that goes, because clearly, as you will have experienced thus far, without caffeine, my coherence takes a significant drop. Um, thanks so much for watching. If you haven't already, hit that like button. Please do subscribe. We have a target of getting 50 likes in the video by the end of the show that's not just for my purposes that's for all uh, the world's purposes too uh, because when you hit that like button it tells the youtube algorithm this is a video that people enjoy want to see want to like um want to like uh, do like and therefore the video will appear in more people's feeds it'll appear on more people's suggested videos list it'll appear more on the home page elsewhere as well um so if you've enjoyed the interviews and the stream then the best way to make sure other people will see them is to hit that like button. Of course, you can make sure that you don't miss out on any of the other shows that we're putting out uh, of Bright Green Live on the second Sunday of every month um, by subscribing. If you subscribe, you get a notification when you go live. When we go live, you'll also uh, see our videos in your feed, in your subscriptions feed. Uh, so every time we put out one of these live streams, but also the other interviews and content that we put out, like the interviews with the London Mayoral candidates. Um, you will see those more and it means that you won't miss out on anything that we're putting out. It also helps us massively because it means that we reach more people. So it's a win, 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 win for all involved. Um, so please do subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, we are on 456, which means that we are 19 short of our 475 target by the end of the day, but we have many hours to go. So I'm sure we will make it. And of course, if you haven't already, share the stream on your social media channels, uh, preferably using the hashtag Bright Green Live. Thanks, of course, to those who are joining for the first time ever on Bright Green Live. And of course, to those who have been with us before. Um, Steve C, I saw earlier on, he's a regular on the chat. Uh, Vix Laudian tweeting, Meg Foster also around. Uh, thank you, friends of Bright Green. To become a friend of Bright Green, I need to know who you are. So you need to uh, send me things in the chat so that I can get to know you. Uh, you're a quieter bunch than usual today which is um, 
It's making me feel lonely. If you don't want me to feel lonely, you know what to do. Just let me know. How are you doing in the chat? Get me your questions. Tell me where you're coming in, when you're watching, dialing in, where you're watching from and um, yeah, keep the conversation going in there. I'd also love to know what your favourite of our interviews so far has been. So what's your favourite interview that we've put out on this episode of Bright Green Live, but also on all the other episodes if you've watched the previous ones too. We've, I think, by the end of today, we will have interviewed over 25 people on Bright Green Live, which is quite a lot. Uh, I would love to know who your favourite guests were, which you have learned from, and so on. Sorry, I just saw back the uh, my drink in, in the on the YouTube show, uh, which looks very odd. It's it's a smoothie. I uh, because I'm doing this live stream, I don't really have time to eat today, so I've made a very thick uh, blend of fruit in order to to stop myself from getting hungry. Uh, so that's why you have the slightly uh, gross looking glass. Uh, so apologies for that, but uh, that's the only way I can stay alive. So we're coming up to our next interview in around 10 or so minutes time. Uh, that interview is going to be with John Bosco and Wobo, who is from the anti privatization group. We own it. Uh, we're in it doing amazing work fighting for public ownership of public services and also uh, campaigning against privatization, sell offs of our services, things like the NHS, health, uh, social care, energy, water, public transport, and so on. We've had major victories over the years on a whole bunch of issues, uh, including most recently their victory uh, to keep Channel 4 in public hands. Today, with John Bosco, we're going to be talking about the NHS, the scale of privatisation in the health service and its impact. So there's recently been some research done that, that sh suggests that uh, outsourcing of NHS services has led to um, uh, a number of deaths in the NHS. And so we're going to be talking about the impact of outsourcing and crucially, how people campaign can campaign and fight to stop it, including we're in its recent campaign that was uh, that, that is, is focused around getting local bits of the NHS to uh, stop outsourcing locally uh, and how you can get involved in that. So uh, please do stay tuned in about uh, just shy of 10 minutes time. I think John Bosco will be joining us and we'll be kicking off with that. And then we have an amazing array of guests following that, including uh, the Wales Green Party's deputy leader, Chloe Naldrup from Just Stop Oil. And I'm really interested to know what our viewers think about Just Stop Oil, because I think within, I guess, the people who are involved and engaged in issues around climate, within sort of left politics, uh, Just Stop Oil and organisations, groups like Extinction Rebellion and Insulate Britain, they stimulate a lot of disagreement and discussion um, around their tactics, around their strategy, around their approach, around their efficacy. I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, Just Up Oil in advance of that interview and also during it, um, and also any of the questions that you have for Chloe Naldrit, who is joining us from, from that group. Uh, we then have Tom Brake, who it's a privilege to have. He's the uh, director of Unlock Democracy, the group that uh, the campaign group focused on democratic reform. Um, we're going to be discussing the proposals that came out of Gordon Brown's review into Labour Party policy on democracy. And we're going to be discussing those proposals. We're going to be looking at whether they're sufficient to uh, tackle the big issues in our democratic setup in the UK. And also, we'll obviously be talking about proportional representation and, and so on and so on. So Tom Brake will be on at four. Our penultimate guest will be Sonia Adasara, NHS doctor and campaigner, uh, talking about the state of the NHS. So it will link quite nicely with the conversation I'll be having with John Bosco. And finally, our last interview of the day will be with Phelan McCafferty, the Green Party leader of Brian Hove Council, uh, talking about the Greens' record in administration over the last 18 months in Brighton and Hove. So as always, get your questions lined up in the chat for all of our guests. And if you have enjoyed this show, if you enjoy Bright Green Live, if you enjoy what we do, we can only do it because of people like you. We don't have the support, the backing, the big coffers 
of billionaires and big business, which the rest of the media do. And that's why we are able to have this range of guests from the left, people who speak truth to power, who challenge authority, who campaign and advocate and organize and agitate for a better world. It's because we are independent. It's because our financial support comes from ordinary people rather than from uh, big business or billionaires. And so if you support what Bright Green does, if you like the videos we put out, if you enjoy our articles, if you think our coverage is good, if you think that the left needs its own media outlets, its own voices, a space where there can be debate and discussion, but crucially there can be amplification of trade unions, of social movements, of political parties on the left, then please, 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 if you are able to donate to Bright Green, we ask people to set up a regular donation because regular donations is what means it enables us to plan, it gives us the financial security into the future. Uh, You can do that on our website at bright-green.org forward slash donate. That link You don't have to remember it. It's in the description of this video. It's also in the chat. Please do, if you are able to set up a regular donation. I know that some of you watching will already be donors. Thank you so, so much to all of our donors. Uh, But also, if you haven't yet donated and you are able to, please do donate because it's what keeps Bright Green running. It's what enabled us to to run this show in the first place. And it will be what makes this show better in the future. Our long-term ambitions for this show, we're, you know, at the moment, this show is run solely by me. So I do all the bookings, I run all the tech, I do all this speaking. You have these very long bits in the middle between guests because we don't have B-roll to play, a whole bunch of stuff. This show could be massively improved if we had more funding, uh, if we were able to get tech support, if we were able to get a uh, producer, if we were able to get bookers, a whole bunch of stuff. The only way we're going to get there is if people like you support us. So if you are able to, as I say, Go to our donate page in the chat, in the description to the video, and please set up a regular donation because it makes a world of difference. And this show, I'm aware, is quite ropey. It's quite DIY. Let's professionalise it in the future, and we can do that with your help. So as I say, our next interview with John Bosco from We Own It will be kicking off about five minutes' time. Thanks so much for waiting. Thanks so much for sticking around. We still have an amazing lineup of guests, so please do stay around. I can see a flurry of people have just joined us very recently. If you're just joining us and you haven't already, hit subscribe, hit that like button. Uh, it means that you won't miss out on our future shows, and it means that other people will see this video in their feed as well, as well as making me happy. And we all know that you all want to make me happy. So for that interview coming up with John Bosco very, very shortly, get those questions lined up in the chat and uh, I'll put as many of them to him as possible. Also, any questions for me? Happy to answer any questions about Bright Green's plans, about how I'm doing generally, about my views, my favourite film, my favourite book, whatever it is you want to ask, and I will happily answer them. So I number four was definitely needed and I can feel the sweet taste of caffeine starting to career through my veins and hit my brain and I'm waking up a little bit which is good because I need to be ready and awake for the rest of the show uh if you aren't already looped in with bright green social media channels you can find us on all the big ones uh we're on twitter at bright grn we are on facebook at facebook.com forward slash bright grn we are on instagram at bright green online on mastodon at bright green on the UK server. Uh, I still don't know if that's enough information for you to find us on Mastodon. I don't really know how that platform works still, uh, but I'm sure someone can very helpfully tell me in the chat if that is not inform- enough information. Um, I don't really know, is Mastodon still a thing? Uh, it appears to have uh, uh, receded somewhat since its initial burst of energy following Mr. Musk's acquisition of Twitter. If you are just joining us, we're currently in the intermediate pe- intermediary period between two interviews. We will be starting the next one very, very soon. In the meantime, feel free to rewind the video and watch any of the previous interviews. Uh, at 10.15, which is about 15 minutes into the show, um, so if you scroll back in the video that far, you'll find our interview with Jen Bell and Niall Christie, the two co-conveners of the Scottish Green Party Trade Union Group. We uh, spent about half an hour discussing the current wave of industrial militancy 
uh, sweeping the country, the Scottish Greens' role in supporting trade unions in Scotland, and also the um, the record of the Scottish Greens in government uh, when it comes to workers' rights, when it comes to trade union issues. That part of the invest- interview in particular I found especially interesting um, because of the difference of opinions there are within the Scottish Greens as to the efficacy of the Greens in government and the extent to which they've been able to keep their radicalism and support workers' struggles. Uh, Following that, we interviewed Jo Bird, who is a Green Party councillor in the Wirral. Uh, She used to be a Labour Party councillor. We discussed her journey from Labour to the Greens, uh, the difference between that she experienced between being a Labour councillor and a Green Party councillor. Uh, she talked a lot about her experience of being a socialist in the Labour Party and being marginalised and uh, the hostile environment, as she described it, for socialists in the Labour Party. And we also talked about the impact that a swathe of uh, councillors defecting from Labour to the Greens has had uh, on the Green Party and will have on the future of the Green Party. You can find that interview uh, an hour into the show. Uh, she's a fascinating person. I always find my conversation with Joe really, really interesting. That one. Uh, is no exception. And then our third interview of the day was with Laura Webster, who is the new editor at The National, the only Scottish daily paper that supports independence. We discussed her plans for the future of the paper. We discussed um, her thoughts on the role of The National in the wider independence uh, movement. Um, And uh, we also discussed the the strength of support for Scottish independence in uh, Scotland. Uh, that interview was at 12 o'clock, so you can scroll back about two hours into the video to find that. Uh, I can see a comment from Steve C in the chat. Steve says that you can see behind me, I have the book Low Carbon Diet. Yes, that book is there behind me. You have Eagle Eyes. Um, And Steve says it would be good to hear from someone on the channel about how good effects, presumably that should say how food affects the climate movement, as well as being an ethical and political choice. That is a brilliant idea. If you have any suggestions for guests, I'll look into booking them for future episodes. Um, Thanks for that suggestion, Steve. And thanks for your eagle eyes on my bookshelf. I will happily uh, discuss any of the books on my shelves. If there's any books behind me that you want to discuss or have thoughts on, then let me know. And if there's any guests that it triggers, it's uh, just a guess that it triggers as well. Of course, I will be happy to discuss booking them as well. So thanks for that suggestion, Steve. I'll see uh, if I can find someone. And if you have any thoughts on who that could be, then please do let me know in the chat as well. Welcome those of you who are just joining us. We are just about to get started with our fourth interview of the day, which will be with John Bosco and Wobo from the anti privatization group. We own it. We're going to be discussing NHS privatization, its impacts, the scale of it, and how we resist it. If you have questions for John Bosco, please do get them in the chat now uh, so that I can line them up and get them ready to ask John Bosco throughout the show. Um, if people don't know we own it, I'll pop a link in the chat so you can find the website. They're an amazing organization. Uh, full full disclosure, I used to work for them, so I obviously would think that they're an amazing organization. Um, but uh, they campaign against privatization of public services and for democratic public ownership fit for the 21st century uh, to, to build an economy that is fit for the future. And John Bosco is their lead campaigner and focusing at the moment on campaigning around the NHS. They've also had a massive win recently to keep Channel 4 within uh, in public hands. And so if you have questions on that, we may delve into that as well. Um, but please do get your question for John Bosco on the NHS, on privatisation more broadly, and anything else you want answered. So John Bosco is going to be with us in about a minute's time. So please do stick around for that. Uh, hit the like button if you haven't already. Subscribe if you haven't already. And whilst you're waiting for John Bosco, why not share the stream on your social medias, preferably using the hashtag Bright Green Live. So I'm just going to check. John Bosco's not yet in the call. So I will have a little look on the hashtag, see what people are saying. And uh, I will check our subscriber count. Remember, we have that aim of getting to 475 within the end of the day. We're on 456 still. So still need 19 people to hit subscribe for us to reach our target. If you're one of the dozen people watching now, you can hit that subscribe button and you won't miss out on anything we're putting out in the future of course you can hit like we're aiming 50 likes by the end of the show we're on 20 we've got 30 to go we've got four and a half hours still to play with so plenty of time to hit that 50 
target. Of course, please do get your questions and comments lined up for John Bosco and I'll read out as many of them as I can and put as many of the questions to, to John Bosco as I am able to. If you haven't yet asked a question on any of these shows, you've been lurking in the background silently, now's the time to do so. All are welcome here on Bright Green Live. Please do get any of your questions in. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, there are, there, I mean, that's just not true, is it? That's a lie. That's a lie people say. There are stupid questions. Uh, don't ask them. Uh, or do, and I, and we may ask them anyway. Um, but uh, try and get your questions interesting, as interesting as you are. Um, so John Bosco should be joining us any minute now. I'm just going to check to make sure he has a message to say anything. Otherwise, um, I should say there's been a change to schedule. So if you saw the email, John Bosco was originally booked for two o'clock. We brought him forward so that we had a slightly smaller gap in the middle of the day. And I can see John Bosco has just joined the call. So whilst John Bosco connects to the call and connects to audio, I'm just going to give a brief introduction to him before we get going. Uh, so John Bosco is a lead campaigner at the public ownership campaign group, We Own It. Full disclosure, I used to work for We Own It, so there's a slight conflict of interest there, but I'm no longer on the payroll. Uh, so my uh, interviewing and interrogation will be independent and uncorrupt. Uh, but uh, we've got John Bosco on the show today to talk about NHS privatisation, uh, its impact, the scale of it and how we resist it. Uh, before we get into any of that, John Bosco, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? Um, thank you so much, Chris. Um, I hope you can hear me um, well enough. I am well, thank you very much. It's been a while I haven't spoken to you. So if anybody was worried about any conflict of interest, be rest assured that Chris and I have not had beer in a while. <laughs> I believe I still owe you a drink actually. So we'll have to make yeah, good on that correct. at some point. Uh, <laughs> you clearly have not forgotten and we can hear you loud and clear. So no problems on the audio. Um, so let's kick off. And I wondered if you could talk us through what's currently happening in the NHS. So in what ways is it being privatised and sort of what levels of services are currently contracted out and outsourced and have private elements in them? Um, yeah, thank you very much um, for having us, of course, and, and um, for the question. Um, I, sh I should start, I, I suppose one could start by giving a very broad picture. Um, last year, the BMA produced a report about the extent of privatization in the NHS. And for those, of, um, for those in the audience who, are not, um, who, are not, who don't know, the BMA is the British Medical Association. It's the, um, the trade union, essentially, of medical doctors. Um, and they produced a report that found that between 2012 and 2021, um, the amount of the NHS budget that is going to what they call non-NHS providers, that is um, private companies, charities, social enterprises, and, and so on and so forth, um, went from about 8% to 11%. That's kind of a clear indication, I think, of the direction of travel of um, privatization in the NHS. But if you wanted to see really where the bulk of privatization in the NHS is actually happening, right? Because the analysis that was produced by um, the BMA with respect to that specific statistic of what portion of NHS budget is going to non-NHS providers has to do with the amount of money that's been paid by what you might call NHS commissioners. And I'm going to talk a little bit about who those NHS commissioners are, right? There are some NHS commissioners at a, a national level, at NHS England level, but there are also NHS commissioner, uh, commissioners at sub-regional levels. Previously, we had this, this things called CCGs, clinical commissioning groups. Now we have integrated care systems, ICSs, and I'm going to touch a little bit about how those systems are aiding in the privatization of more and more of the NHS. And that statistic of eight versus 11% derives from how much of NHS money is being spent by these commissioners. Now, at a much deeper level, because that statistic takes it for granted that the money that goes from NHS commissioners 
to NHS trusts and foundation trusts, which are really the biggest um, iteration of the NHS across the country. There are trusts for acute care, there are trusts for um, mental health, there are trusts for pretty much every part of what the NHS does. They're the biggest, they're the, they're the NHS in effect. And what they found was that of the budget that went to the trusts, previously, before 2012, or in 2012, the amount of money that the trusts were spending in with ISPs, independent sector providers, was around 220 million pounds. This was in 2012. In 2021, that figure had gone up to 1.7 billion pounds. Right, so if you wanted to quantify that in percentage, it had this, the spending had gone up by more than 600%, right? So clearly that's where the NHS privatization is really happening. So if you wanted to look at it from that, from that point of view, that would be kind of a sample of the direction of travel and what's going wrong. We can also, of course, look at what's happening with GPs. GPs are essentially the doorway into the NHS. If, 80% of those who encounter the NHS first encounter the GP, right? And from the GPs, then you could get referrals to a whole lot of different services, including hospital care. Um, and GP surgeries have, over the last number of years, uh, one would argue since 2004 even, um, we've seen a move from the traditional model of GPs, which involved where GPs were, in effect, private business, small businesses, but they were, not, they were not treated as such. They're an individual doctor or a couple of doctors coming together who created a kind of what was called a GP partnership. And they run a business and their business was almost entirely a contract that they had with the NHS. What we are now seeing is the introduction of something called APMS contracts, Alternative Providers Medical Services Contracts which allows for um, people or companies um, that are not led by medical professionals to run NHS services, right? So that has seen a company like Centene, a multinational, multinational um, corporation, um, an American corporation running GP surgeries. Um, in 2021, you may remember, we ran a, a campaign targeting 37 GP surgeries in London that were taken over by um, Centene or their UK um, face operas. Um, and they also own um, GP surgeries in other parts of the country because they took over some GP partnerships as well. So we are seeing a move in that kind of direction with respect to um, um, primary care, that is GP surgeries. But we're also seeing that kind of move around um, 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 the traditional commissioning of care across the country. I didn't, I didn't just want to, uh, when I, pre I was preparing um, to do this, I wanted to make sure that I didn't give people the impression that all was lost. Um, the NHS is of course still significantly publicly run. Um, you may kind of take into account the fact that we just said that um, in 2012, 220 million pounds of the budget that went to trusts and foundation trusts were spent with private companies, and now it's 1.7 billion. But we have to keep in mind that that's in the context of the fact that the NHS budget is around 170 billion pounds a year, right? So um, there, it's not all lost. It's struggling. It's moving in the direction of privatization. That's why it's really important that we fight, right? But it's the NHS is still significantly publicly on the run. But secondly, we are also seeing, and lastly, I, I, I know my answer has been quite long. Um, we are seeing a move in the bureaucracy of the NHS to recognize that privatization is not the kind of savior that it was perceived to be. So recently, for example, we saw a U-turn where NHS England um, made the decision that NHS procurement, that is the framework for procuring services within the NHS that is currently outsourced or privatized. So it's private companies that currently purchase services for the NHS. That service was meant to be renewed um, with the private company that was running it. The NHS has made the decision to bring that service back in house from May this year, right? We've also seen recent reports that the NHS is exploring a state-owned company, so a publicly owned company 
being responsible for all of the NHS, or at the very least, a good amount of the NHS diagnostic services, right? So we are seeing moves within the NHS that recognize the core argument that we've been making, which is that NHS privatization is not what the NHS needs. We need a system that works for people and not profit. And privatization brings in the profit motives. And if you look at it purely out of that kind of pragmatic approach that, that some of these bureaucrats like to think of it, it, also, it does cost more to privatize. And not only in terms of money, if you may have seen the BMS president appearing in front of parliament last year where he was making the case that you might say to you might say that a, com a, a contract with a private company costs to provide one service costs say 10 million pounds and a contract with an NHS trust might cost 11 million pounds, for example. The difference between the two of them is that within the NHS trust, they have a responsibility through the performance of that contract to train staff. They have a responsibility to see through the life cycle of this person's condition, right? If you're doing hip replacement, for example, the private company's job is to perform the hip replacement and they're out of it. Whereas the trust ensures that not only is, the, is it successful over the mid to long term, if there are any complications, it is their job to see to it that that is dealt with, right? That is why it costs slightly more, but it saves money ultimately at the end of the day, right? So it's really important that it seems that NHS leaders are beginning to appear as though they understand that, but we are still a very long way away from where we want to be. So you talked there uh, a little bit about, I guess, the impact of privatization on health services at the end there and I guess one of the arguments that you often hear about privatization is that well it doesn't really matter if you've got private providers providing healthcare because um, at the end of the day you go to see your GP and whether it's a quote-unquote NHS doctor or a doctor that is employed by a company like Centene or whoever else it is, or when you go to get a hernia repair or whatever it is, the NHS logo is still on stuff. It doesn't matter that it's a private provision that's providing it because it's still free at the point of use. You don't have to pay for the health service. It's still got those universal principles. But one of the things that you, uh, we own it, have, 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 um, have, have, have said recently is that actually outsourcing and private privatization um, has been linked to uh, preventable deaths and has been putting lives at risk. So I wondered if you could explain a little bit uh, what, what's behind that claim and um, the suggestion that privatization outsourcing uh, is, I guess, da dangerous for patient safety. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So I, I want to answer that by kind of reference to three things. One of them is common sense, really. Um, if you have 10 pounds for, let's say you have 10 pounds for lunch. Let's, let's, let's have an analogy here. You give me 10 pounds for lunch, but, and, and I am, let's say I'm the NHS, right? You give me 10 pounds for lunch and I spend all 10 pounds having lunch. I'm going to be much fuller than if you gave 10 pounds to my landlord, for example, and you ask them to give me money for lunch right, they might decide to push their luck and see whether or not I'd be happy with five pounds so that they can keep five pounds, right? And if I were, if I ended up being happy with five pounds by some miracle, um, the, it would be a fact that if you gave me the money directly, I'd be much fuller after lunch than I would be if my landlord just gave me five pounds. That's kind of the common sense here. Private companies are making hundreds of millions of pounds in profits from the NHS, from a budget that we see is not even enough as it stands. We have waiting lists running into millions of people, yet private companies within the NHS are able, because it is their mission statement, it is their, their raison d'etre. If, if, if you don't make profit, you're not really a private company, right? And your shareholders have a responsibility to remove the, the CEO of that company because you're not making you're not making profits for their for their shares. Right. So in essence, you cannot expect an, a private company to provide the same quality of service as an NHS trust, an NHS trust that has as its sole 
interest providing for the healthcare of the local community. And I'm not saying that NHS trusts are perfect, but they are by far better in terms of where their interest lies, what their kind of general public service ethos forces them to do, as opposed to a private company that, does, that only notionally has a public service ethos. Its real ethos is making as much money for its shareholders, right? So that's the common sense narrative. But we actually have evidence that this plays out in reality. Right, so many people may have already seen the Panorama document uh, documentary that came out last year that that showed the effect of um, the process, the way that companies like Centene or Operas operate when they take over GP surgeries. They're cutting the number of GPs in these surgeries, increasing the number of physician assistants. Physician associates or assistants are not trained to do the job that GPs do, but within these GP surgeries. They have been made to do some of the, those work, th that work that GPs are supposed to do. And of course, we know that the consequences of that is that people they're gonna do the work at a much lower standard that GPs would do. But it saves money to hire physician associates as opposed to hiring GPs, right? Money trumps people's health in those conditions. We've seen situations where um, referrals are being done by these um, physician, physician associates, people, who may need to see a consultant at a hospital and not being referred to see a, doc, a consultant at a hospital because the physician associate does not really know exactly what, whether this is the right decision to make. And sometimes it appears that they are being incentivized not to refer people to the hospital. And sometimes because they have such low numbers of GPs actually working at these places, we saw that very, in my view, very striking image of a GP's office at a GP surgery, an actual GP had in front of their door piles and piles of referrals um, of um, kind of documents that they were supposed to inspect and see whether or not they needed to refer these people to consultants at hospitals. And these were piling up in front of the office for weeks and weeks and weeks. And these are people that may have urgently needed to see a doctor, right? And of course, it's not the GP's fault. They have so much doing. There are so many, there's so fewer of them left, right? That they cannot, they can literally, literally cannot split themselves into two to do the job of two people. So that's, those are the effects that this is having on actual people. We've seen a surgery that when it was run by a GP partnership was rated as good in Neurom, for example, Carpenter's surgery. It was three surgeries, kind of three sites for one surgery. It was rated as good. When it was taken over by Centene, after a few months, the CQC, the Care Quality Commission, looked at it and rated it as needing improvement. You can already see the impact of the privatized model on this surgery as soon as it was taken over by um, Opera's Health, the, private, the, the American private, private company. So that's one iteration of the effects of this um, with respect to GP surgeries. Now, you mentioned. Um, the statistic that we've been talking about um, over the last number of months. Um, an Oxford University study um, by two Oxford academics was published in The Lancet, the most prestigious public health journal in Britain, has found that um, 557 preventable deaths, curable deaths or deaths from curable conditions were linked directly to NHS privatization. So in essence, they looked at all of the other explanations that could have been responsible for excess deaths in all of these areas across England. And they excluded the possibility of all of those conditions. And NHS privatization was the only viable explanation for the deaths of 557 people. Obviously, our instincts will suggest that there are much, many, much more of those. We saw, for example, during the pandemic, and their research did not think about, did not include the period of the pandemic. If it did, I imagine the number would be much um, larger than that. But we saw during the pandemic um, where um, test and trace was run by Sodexo and, um, and, um, and Serco. And we saw the parliament declare that that track and trace system was utterly useless. We needed a track and trace, for a track and trace system to work, it needed to reach 70% or more of close contacts. This one was reaching 55% of close contacts. It did nothing to help prevent the pandemic, to the spread of the pandemic. And in effect, the 
the consequence of this was that a lot of people would have died because we had a privatized trace and, um, a track and trace system that did not work, right? Whereas we had a public, um, a publicly run um, system that was run by uh, um, public um, local authorities that was clearly doing a much better job of that. So, but for the Oxford researchers, what they, what they essentially did was they sent out freedom of information requests to 170, I believe it was, um, CCGs at the time, clinical commissioning groups. They started the research when um, there were still CCGs. And these CCGs that were geographically well representative, very uh, representative, sent back their numbers of where they're spending their money. And what these researchers were able to plot was that in any CCG where there was higher privatization, there were higher debts. And where there was lower privatization, there were lower excess debts that were linked to privatization. And in terms of the cost of this, according to the researchers, of course, they are, they are researchers and they're, they're going to be really conservative in what they say about what's responsible for this. So they considered a bunch of options, right? They said, for example, that it's possible that um, private companies provide worse services than um, the publicly owned and run NHS trusts. That's one possibility. The other possibility is one that we very seldom think about in general. The fact that in areas where there is a lot of privatization, it leaves a lot less money in the public sector to take care of the most complicated cases, right? Because in order to privatize a service, you need to simplify it, right? You, you privatize things like hip replacements that just involves pr providing a hip replacement to a patient and that's it beginning end, that's the contract that you have. Whereas in the public sector, there is, you have to take care of the complications. You have to essentially, you have a responsibility to provide healthcare to this person from cradle to grave. And private companies don't have that. Their job is to provide services that they are contracted to provide, right? So in effect, they leave the public sector with much less money, meaning that people end up within the public system falling through the cracks and dying. And part of the reason for that is that much less money is left in the public system because of the consequences of privatizing services to the private sector, right? So those were some of the conditions that they said were responsible for the effects of privatization. And to my mind, I think it is common sense. We need to move away from this, this system. It's just not working. It's costing life. It's costing much more money than we as people think it costs. And it's not working. Our NHS should work for people um, and not profit. So we're going to move on now to talk about, um, I guess, uh, how we resist this privatisation model uh, that we've been discussing. But before we do that, I just wanted to say to our viewers, um, now is your chance to ask any questions for John Bosco that you want me to put to him. Uh, so please do get questions in the chat and I'll try and take as many of them as I can. Uh, there are no questions in the chat at the moment. So if you put one in now, there's a good chance you'll get it asked. Um, so what I wanted to ask you, John Bosco, is you, uh, we own it, I've been recently organising people to uh, campaign to get their local NHS to, um, to commit to end privatisation. Uh, locally. Um, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit, bit, bit how the campaign is going and whether any um, local NHS, local branches of the NHS have made that commitment yet. No, um, thank you very much for that question. So um, we started a campaign in April last year um, that was geared and it was, it was kind of aligned intentionally with the changes that the NHS was undergoing at the time. Um, just to kind of give a bit of background to that, um, before the 1st of July last year, the NHS was divided up into around 400 or so what was called clinic clinical commissioning groups. Essentially, the bodies responsible for commissioning services in any given area. In your town, for example, for the viewers, when you go to the hospital, the hospital that you go to is run by what is called an NHS trust or foundation trust. Those hospitals don't simply provide services to you. Um, out of the goodness of their hearts, or um, they don't get the money directly from the government. They are commissioned, they are running on a contract given to them by the clinical commissioning group to deliver a particular number of services to people, right? So 
obviously they're not going to commission an NHS trust that is specialized in acute care to provide mental health, right? So they commission trusts to provide the services that they're specialized in. The same with GP surgeries and so on and so forth. In, in July of last year, well, beginning the year before actually, the Health and Care Act began to make its way through Parliament. And a lot of us in the NHS campaigning world were having discussions about how we should think about and approach that bill. A lot of campaigners decided we should not legitimize it at all by aiming to get parts of it amended. We should campaign against it wholesale um, and hope to defeat it. We at We On It calculated that it was virtually impossible that we would get it defeated. The government have an 80 plus seat majority in parliament. Um, and there wasn't the kind of opposition that there was to this bill that we saw during the 2012 Health and Social Care Act um, passage through parliament. So it was virtually impossible and we were proven right. It did not, nobody could stop the bill because that opposition did not exist and the government had a really strong majority. Um, but what we then decided to do because we recognized this fact was while we consistently said this bill was not what the NHS needed and the Labour Party said the same and pretty much all of the forces that you might say are theoretically on the side of the NHS said the same. Um, we also campaigned for amendments to the bill, right? So we campaigned, for example, that because the Health and Care Act, the, the 2021 Health and Care Act um, scrapped section 75 of the Health and Social Care Act, which essentially made it mandatory to put out services to tender within the NHS, right? Which has been responsible for the explosion of privatization within the NHS. Um, so the, this, this NHS bill aimed to scrap that section. What we argued was that, well, if you're going to scrap that section, which is a really good thing, we've been opposed to it for a long time, what you must then do is replace it with what we called the NHS as a default provider amendment, right? So in essence, wherever there is a service to provide, it is assumed as a default that the NHS will provide that service. And only when the NHS cannot provide that service does um, a private can a private company be engaged theoretically to provide that service. Um, we failed to get that amendment passed, but we managed to get an amendment passed that made it slightly more difficult for private companies to sit on the new boards that will oversee the new systems. The new systems were now called integrated care systems. They were overseen by a board that was called that is called the integrated care boards, ICBs. And on each of these boards, it was possible, it is possible for the chair of the board to allow people who work for private companies to sit on these boards. We were first alerted to this situation when um, it was pointed out to us that Virgin Care was sitting on what they call the shadow board. So essentially these boards were already set up before the bill passed, right? So they were shadow until the bill passed and made them legal so they could essentially become the official boards. And Virgin Care was already sitting on the shadow board for the system in um, Northeast um, Somerset. So we campaigned there and forced the chair of the board, Samantha L. Ellis, um, to take the pledge that, private, that Virgin Care would be removed from their board and that nobody who works for private companies would be able to sit on their boards. So um, between April and around August, we were able to get more than 20,000 people to email the chair of their ICS boards, their 42 ICS boards, um, to email the chairs of the ICS boards and demand that private companies not be allowed to sit on their boards. We were able to get 11 of those ICS chairs, ICS board chairs, to pledge that private companies will not sit on their boards. And beyond that, we were able to get 12 more of those, of, of the chairs of these boards, beyond the 11, to say, we agree with your demand, we're going to ensure that private companies don't sit on, your, on our boards as much as possible. But what we are going to do, we are not going to take the pledge because we think it might have unintended consequences. And one of the unintended consequences that they highlighted, for example, was the possibility of GP surgeries because they are viewed as private small businesses preventing GPs who run GP surgeries from sitting on the board, which 
I think it's fair enough, right? If they agree to the spirit of the pledge, which as we all understand is for-profit companies being prevented from sitting on these boards, then fair enough. And we're keeping an eye on it. So in essence, we achieved um, around um, a 50% win, a 51% win um, for that first stage of the campaign. Now we have moved to a second phase of the campaign. In effect, we are demanding that NHS as a default provider of NHS, um, the NHS as a default provider of NHS services that we failed to get in Parliament. So we are putting forward a couple of pledges to NHS leaders and demanding that they pledge that they will end the NHS privatization in the long term and in the short term that they will do whatever they can to reduce the amount of privatization in the NHS. So in essence, when a contract is ending, that's run by a private company, that they must do everything they can to bring that contract back in-house, right? So, so far we have almost 20,000 people who have emailed, who have signed the local petition. So what, what we have done is we've created 42 different local petitions and we've had people in every area signing the petition for their area. We are still pushing that heavily at the moment. And our goal is over the next number of months to do kind of a coordinated petition hand-in um, set, um, set up and then do another email to um, the leaders of these boards again. Hopefully we're going to get even more wins in those areas. We haven't pushed very hard in that, on that front, hence we don't have very much to report. But something that we're working toward that I am really excited for is what we are doing on the 25th of February um, this year. So we are organizing an action on Parliament Square from 2 to 4 p.m. on the 25th, on Saturday, the 25th of February. And I'm inviting everybody who is watching this to go to weonit.org or, well, you can email info at weonit.org.uk and ask to be signed up to attend that event. We need 557 people showing up to Parliament Square, each of them representing 557 people who have been the victims of NHS privatization, according to this Oxford research. We want to kind of put up a really powerful show, public show for the photographers and for the press that we hope gets as much coverage as possible that then puts pressure on the government and puts pressure on um, West Streeting, the leader, the, the, the health, the shadow health secretary. Um, our hope is that this begins to place privatization again, firmly on the agenda. We have seen the Labour Party over the last number of months talking about how private companies can help deal with the waiting lists. I think that's a fool's errand because private companies, the private um, hospitals don't have their own staff. Their staff is mainly NHS staff. Why don't we pay the NHS staff properly so that they don't have to work in private companies? Um, to kind of make up for their wages. Let's pay them properly to work in the NHS and we support our nurses and our ambulance workers as they go on strike. But yes, let's invest in our NHS. Let's not give money to private companies to in increase their own capacity. They currently don't have that excess spare capacity that it that is being implied when we talk about them helping the and the NHS deal with waiting lists. They don't have it. If you give them money, they will create that capacity. In essence, we would be subsidizing building the private healthcare sector in, the, in, in England. Let's invest in the NHS, build up its capacity and begin to move away from privatization. We've seen the case of Baroness Mon recently, and we saw a lot of those cases coming out of the VIP lane during the COVID pandemic. Privatization breeds corruption. And we absolutely need to begin to place that issue firmly on the agenda because it's costing life it's costing us money and it makes no sense. So we've been talking for over half an hour and I've got one final question from me. But before we do that, I just want to go to a quick question from the chat because I think it's a really interesting one. So Steve C has asked, are there any exemplars of public health care around the world we can use as a model of better directly run services and keeping private companies out of the healthcare system? I think that the best one that you could really look at is the NHS pre-2010. Right. In 2010, the NHS was the best healthcare system in the world, bar none. It was the most accessible. And interestingly enough, it was also the cheapest per head. Right. So the NHS already used to do this work properly. We, you, you, you might remember um, the um, Noam Chomsky quote that the best way to privatize, to privatize the service is, in essence, to defund it, make sure it doesn't work very well. 
and then you could bring in the private companies to become the saviors for that service. And that's what we have seen happening with the NHS. It started with defunding of the NHS since the financial crisis. You use the financial crisis as an excuse to defund the whole bunch of public services, including the NHS. And that agenda has continued since then. Um, so I, I don't think that we need to look elsewhere in the world in order to see what works. The NHS has worked in the past and it's been purposefully undermined, hence it's where it is right now. But if you want to look elsewhere in the world, I would look at the US, which is a weird answer to give because the US is kind of the, what's the word I'm looking for? It's the epitome of privatized healthcare. But if you, there are portions of the US healthcare system that are not privatized. Social security, um, uh, not social security, um, what's it called? What's the Medicare, the, the healthcare system for older people in the US. It is the most popular healthcare system. In many ways, it's the most popular healthcare system in the world yeah. um, because it's free. Um, obviously, they they operate very differently from us in the sense that the hospitals are owned by private companies, but the government pays um, to use the system. Um, but people who use it see it as a totally publicly owned and publicly operated system, and they love it for that. Another example would be the VA system in the, in the US, the Veterans Administration um, System, the healthcare system for soldiers and veterans of the US military. Um, it works well, they love it. Of course, they also defund it, like our government is defunding the NHS, but the soldiers have only good things to say about it, right? It works really well for them. Public healthcare, that puts people before profit works. Don't let anybody tell you it doesn't work. All of those people that you hear on TV and radio and in the newspapers talking about, um, we need to bring in health insurance because that's the only way to save the NHS. All of those people can pay for health insurance. You and I may not be able to pay for it. And they're very happy to pay for it because it's going to be a fraction of their income. If I had to pay, I mean, there are some studies that found, and this is in the US, but I imagine it's not so different in the UK. They found that the vast majority of people in the US cannot deal with a $600 emergency, right? We see over half a million families every single year in the US go into bankruptcy from medical debt. We see over 40,000 people every year in the US die from lack of access to basic healthcare. That is what these people that are talking about it on TV and radio and in the newspapers want us to go to. That is not what we want. We have never seen in this country since the foundation of the NHS, people going bankrupt from medical bills. That is because the NHS exists for all of us. We must fund it, we must own it, we must fight for it, but we must never ever allow us ourselves to be convinced that privatize, privatization is a solution to what we have now. It is not. So on that last point, you talked about fighting for the NHS. And my last question for you is, uh, how can our viewers join the fight and the campaign to save the NHS from privatization? Well, obviously, um, there are a bunch of uh, NHS campaigning organizations um, who are doing brilliant work. We have Keep Our NHS Public. We have Every Doctor. Every Doctor today, I believe, have a huge story in the mirror, which um, I, I thought was really good. Um, um, but obviously, as a We On It um, lead campaigner, I would definitely ask that you get involved in the work that we do. Um, we're organizing toward the 25th of February. We need everybody we can get to get involved with that. It's the biggest action that we have tried to organize. Um, um, since we've existed for the last 10 years. Um, and yeah, we, we think that if it's a success, it's going to put the NHS, uh, NHS privatization, the issue, of, the issue of NHS privatization firmly on the media agenda. And that's really important because right now, nobody's talking about it. Everybody's talking about the waiting lists, which is really important. But we're not talking about the fact that a lot of the NHS budget that should be going to helping people is going into the pockets of private individuals. So it's really important that we put that issue firmly on the agenda. 
So if you're able to, please email info at weonit.org.uk and ask to be signed up to get involved in that action. Um, if you cannot get involved in the action in London on the 25th of February, which I really hope you can, but if you cannot, then go to our website and sign up to join our email list to keep in touch with all of the work that we do. We recently, just to get um, veer off the NHS a tiny bit, we've campaigned, and I don't, I don't know if Chris was still at We On It when we started our Channel 4 campaign. Oh, okay, no. But um, we started our Channel 4 campaign last year and um, I'm very happy to report that because of the incredible work of the people on our email list of our supporters and our campaigners, we were able to prevent the government, Boris Johnson and Nadine Doris's plan to privatize and sell off Channel 4 to their mates um, in, the, in the huge American um, TV companies. We managed to stop it. The government has now come out and said that they are not privatizing Channel 4. That was a big win. And that's because of people like you. And the wins that we've gotten on the NHS, that we've gotten NHS leaders to pledge to ban private companies from their boards, that's because of the incredible work that people like you who are on our email list are doing. That's the kind of impact that you can be having today if you join our email list and become a We On It supporter. Yeah, I think that's really what people can do. And obviously, outside of We On It, there are other organizations that you can support as well that do incredible work. So I popped the link to We Own It's website in the chat, as well as that email address that John Bosco mentioned, so that you can get involved with all of We Own It's campaigns, especially those to save the NHS. So it's been an absolute pleasure, as always, John Bosco. Thank you so much for joining me today. Not a problem. Thank you so much, Chris. So that was John Bosco from the anti privatization group We Own It, uh, our fourth guest on the show today. I would love to hear your thoughts on that conversation and interview. Please do let me know in the chat what you thought about it, uh, particularly uh, the kind of uh, detail of the scale of NHS privatisation, the way that we can find back. Let me know all your thoughts in the chat uh, or on Twitter on the hashtag Bright Green Live. So thank you so much to everyone for joining us throughout the show so far and for everyone who watched that interview. If you enjoyed that interview, hit that like button on the video. It means that this video will appear in more people's feeds. So if you've enjoyed this in these interviews, including that one with John Bosco, other people will too. A good way to make sure that they see the video and the interviews is to hit that like button it means that the video will appear in more people's feeds and of course you can share the stream on your social media preferably with the hand hashtag bright green live as well to get more people watching it too and to make sure that you don't miss out on any of the interviews um, and the videos that we put out are bright green hit that subscribe button and you won't miss out on anything we have a target to hit 475 subscribers by the end of the day by the time we stop streaming at 6 p.m and also to hit 50 likes on the stream as well by then too um we're currently on 20 likes and 456 subscribers so we have 19 subscribers and 30 likes to go i believe in all of you if you hit those buttons right now then you can uh, make sure that those things happen now uh, if anyone who's just joining us recently who was expecting the interview with john bosco to kick off at two o'clock we brought that interview forward a little bit to 1:30, um in order to make the show flow a little bit better so you can rewind through the show and the stream to catch the start of that interview with john bosco it was about 40 minutes ago that we started so you can catch it all there by rewinding we have still got five amazing guests to come in the second half of the show the first of which is Amikar Daliwal who is uh, one of the deputy leaders of the Wales Green Party and we will be discussing the impact that councillors in Wales, Green Party councillors have had in Wales since their election in May 2022. That's going to be kicking off in about 15 minutes time. And then after that, we have a series of other guests, including a guest from Just Stop Oil, Tom Brake from Undock Democracy. We have Sonia Adasara, the NHS doctor and activist, who will be picking up a lot of the conversations we've just had with John Bosco and looking at them from a slightly different angle. And then we'll finish off the day with Phelan McCafferty, the Green Party leader of Brighton Hove City Council. Um, I'm going to take a quick break. Uh, so I'll be back in just a few minutes time. I would love to see your comments and questions and thoughts in the chat whilst I'm gone so that I can pick them up, read them out and continue the discussion. So I'll be back in five minutes time. I'll see you very, very soon.
Welcome back. We are returning for the second half of today's show, episode three of Bright Green Live. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, there's 11 people watching. Uh, if you haven't already, hit that like button, hit subscribe, share the stream on your social medias, everything else, and make sure that more people see this video. I'm just going to rattle through some of the comments that have come in from the chat uh, since I have been gone. So Steve C says, it's interesting to see pre-2010 NHS viewed as an exemplar. Um, Steve was very disappointed about Labour's support for privatisation and fears that it will get even worse if they win the next general election. Uh, I think that fear is probably quite well founded, given the comments that West Streeting has consistently made about the role of uh, the private sector within the NHS. Um, a far cry from the kind of uh, system, the, the approach that we need, which we're going to be talking about a little bit more with Sonia Adasara later in the show. Uh, Steve has also suggested some organisations to have on the show at a, a future point to talk about uh, food and climate change, which I will look into. Thank you so much for the suggestion, Steve. Uh, Meg S. Foster has uh, said, uh, has asked, is there a way to get involved to support remotely with the campaign at the end of the month? I'm assuming that's about the NHS campaign that we were just talking about with John Bosco. Um, the best way to find out all the ways to get involved is to sign up to We Own It's mailing list. You can do that at weownit.org.uk and there's a link in the chat to um to to what to the website so that you can find um the mailing list and how to sign up there. Um very, very shortly we're going to be having our next guest joining us, which is Amma, Ami Cardalwell. And she'll be joining us um in about five minutes' time to talk about the uh Wales Green Party. Uh, Ami is the deputy leader of the Welsh Green Party. We're going to be discussing the impact that the um, new councillors in Wales for the Green Party have had since their election in May. We're also going to be talking about the future prospects of the Wales Green Party and some other stuff too. Following Ami, we will have four other guests. So the second half of the show really is packed. We have Chloe Naldrick from Just Stop Oil, Tom Brake from Unlock Democracy, Sonia Adasara, who is an NHS doctor and a campaigner. And we have Phelan McCafferty, who is the leader of Brighton Hove City Council, the Green Party leader of Brighton Hove City Council, the only leader of a council in the country who is a uh, Green Party leader who is in sole administration in their council uh, so that's all still to come um, as always i want to put your questions to our guests so please do pop them in the chat the earlier i get the questions in the earlier the easier it is for me to put them to our guests so please 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 do get them in the chat as early and as soon as possible and i'll get as many of them put to our guests as i can we've had some great questions so far um, please do keep them coming and uh, hopefully our guests will get to answer them. Um, if you haven't already uh, followed us on all the social media channels, you can follow Bright Green on Twitter at BrightGRN, on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash BrightGRN, on Instagram at Bright Green Online, and on Mastodon at Bright Green on the UK server. And before we get going with our next interview, the last thing that I have to say is just that Bright Green does not have the backing of billionaires or big business. We rely solely on the kind and generous donations and support of people just like you. The only reason we're able to run Bright Green Live, the only reason we're able to publish all the articles that we publish, to put out all the other videos we put out, is because of donations of ordinary people supporting Bright Green, supporting independent media, supporting media that platforms voices from the left of politics, that platforms trade unionists, social movements, and so much more on the left. So please, 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 if you are able to, head to our donate page, which is bright-green.org forward slash donate. You can find uh, the link to it in the chat, as well as on the description of this video. We ask people to set up a regular donation because that's what gives us financial security, enables us to plan for the future, enables us to ensure that we are uh, able to continue putting out more and more content just like this and all the other things that Bright Green does. So if you are able to, please do head to that donate page right now. Just going to have a little sip to uh, get my voice back before we get going with the rest of the show. <laughs> and apologies for those of you who are there at the beginning, you know that I'm feeling a little under the weather. I've been sneezing and coughing all day. So any coughs and sneezes I'll try and do whilst off mic, uh, but from time to time, one might slip through and I apologize in advance for that and for the one that just occurred. 
uh, as well as putting comments in the chat, as well as sharing the show stream on your socials, you can tweet along on the hashtag Bright Green Live. Get your questions, comments, feedback, thoughts, all of the rest of it on there as well. And I'll try and pick up as many of them as possible. So I can see that Amy has joined the call. So I'm going to let Amy in now. I'm going to get started a little bit early, which hopefully means we can chat for a little bit longer. So while I wait for Amy to connect to the call, I will just give them a brief intro. Uh, so Amy is one of the two deputy leaders of the Wales Green Party. Uh, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Great. I think that's gone now. So Amy is one of the two deputy leaders of the Wales Green Party. And we're going to be talking over the next uh, 15, 20 minutes or so about the electoral success of the Greens uh, in Wales. Uh, particularly, we're going to be looking at the impact that the Wales Green Party's newly elected councillors elected in May last year have had uh, since their election. Uh, before we dive into any of that, um, just wanted to uh, say hello and say, Amit, how are you doing? I think so you're still on mute there and I can't see your video. Uh, oh, you're entering the waiting room again. Let's try. <laughs> Let's try that. Apologies, viewers, for the tech issues. I'm hoping that now. Brilliant. We have you. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? No worries. Yeah, good. Brilliant. Well, thank, thank you for joining us. Uh, and we can hear you and see you loud and clear. So that's brilliant. Um, so. In the last local elections in May 2022, the Wales Green Party won seven seats, which is the uh, by far the best set of results the Green Party has ever had. And there are now seven Green councillors working uh, across Wales. What impact have those councillors had since their election? I think straight away, the biggest impact that I want to bring up is we had um, a first non-binary, first pers person of colour, um in so <clears throat> we had ian in monmouthshire and we have um lauren in newport so that's great young person nathan um what the councillors have actually been doing so in newport um lauren's been fighting for better bus services in nathan in neathan port talbot he got the council to declare a climate emergency and he's you know very proactive in what he's doing i went to go see him uh, and see the group uh, down in neath uh, for christmas and it was lovely to to see the kind of motivation he's got going on down there as well um ian in monmouthshire is uh, divest um he, what he wants to do is to divest the council uh, from fossil fuels and uh, John and Martin uh, up north are encouraging um, the council to end single-use plastics. Now um, what we do is, uh, well personally what I do is you know look at the council websites you know we've got videos um, on there and so anybody who's interested in looking at you know real council business uh, can be a bit dry, but this is this is how we find out what's going on basically as well, you know. Um, and it's it's great, you know. It, it, getting elected is a massive is a massive thing, but then doing the work and staying elected and that you know that's where that's that's the lion's share of the business. And as uh, both myself um, with Helen and also with Anthony and with others in Wales Green Party Council, we want to support our councillors um, all the way, you know, and, and the Green Party of England Wales needs to support Wales uh, councillors all the way. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's it, in Wales in particular, it's, it is a topic that we are, um, thinking about at the moment in that how do we organize it so we can push forward for a senate seat so that should i leave you open that's a kind of doorway to your next question i suppose 
I will move on to that in a second, but I can see Anthony Slaughter is coming on the YouTube chat to make a correction, uh, oh. which is I said there were seven green councillors, but Anthony says there were eight. So I apologise uh, for the misinformation. And he's also pointed out that, of course, that uh, two councillors were elected in Cardiff on a joint green plied common ground ticket. So uh, thanks, as always, for your uh, comments, Anthony, and thank you for watching the show. Um, so... As I said, the 2022 elections were the most successful elections in the world's Green Party's history. Um, those numbers that I've just read out. Uh, previously, you know, in the last set of local elections, the Greens only got one seat and the, year be the time before that, they got no seats. So it's it's really a historic moment last May was for the Greens. Do you think this has cemented the Welsh Greens as a, as a key player in Welsh politics? Yeah, I mean, well, if you look at the people who were voted in, you can see exactly why they were voted in. You know, their their strength of character, their determination, their loyalty to, to the people that they're serving. And, uh, yeah, you know, that, that so the, these guys um, have put their all into it, you know, and so, you know, we need to support them. We need to make sure that they're good. Um, when we got the last Wales, it was in Brecon and Radnorshire where where I am. Um, the who we had voted in there was Emily Powers County Council, and and we saw there where there were issues, you know, because being a Green Party voice can be a lonely job. However, we, um, you know, climate change was something that some people were still denying five years ago. <laughs> And I think we've come on leaps and bounds since then. And I think what we needed was like sectors such as the finance sector to actually start taking this sort of thing quite seriously. Um, I mean, Al Gore's um, uh, kind of, uh, what was it? His uh, PowerPoint presentation came out two decades ago, you know, and had people been listening then, it would have been a lot better, but, you know, um, it is what it is. Um, so yeah for sure for sure and the reason the reason why it's cementing is because uh, there is an attitude change in the people there's a generational change um and and of obviously the the determination and the the spirit of of the councillors and the, the people more in, who, who are involved um with the green party here in wales so I've got a couple of other questions for you, but before I come to them, I just wanted to say to our viewers, please do get any questions that you want to see asked in the chat and I'll do my best to come to them. Uh, before I come to the chat, uh, my next question for you is um, looking forwards rather than backwards. So we had that breakthrough for the Welsh Greens in 2022. I wanted to ask you what you think the next breakthrough for the for the for the Wales Green Party will be. Will it be a first Senate seat? Will it be Greens entering administration in councils? What do you see as the next major step for the Welsh Green Party? All of the above. Um, and at the AGM, I've made this particular um, um, paid particular attention to the fact that we need somebody in the Senate, and it got so close last time. It really did, and. We need we need somebody in the Senate seat. And at this point, what I want to do is flag up um, the fact that as deputy uh, spokesperson, um, along with Helen and with Anthony, we don't get paid. So we need those people who are being paid with whales in their title to step up as well, because we can't do everything alone. We're volunteers. And so if we, you know, we, we have the passion, we have the determination, but at the same time, we can't put in the time that we would love to be able to do. It's just impossible because we need to work. So what I suggest to the leadership is if you've got, um, you know, deputy leader of Wales and Green, um, Wales in England, or England and Wales, that needs to be that well you could you know what I'm going to say right so you've got England and Wales but we're not feeling it in Wales um and um I don't think Anthony will mind me saying this and I think it needs to be said is that although the members had voted in 
for Anthony to be paid a wage that was turned down recently. So that has been a real kicker for us because, you know, Anthony's amazing what he does, you know, what he, what, then he goes out there and he does, and he's such, such a patient person. Um, and then to have that not kind of appreciated um, and there might be, you know, there's lots of reasons why and some wherefores and excuses, or whatever it is, you know, I don't know the details, but what I will say is this, if we want a Senate seat, which is what we will do, which is what we want, we need people to be paid or, and, or we need the leadership to turn up at our meetings, the, the Green Party Council meetings, they need to be there, they need to be taking an active role in our council meetings, because it's in the title. Either get rid of that title, or um, step up. So before I, before I come to another question for you, I think, uh, and I may be wrong on this, but my understanding is that the Wales Green Party, Wales Green Party leader remuneration um wasn't turned down but deferred and i just wanted to 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 clarify that not to take anything away from what you said um and the agreement that you have but i think just in terms of technical terminology i think just to be clear on that now the other question i wanted to put to you is you talked about the need for the uh, leadership of the green party of England and wales to step up in their support for the wales greens and you talked about them you know attending wales green party council and other things what kind of practical steps would you like to see from the green party's leadership to support the election and campaigning efforts of, of the wales green party the wales green party leadership or leadership or wales in england or england and wales the, sorry yeah the green party of england and wales leadership to support the wales green party in a way that you've described well, like you said, like we said, it starts with attending meetings. It starts with being here. It starts with um, action planning. It starts with um, putting as much energy that is being put into England into Wales. It's as simple as that. Fantastic. Now, I've got a question that's come in from the chat from Paul Beswick. And um, Paul asks, uh, so here in Cardiff, so presumably Paul is in Cardiff, the Greens and Plaid Cymru are negotiating um, about campaigning as a single party, not only for the council seats, which happened in May, but also for Senate seats. Is there enough common ground, and they put that in inverted commas, uh, as you see it, with Plaid and the Greens in order to make that happen? Now, this is something that Anthony would be better. Um, um, he's got more knowledge about this. And um, I know it's, it's a contentious issue in some respects. We, uh, as far as I'm aware, up in Brecon and Radnorshire and with the Wales Green Party, we are, um, look, we're going to talk to Plaid, see, you know, where there is um, kind of common ground, you know, but I don't think it's something that we should really shy away from um, talking to other political parties. It doesn't make sense not to talk to other political parties. You know, um, climate change, everyone says it's not a political issue. It's not a political issue. It's a life issue. And the fact that the Green Party are a political party, yeah, but they are, are essentially our agenda goes across the board. You know, it's about, essentially it's life-saving if, you, if you're looking at it um, with eyes wide open. And to get involved in the in the the kind of murky politics and what should we do this should we do that? Frankly, we don't have the time to play politics. It's just not there, you know. And there's times where I think when I, when I hear that when I hear the um, debate about implied and greens and should we be working together? Not we're working together. Whatever. I think it's like navel gazing. Um, but if you want to get into the nitty gritty of uh, what's happening and if you want a, uh, you know, a more experienced voice on it, uh, Anthony would be the person to speak to on that. So for viewers who are interested in that, uh, I spoke to Anthony on the first episode of Bright Green Live and you can go back and watch that video on our YouTube channel. Um, but for now, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. So.
That was Amikar Daliwal, the Deputy Leader of Wales Green Party. And that was a really interesting conversation, I think, about the Welsh Greens, their election success, the future of the Wales Green Party, and much, much more. Um, I'd love to know what you think about, thought about that interview um, and the conversation we've just had. And to apologise again for getting the number of councillors that the Welsh Greens won in the 2022 local elections wrong. And thank you to Anthony Slaughter, the Wales Green Party's leader, for correcting me on that in the chat as he very much should. Um, Anthony, a friend of Bright Green and a friend of Bright Green Live, um, as I said, a guest on our first ever episode, um, but uh, right to correct me on that inaccuracy. So we uh, still have four guests who will be joining us throughout the rest of the show. If you're just joining us now, thank you so much. You're watching episode three of Bright Green Live. You can um, uh, let us know what you thought about the interview so far in the chat. If you haven't watched any of them and you're just joining us, you can rewind as much as you like and watch the previous interviews as well. Um, we've had half a dozen so far in the show. Uh, kicking off at 10.15 and running all the way through the stream so you can scroll back through and watch any of them at your leisure. We kick things off at 10.15 with Niall Christie and Jen Bell, the co-conveners of the Scottish Green Party Trade Union Group, uh, talking about the relationship between the Scottish Greens, trade unions and much, much more. That was about 50 minutes into the show, so you can watch that. We then spoke to Joe Bird, who is a Green Party councillor in the Wirral. Uh, we discussed why she joined the Green Party. She was previously a Labour councillor, now in the Greens. And we discussed uh, the difference in her experience of being in Labour and then the Greens. We then spoke to Laura Webster, who is the new editor of the National Newspaper. That's the newspaper in Scotland, the only daily newspaper in Scotland that supports Scottish independence. That interview was at 12 p.m., so about two hours into the stream, you can find that interview. We then spoke to John Bosco and Wobo, who is lead campaigner at We Own It, and we talked about NHS privatisation, how we resist it, and um, why it's such a bad thing. Uh, that interview was at 1.30, uh, earlier than previously advertised, so about three and a half hours into the stream, you can find that there. Still to come, up next we have Chloe Naldrett, who is a campaigner with Just Stop Oil. Uh, we're going to be discussing the... Um, what are we going to be discussing? We're going to be discussing Just Up Oil's plans for mobilisation in 2023. Uh, I'm sure, you, unless you've been living under a rock, you have heard of Just Up Oil. They are a campaign group fighting for climate justice, but obviously specifically targeting the oil industry, hence the name. They are well known for their disruptive direct action tactics, um, and uh, we'll be discussing those tactics and their plans for the year ahead as well. Following that, we have Tom Brake, who is the director of Unlock Democracy. Uh, he's also a former Lib Dem MP. Uh, we're going to be discussing Gordon Brown's uh, recommendations for the Labour Party's new policies on democratic reform. We're going to be assessing how sufficient those proposals are. And we're going to be discussing proportional representation and much, much more. Our penultimate guest will be Sonia Adasara. She's an NHS doctor and a campaigner. We will be looking at the state of the NHS why the NHS is in crisis, the industrial disputes going on in the NHS at the moment, and also we will be discussing what the NHS needs to solve its problems. And finally, uh, closing the day at 5.15, we will have Phelan McCafferty, leader of Brighton Hove City Council, Green Party leader of Brighton Hove City Council, and we'll be discussing his record as leader of that council, the Greens administration in Brighton Hove over the last 18 months, and the big successes and achievements that they have had, as well as some of the challenges we'll be discussing as well. So stay tuned for all that and more, and make sure you hit the like button. I had an aim of getting 50 by the end of the stream, we're on 23, so we are nearly halfway there, but past halfway through the show, so still need the 27 to come in. Uh, we're also moving for 475 subscribers by the end of the show, so if you haven't already, hit subscribe. We are currently on... 456 so there are 19 subscribers still to come in if you have any questions or comments for our guests please do use the chat box as some of you already have done uh, if you have any factual corrections like anthony slaughter did please do put them in the chat um, i can see that there are lots of different questions coming in from ben samuel a long running uh viewer of bright green live hi ben welcome uh, i thought it was a bit quiet this morning and it may well have been just that you weren't around ben uh, but now you're in, I can see the questions coming in fit and fast. Uh, you can also put your questions and comments on the hashtag Bright Green Live, and we'll try and pick up as many of them as we can from there too. Um, 
Also, I would love to hear your thoughts and comments on the guests we've had so far and any suggestions on guests we could get booked for future shows. So the next episode of Bright Green Live is going to be on February the 12th. We have two guests booked for that already. One of them is the former Green Party MEP, Molly Scott Cato. She's going to be talking about the Green Party of England and Wales' response to the cost of living crisis. We also have Mark Sawatka, who is the General Secretary of the PCS Union. We're going to be discussing the wave of industrial action that's sweeping across the nation um, and specifically the industrial action taken by his union, PCS, which of course represents civil servants. So the disputes that we've seen with Border Force, uh, with the DVLA, with others uh, over Christmas and uh, into the new year, we're going to be discussing those strikes and the disputes that are going on there, the industrial action they're taking, and getting the perspective of someone who has been a trade union general secretary for, I think, 20 years um, and what this this moment we're going through at the moment of this unprecedented wave of industrial action and industrial militancy means for the trade union movement, means for the future of work, means for uh, working people across the country. So you've got all that to look forward to on February the 12th. Uh, put that in your diaries. We're, we're live streaming from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. as we always do. And of course, you can make sure that you don't miss out on the show by hitting the subscribe button so that you get a little notification when we go live then. Of course, hitting subscribe, you don't just get our live streams, you also get all the other videos that we put out, including the series of interviews we have recently uh, done with the three candidates who are seeking the London Green Party's nomination to be their 2024 mayoral candidate. Now, the three people who are standing are Benali Hamdash, who is an Islington councillor and the Green Party's migration spokesperson, Zoe Garbett, who is a councillor in Hackney, and Scott Ainsley, who is a councillor in Lambeth and was also an MEP for London uh, from 2019 uh, to whenever Brexit happened. Um, and all three of the interviews we've done with those candidates are on our YouTube channel. It's a really interesting election. It's a really important election internally for the Green Party, and it will uh, have a major impact on the ability for the London Green Party to campaign effectively in the 2024 mayoral election. It'll also be that selection process will uh, essentially select a spokesperson who will become one of the most high profile and prominent uh, Greens across the whole of the country uh, by virtue of them being the mayoral, mayoral candidate. And so that selection process really matters. So if you're a member of the London Green Party, make sure you go and watch those interviews after this show. And if you're just generally interested, those interviews are indeed very interesting. And you've got three fascinating candidates to digest an in-depth interview with all of them. Um, he has some brilliant questions coming in for our next guest, Chloe Naldrett, uh, in the chat. So Chloe's going to be joining us very, very soon. So if you have any questions for Chloe, uh, if you have any thoughts about Just Stop Oil and the campaign that they are running, uh, then please do get them in the chat on the hashtag Bright Green Live. And I'll put as many of them to her as I possibly can. Um, it's getting late in the day. I'm getting a little laggy again. I'm going to make myself, I think we're on to coffee number four. Uh, so I'm going to go away for a few minutes, make a coffee and then come back. Uh, please, I would love to see loads of comments and questions in the chat whilst I'm gone so that I can return and have a nice conversation with you and put lots of questions to our guests. So I'll see you very, very shortly. I'll be back in five.
Hello, welcome back. I have returned from my uh, much needed caffeine break. Uh, you can see the bags forming under my eyes, the fatigue starting to set in as we are now five hours in to our show. Uh, but we still have four amazing guests to come. So please stick around. Please stay watching. Um, up next, we have Chloe Naldrut from Just Stop Oil. We're going to be discussing Just Stop Oil's plans for mobilisation throughout 2023. We then have Tom Brake from Unlock Democracy. Uh, we're going to be discussing the... Uh, what are we going to be discussing? Jesus Christ, it's a long day. Uh, we're going to be discussing Gordon Brown's report uh, and recommendations on Labour Party, the Labour Party's policies on democratic reform. Uh, we're going to be looking at whether they're sufficient, what's missing from them, and so on. We then have Sonia Adasara, who is an NHS doctor and a campaigner. We're going to be discussing the state of the NHS, the crisis that it's facing, what's driving that, and a whole host of other things too. And we're going to be finishing off the day with Phelan McCafferty, the leader of Brighton Hove City Council. He's the only Green in the country who leads a council that is under sole Green administration. So we're going to be discussing the 18 months that he's been in charge of Brighton and the uh, record that they uh, have. Uh, so that's the rest of our show. Uh, if you haven't already, please hit the like button. It means that more people will see the show um in their feeds on youtube on the recommended videos and all the other places that people find stuff on youtube uh if you've enjoyed the interviews other people will too if you've enjoyed this show then hit subscribe it means that you won't miss all the other ones and all the other content that we're putting out and if you are able to please do share the uh, links to the show on your social medias preferably using the hashtag bright green live so that again more people can see it um, throughout the show, we're going to be putting your comments and questions to our guests. Uh, get them lined up in the chat. The earlier I see them, the more likely it is that I'll be able to get to them in uh, the for our remaining guests. So if you get them in the chat nice and early, I'm more likely to get them put to our guests. You can also put comments and feedback and responses to the interviews we've had so far. And of course, you can put any questions you want to put to me. Um, so there's some great comments uh, in the question in the chat already. and um thank you Amy for uh, that that comment uh, Amy was our last uh interviewee and Amy says that uh, I'm doing great and thanks uh for having uh them on and thanks all of our guests our viewers for listening so uh, yeah indeed thank you everyone for watching and thank you to Amy for joining us today you can rewind back in the show and watch that interview with Amy it was about uh 15 minutes 20 minutes ago um, and you can catch all that if you've missed it. You can also really want to watch all the other interviews we've had throughout the day. Kicking off the day, we had uh, uh, Scott, not Scott, Niall Christie from the Scottish Green Party Trade Union Group alongside Jen Bell. They're the two conveners of the Trade Union Group. And um, they were talking about the role of the Scottish Greens in supporting trade unions in Scotland, the um, the record of the Scottish Greens in government in supporting workers and workers' rights and trade union struggles. We uh, then had, uh, following that, at 11 o'clock, so about an hour into the stream, Jo Bird talking about her experience as a Labour Party councillor, why she joined the Green Party, and her experience now as a Green Party councillor. Uh, following that up, we had um, uh, we had uh, Laura Webster from The National uh, talking about that paper's uh, support for Scottish independence, her role as editor now that she's been in the post for about a month and what she sees as the role of the national in the campaign and movement for Scottish independence. That was at 12 o'clock. So you can scroll through and find that at uh, two o'clock. No, at one thirty, at an earlier than advertised time. We had John Bosco and Wobo from We Own It talking about NHS privatisation and how we resist it. Um, you can scroll back through and watch that too. Uh, another comment coming from the chat. Paul Bezik says, uh, is commenting on my uh, blaspheming and says that Christ Almighty uh, is equally blasphemous to Jesus Christ, but it's not a personal attack specifically on Jesus, which probably would have upset him. Uh, indeed, it may well have upset Jesus. And I'm sorry, Jesus, if you are listening. Uh, if you are one of our viewers, Jesus, do get in touch uh, in the chat. And I would love to hear from you, Jesus. We can put your questions to any of our guests. Um Yes, if Jesus is watching, please get involved. Um, if you haven't already, please do hit that like button. Follow us on social media. We're on the social medias, all of them. Facebook.com forward slash bright green, bright GRN, sorry. We're on at bright GRN on Twitter, 
at Bright Green Online on Instagram and at Bright Green on the UK server on Mastodon. You can find us all there and it means that you, you'll be able to keep up with everything that Bright Green is doing. <clears throat> um, lots more to say. We'll be joined by Chloe from Just Up All in about 10 minutes time um, talking about uh, Just Up All's plans for the whole of 2023. Um, just to let you know what's going to be happening on the next episode of Bright Green, Lee, Bright Green Live. Jesus, sorry, Christ Almighty, in honour of Paul. Um, I am tired. Uh, the next episode of Bright Green Live will be taking place on February the 12th. And on that show, we already have two brilliant guests booked. We have Molly Scott Cato, who is a former Green Party MEP, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. She will be talking about the Green Party's response to the cost of living crisis. We will also be joined by the General Secretary of the PCS Union, Mark Sawatka. Uh, and he's going to be talking about the ongoing wave of industrial action across the country, specifically the industrial action that the PCS Union is engaged with, uh, engaged in right now. Um, you've seen strikes from Border Force, from DVLA drivers and others. That's all the PCS is doing. We're going to be discussing all that and more, uh, as well as what this current wave of strike action means for the trade union movement. That's on February 12th. Put it in your diaries, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out. And please, please, please give me some recommendations of other guests to book. As I say, we've only got two people booked so far. That means we've got about half a dozen, uh, nearly possibly more guests still to book. We've had some great suggestions from Steve C, a friend of the show, uh, in the chat earlier. Um, and I am sure that you have lots of other bright ideas and I would love to hear what they are. So let me know who you would like to see. coffee is much needed as we move into the final three hours of the show also let me know who your favorite guest has been so far for those of you who've been watching for quite some time um i'd love to know what you thought of them and it also you know it also gives me some ideas of who else to book who people are interested in there's 15 people watching that's the most we've had on the stream so far today thank you so much for joining uh we will very very shortly be joined um by chloe naldrett of just stop oil um, and uh, yeah, that will be happening soon uh, in about five or so minutes time. So uh, get yourself comfortable, get yourself a tea, coffee, whatever it is you need. Um, and we're going to be having a long discussion with Chloe. And of course, I want to put as many of your questions to her as you have. Um, so get them in the chat and on the hashtag Bright Green Live now. Um, I'm just going to go on mute for a second because I need to take my inhaler. I'm an asthmatic and uh, all this speaking uh, is causing my breathing to uh, be imperfect. So I'm just going to have a little puff and I'll be back with you in a second. Apologies for having to administer medicine live on YouTube. I am now much, uh, my airwaves are much clearer. My uh, mind is much clearer and I'm ready for the rest of the show. So uh, there's a flurry of people joining right now. So uh, buckle yourself in, fasten your seatbelt, get yourself nice and comfortable, have a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, uh, any other vessel of any other caffeinated drink or otherwise, um, and uh, get ready for what's going to be a great interview with Chloe Naldrett of Just Stop Oil, who will be joining us in five minutes time. We're going to be discussing that group's plans for mobilisations throughout 2023. And uh, that's the first of the remaining four interviews we still have to go on the show. We're going to be streaming live till 6 p.m. today. Uh, so please do stick with us for as long as you can. And if you're new to the show, you're going to have to press that like button uh, because it means that you found this somehow and you're enjoying it. So surely someone else will too. And by clicking like, it means that you'll feed the algorithm. You'll give it a nice little stroke and it will appear in other people's feeds as well. We're aiming for 50 likes by the end of the show. We're not quite there yet. We're nearly at halfway. So hit that like button. We're also aiming for 475 subscribers and we're now on 457. So that means we just need 18 more people to hit that subscribe button. And in doing so, it means that you won't miss out on any of the other videos we put out in the coming weeks and months. And of course, get your questions lined up, ready for Chloe. I want to put as many of them as I can to her. The best and easiest way to uh, make sure that I get them asked is to put them in nice and early, i.e. preferably now. And I'll try and ask as many of them as possible. I can see Ben Samuel, a, um, a regular uh, viewer of Bright Green Live and a prolific question asker, has already stuck some in there. And I will um, 
hopefully try and ask some of them uh and also put questions in for our guests in the latter bit of the show uh following sophie sophie chloe <laughs> now from just up oil we'll have tom break uh from unlock democracy uh joining us to talk about the labor party's potential new policies on democratic reform Thank you so much to the person who just hit like. You're giving me my favourite thing, a lovely little dopamine hit, but you've also helped out the show massively uh, by getting more people's feeds. And hopefully you enjoyed pressing the like button, that little thumbs up as well. We're now at the halfway mark of our 50 like target for the rest of the show. Uh, so please do keep those likes rolling in. I believe a YouTube term is a like spike. Let's get a like spike uh, going and hopefully... Uh, more people will share the, see the show and you can of course always share the show on your social medias as well um, that helps more people see it too uh, preferably you can do that using the hashtag bright green live as many people already have done uh, let me know your thoughts on the show so far that's much appreciated let me know where you're um, watching from I'm, I'm obviously streaming from rainiest rainiest oxford it's a gray overcast day the perfect time to be indoors and talking at a screen uh, and hoping that people will be listening for eight hours straight thank you to the other person who just pressed like hugely appreciated um let's keep that going let's get more likes in um as we wait for chloe to join us i would also really love to hear people's thoughts on just stop oil in our campaign group that you know uh they stimulate quite a lot of um different thoughts in uh people who are involved in the left who are involved in the climate movement and uh who are involved in politics more broadly i would love to um know what you think about them um and in advance of the conversation uh, i'm just reporting a load of spam that's appearing in the the chat apologies for that spam i think that should all now be gone uh, whoever you are, robot of the internet who is putting spam in the chat, go away. You are not welcome here. Our chat is sacred and let's keep it that way. Uh, let me know your thoughts on Just Up Oil and so on and get all your questions in the chat. Uh, so I can see now that Chloe has just joined the call. So I'm going to let Chloe in in a moment and then we're going to get started with the interview. <coughs> So Chloe is just joining the Zoom call now and will very soon be connecting to the show. And whilst uh, Chloe connects to audio and gets ready uh, to uh, join the call, I'll just do a little bit of an intro so that you all know who we are speaking to. So uh, many of you will be familiar with Just Stop Oil. They are a climate campaign group that have become known for their uh, disruptive and uh, vibrant direct action tactics. And today I'm going to be speaking to Chloe Naldrit, who is involved in the group. And we're going to be discussing uh, some of those tactics, but also what uh, Just Up Oil's plans for mobilisation are throughout 2023. Now, I can see that Chloe joined the call. I can't currently see your camera, Chloe. So if you're able to turn that on, that'd be brilliant. That's excellent. I can think you are now materialising, although I can still just see your name. So I'll give you another moment to sort that out. Your face is there now. Thank you so much for joining us, Chloe. Chloe, how are you doing? I'm all right, thank you. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? Your sound is loud and clear. Your picture is very clear and vibrant. So uh, right. all is good in the world. Good. Um, so to kick us off, uh, you know, I think a lot of our viewers will obviously be familiar with Just Stop Oil um, because of the uh, the actions that have been taking place over the last few months. Uh, people will remember, for example, uh, actions in art galleries. They'll remember actions on motorways, those kinds of things. Uh, but often a lot of the media, it doesn't very effectively uh, report on the demands and the um uh, the things that Just Up Oil is calling for. So what I wanted to do to kick things off is to give you space to talk through for us what the demands are of Just Up Oil. Yeah, great. So should I just um, start off by telling you a little bit about me so that you've all got a bit, a bit of context. So um, yeah, my name's Chloe. I'm a mum. I live in Bristol. Um, I am a theatre producer in the real world. I work in the arts. And I've been involved in um, firstly XR and then JSO 
um, just over the last year, but Extinction Rebellion um, for about the last three or four years. And really, I stepped into climate activism because I've got two kids and I realised that I could no longer look them in the eye and promise to keep them safe. And that for me was, was a sort of horrifying moment and a moment of realising that as a parent, I had to take some responsibility for that. And I really had to step up and do everything that I possibly could to protect them and their future. And, you know, I, I've come from a very, I come from a very conventional background, <laughs> a very conventional upbringing. Um, I'm a sort of straight A student, girl, ex-girl guide kind of person. I've I've been a really good girl all my life. So the idea of stepping into civil disobedience for me was was a really, really big step to make. And I mean, look, you know, I I live in a I live a very middle class life in lots of ways. You know, you have to really squint at me to um, put me in the bracket of sort of, you know, hippie or whatever we all like to get, whatever, whatever particular term we like to get um, thrown at us um, uh, from the media. But um, but yeah, so you know, I've 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 really sort of come into this from my perspective as a parent out of a sense of this things are going to get really bad and they and they're going to get really bad for for my children and for everyone else's children and for many people's children they're really bad now. So um, so that's I guess that's that's how I, how I came into all of this. Um, so Just Stop Oil has been around for about the last year, and the demand of the of the campaign is very clearly we can have no more fossil fuels and we cannot as a country issue any more oil and gas licenses and in making that demand we are repeating what's being said by the ipcc what's being said by the un what's being said by the international energy agency they are all saying that if we are to stay below 1.5 degrees of global warming we have to stop burning fossil fuels we can have to leave it in the ground and that also means that we need to be mobilising around renewable energy, around insulating our homes and our businesses, and, and really getting behind public transport as opposed to private vehicles. But our government, knowing what it knows about the science of what's happening and about the risks that we are, um, you know, we are right on the edge of, the, we're right on the edge of these sort of global tipping points, they're seeking to licence 100 new um, oil and gas fields in the North Sea and as we heard just before Christmas they're they're planning to open a new coal mine so you know there's never been a more important time to to stand up and make this demand and so thank you for setting out quite clearly there the the demands of just up oil because I think that's often what what gets missed in the conversation but I wanted to move on now to talk about uh you know it's a new year we're in 2023 um I wanted to 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 get from you a sense of what just up all's planned mobilizations are for the year ahead yeah great so um the way that just up oil mobilizes is we do um talks online twice a week and they are accessible to absolutely everybody there is one at five o'clock today so people could literally come out of, of this meeting and sign up and be in a just up oil talk this afternoon and those talks um they go through the social science. They obviously they, they look at the where we are in terms of the science of the climate crisis, but they also look at the social science, um, and they look at the sort of history of protest and how how important it is as a means of speaking to our government about injustice. Um, and they also provide some space for discussion. So they're really lively, really engaging talks, and they're all on our website. There's a calendar on our website demonstrating. Uh, which will tell you um, where they are, when they're happening online, and they also happen around the country. So in most big cities, there's a talk every week or so. Um, so that is a really major sort of um, pillar of the, of the mobilisation. Um, we also offer, for anyone that, that would like to get involved, we offer um, non-violent direct action training. So one of the really important things to say about anyone who's thinking about getting involved in Just Stop Oil is that you are trained and supported all the way through that process. So before you get into an action, when you're in the action, and then when you come out of the action at the other end. So all of that sort of is discussed. People go into that situation feeling really prepared and supported. Um, and over the next year, you know, we'll, we'll continue to use the sort of variety of, um, of uh, tactics that we've seen over the last year. You mentioned some of them, the things at sports events. Um, the, the event, the um, actions in art galleries, the actions at oil terminals. Um, you know, all, all of that sort of ecology will, will continue to be part of our protest. Um, but I think we're also going to see some actions in um, regional, um, regionally around the country as well, 
as well as taking um, dis disruptive action to the centres of power. So I want to move on a little bit to talk about the impact that Just Stop Oil has had. So you mentioned earlier that it's been around for around a year. Um, what do you think the impact that uh, your campaigning and actions has had so far on the, the fight for climate justice? And how do you think that the actions of groups like Just Up All can be scaled to meet the needs of the challenge? Because, you know, we're in a situation where time is running out. We have governments failing to act and often, as you've pointed out, with the licensing of new, uh, provide, granting of new oil licenses, actively making things much, much worse. So what's the impact you've had already and how can your activities be scaled so that we can achieve what we need to achieve? So, yeah, it's a campaign that's been around for a year. And um, in the course of that year, there was a, um, a survey done at the end of, of last year. Um, and we believe that 92 percent of people in this country have heard of Just Stop Oil, which for a campaign that's only been around for a year is absolutely remarkable. And that really is um, a reflection on the on the nature of that action that we've taken and the, the sort of the total unignorability of it. Um, there was also in this sort of same um, study, actually I think it was studied done by the, the, the New Statesman, 38% of people actively positively support the demands of Just Stop Oil which is twice the number of people that don't support it. And of course, there's a group in the middle who probably would say, I support your, I support your demands, but I don't support your action. So, um, you know, that's, that's very common. Um, so a huge amount of public awareness and an awful lot of public support, certainly for what we're, for what we're calling for. Which again, just to repeat, is what's being called for by the UN and by the International Energy Agency and by the IPCC. There have been some major policy wins so the Labour Party has essentially adopted um, Just Stop Oil's demands as part of its policy moving forward. It said it won't um, it won't be licensing um, new oil and gas fields. And Lloyds Bank and HSBC Bank have announced in recent months that they will no longer support uh, or no longer provide funding for new oil and gas projects. And that is massive. That is absolutely enormous. And those banks haven't done it because they've suddenly grown a moral conscience. They're doing it. They're making that kind of statement because of the pressure that's been put on them by by Just Stop Oil, but also by Extinction Rebellion and by Money Rebellion and, you know, by the sort of general protest community. It's an, an immense win, I think. Um, we know that 8000 people have attended our talks over the last year. Um, 3300 of those people have been willing to, to go through the training process with us and over 1700 have said that they're willing to be arrested. And there have been over 2000 arrests in um, in the UK over the last year and 150 people have spent time in prison, including me. I spent a week on remand um, in September after um, breaking an injunction at Kingsbury Oil Terminal. And then, of course, what we see is this sort of enormous international solidarity. So there are groups like Ultima Generazione in Italy and uh, Let's De Generation. I can't pronounce it in German. Let's De Generation in Germany. Um, so you know that that it's it's sort of rippling outwards. It's it's. I think there's a there's something so compelling about it, and it's being picked up by that that sort of protest community um, elsewhere across Europe and beyond. But of course, what we need to keep doing is 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 mobilising more people. Um, and I think what's really interesting about what's happening at the moment is the way that there's this um, the coalition of protest groups coming together. So you know, Extinction Rebellion have a um, an ambition of having 100,000 people outside Parliament on the 21st of April and absolutely ju Just Stop Oil will be behind that um, as well. You know, that's, 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 that's good for all of us. We will all, all be there um, alongside, you know, the Greenpeace and the Friends of the Earth and the Green Party and all those other slightly less radical um, sides of the movement. So I've got a couple of other questions that I want to put to you. But before I do that, um, just to our viewers, um, for anyone watching right now, uh, please do get your questions in the chat on YouTube and I'll try and put as many of them to Chloe as I can. Um, there's already been some great comments that have come through. So uh, Meg has said that your introduction really resonated with her um, in terms of what you were saying then. And similarly, Amy has said that your intro is brilliant. So you've got the full support of our viewership thus far. Um, but please do get questions coming in so that I can put as many of them to Chloe as possible um so you mentioned extinction rebellion in your last answer and at the start of this year some people will have seen that extinct that extinction rebellion put out a statement saying that they were um 
going to be scaling back on their disruptive action and no longer taking disruptive action as part of their campaigns. And Just Stop Oil, in another statement, has said has accused Extinction Rebellion of quitting by um, stepping back from disruptive action. So why do you think the kind of provocative, disruptive campaigning that Just Stop Oil has become known for is still important? Well, we know it's the only thing that's ever worked. So all of the um, freedoms, privileges that we all take for granted now have been won through disruptive action. So I'm thinking there about the suffragettes, I'm thinking about the civil rights marchers, I'm thinking about people that campaigned for LGBTQI plus rights. Um, I'm thinking about the fact that we have weekends and you know and weeks workers' rights. So the only reason that we have those things in this you know supposedly progressive society that we live in are because people fought and people were prepared to go to prison and people were prepared to put their lives on the line and people did put their lives on the line for all of those things so you know we know that it is disruptive action that gets the attention of the public and that then shifts public opinion to put pressure on the people that make our laws and um we also know that those movements don't need to be popular they don't need to be movements where you know everybody goes gosh yes i think the suffragettes are so wonderful i think martin luther king's wonderful in fact the the absolute truth of that is that people were, were violently opposed to the suffragettes martin luther king was absolutely derided um peter tatchell was called the most hated man in britain so you know we know at the moment well well in the moment that people are raising those issues they are not popular but we do know also that they shift public opinion you know, in a really, really important way towards achieving our aim. So disruptive action is absolutely non-negotiable and it will be, JSO will continue to do what we're doing um, and we'll continue to do it knowing that um, it's the right thing to do given how fast we need to see real change. But I think this, this statement of XR's I think is, was, was absolutely brilliant and I do sort of, I, I came up through XR and I sort of still straddle both those camps to some extent, I'm still doing various projects with XR um and you know it's sort of the the genius of that was kind of the, the sort of clickbait nature of that um that announcement you know absolutely sort of playing the tabloids at their own game and um they achieved a million social media likes um when any previous message prior to that the highest was something like seven hundred thousand. um they have more signups in a day than they would normally have in a week um and i think i think the genius of that um, that announcement is, um, and actually when you look into it, they're not saying we're going to stop disruptive pro protest at all. They're saying we're going to stop disrupting the public for a period of time in order to mobilise. We will still be doing actions that are targeted at the centres of power, um, but the focus of the next four months prior to this really important date on the 21st of April, and I really urge everyone to put 21st of April in their diary and be part of 100,000 people converging on Parliament to demand action on the climate emergency for our future. But you know, there, there needs to be over the next um, over the next 100 days a massive um, outreach project and that's what they've given themselves the space to do. And what's really interesting is it's working because immediately what it's doing is putting XR in a place where people who are concerned about the climate but absolutely are not going to go and climb a gantry on the M25 and are nowhere near even possibly sort of stepping out into an arrestable situation. They go, oh, XR is now in a more moderate place. I think I could get behind that now. And it's having an immensely positive effect at bringing more people into the movement. So I, I absolutely think that whilst, um, whilst I think there was a lot of people who felt, oh, hang on a minute, I didn't know we'd quit. Um, and that was quite challenging for them. But I think it's an absolutely brilliant piece of, um, uh, what do we call it, promotion that, that, that they've done. And I, and I think it will really work and really help. But the, the protest movement continued, needs to continually evolve. And this is a sort of acknowledgement that an awful lot of the people who are very keen on going and doing, you know, very spicy actions have already sort of migrated towards Insulate Britain or to JSO, which leaves Extinction Rebellion with this opportunity to do something much broader and much more sort of centrist. So I'm going to go to some questions from the chat now, and there are some brilliant ones that have come in. Um, so I'm going to go to Paul Beswick first. Um, and Paul has asked, 
how does vandalizing a Van Gogh painting help sway public opinion towards sustainability? Now, I'm sure you're probably sick of talking about this particular action, I but for anyone who didn't, <laughs> okay, good, good news. Uh, so for anyone who didn't see that action, uh, essentially it was a uh, action that took place in a art gallery that was displaying uh, a Van Gogh painting and some, uh, I think it was two uh, just up all activists uh, threw a tin of soup over the glass casing of that painting and it caused a big furore um so chloe how does that help sway public people public opinion towards your cause so van gogh himself said it's not the language of painters that we should listen to it's the language of nature and i think anybody who is outraged by that action um, needs to really ask themselves why they're more outraged about that than they are about the fact that one third of pakistan is underwater and 35 million people have been displaced and why they're more outraged about that than the fact that every 36 seconds a person dies in the Horn of Africa because of the impact that the, the global warming is having on, on that part of the world. Um, the painting wasn't destroyed, it, it, as you say it was behind glass, it's been cleaned, it's back on display, it was back on display virtually immediately, It you know it's absolutely fine but the the, the and it, and it was a very controversial action. And it took a lot of discussion, I think, to interpret it for people. So that's, that's why I'm really delighted to have this conversation because I think it's something we need to keep talking about and really keep challenging and keep asking ourselves these questions about. But um, the, the profile gained by that action was absolutely, you know, you could, it couldn't have been done any other way. And that's why when we go 92% of people have heard about Just Stop Oil, they might have heard about Just Stop Oil and go, those those horrible vandals, I, I, I hate them. But they're still going, just, they're, just Stop Oil is still going into their brain. And that's what's really important. So that was the most effective way of, of making sure that people heard that demand with no damage to the picture. So I've got another brilliant question uh, from the chat, uh, which is completely different, uh, but I think it's a really valuable one. And so Ben Samuel has said, uh, Emma Goldman, the uh, American anarchist, uh, was famously quoted as saying, if I can't dance there, it is not my revolution. Uh, so wanted to get your thoughts on joy uh, in the climate movement and amongst the climate crisis. Oh, that's such a lovely question. And I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. And the um, I, I don't I don't want to just be enraged all the time. I'm a, I am absolutely livid so much of the time that I absolutely need that that joy to counterbalance it. And um, I get that so wonderfully from from the activist movement, from the climate movement. I've had that since I since I joined XR, and I get it in spades um, from Just Stop Oil um, because. Um, the people are just remarkable. The people are, I mean, we're all absolutely ordinary people, but something about the way that we all come together um, invites us to bring our best selves. And the, the, the sense of acceptance and of, um, and of sort of you know, platonic love, and I apologise for my child in the background, who's clearly picked a brilliant moment to start kicking football around. Um, but, you know, that, that sort of sense of love and community and camaraderie and, um, and I think that the experience of being with people who absolutely understand where you are in your head and where you are in your heart it is, I haven't ever experienced that anywhere else. Um, so I think, you know, a lot, I think probably a lot of people come into the movement for the climate and then they're like, well, I'm staying because the people are so great. And we're, people are from these completely diverse and different backgrounds, you know, socioeconomic as well as geographic, as well as the, the jobs that they do, as well as, you know, being from diverse communities. And, um, and just that, that sense of you are just accepted for, for who you are and for what you bring. And that is, it's just a really, really beautiful thing. So the movement is totally full of joy. And I, I find as well that I find the real world quite a difficult place to be at the moment. I find ordinary conversation quite challenging because of the level of willful denial that is going on. Even if people go, oh, yes, the climate's a problem. They don't really want to have to face the facts of it. And I, I find it so much so refreshing to be with people who absolutely understand it and are willing to do what it requires of us. So, yeah, there is. And, and, and actually, one of the things I didn't mention about the mobilisation is that there are social events as well. So as well as all the sort of training that we do and all of the listening to the science and responding to that, there are social events which are really about building community. 
So before I let you uh, go off and enjoy the rest of your Sunday, um, you've talked a little bit so far about, I guess, Just Stop Oil's, uh, uh, I guess, ongoing mobilisation, so with the calls and so on. Um, but is there anything you haven't mentioned yet about how people can get involved with Just Stop Oil in the coming months? Yeah, so I'm um, I, obviously, please check the website. Please go and have a look on there. Look at the calendar of, of events. Please come along to one. No one's going to pressure you into to sitting on a road. Um, as a result of coming to one of those talks, you're very welcome to just come along and listen and see where you sit with it and what you want to do. And I think a lot of people probably come to those talks and then they have to go and sit with it for a little while before they're ready to sort of take the next step. And that's absolutely fine. Just come and come and see what it's all about. Um, and so you can sign up on the website to receive information from, from Just Stop Oil. That's, um, so that, that I would say, you know, that's an easy thing for everyone to, to go and do. But um, wherever you are in the country, there will be a Just Stop Oil community that, that you would be really welcome into joining. Chloe, thank you so much for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I hope to see hope to see lots of people who are on this call at uh, Just Stop Oil Action soon. Thanks, Chris. So, thank you so much. So that was Chloe and Aldrich from Just Stop Oil. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on that interview. Uh, I've already seen some conversation going on in the chat, but please do keep putting it in there um, and we'll see uh, what you thought of it. I thought it was a really interesting conversation. I thought we got to explore some of the uh, more interesting things about uh, their campaign tactics and strategy and their approach to fighting uh, for climate justice. Um, apologies, Amy, your question just came through on the chat for me now, so I didn't get to ask that. Apologies uh, for that. There's a slight delay on the chat for me, which is why I try and ask people to get their questions in early. Um, but uh, yeah, I would have loved to put that to Chloe as well. Um, so for those of you who are just joining, you're watching episode three of Bright Green live we are throughout the day interviewing some of the most interesting exciting engaging people on the left in the uk from social movements from the labor movement from green parties and so on and so on and so on uh we've just spoken to chloe nowder from just stop oil and we have three phenomenal guests still to come today up next at four o'clock, we have Tom Brake from Unlock Democracy. Now, Tom is uh, the director of Unlock Democracy, and we're going to be speaking about the Gordon Brown uh, report into what the Labour Party's policies on democratic reform should be. We're going to be discussing those proposals, uh, whether they go far enough, whether they're sufficient. And we're going to be talking about proportional representation, House of Laws reform, a whole bunch of other stuff. So please stick around for that. After Tom, we have Sonia Adasara, who is an NHS doctor and a campaigner. We're going to be discussing the crisis the NHS is currently facing, the causes behind it, the current issues that are underpinning the NHS, uh, the industrial disputes within the health service, and also the role of privatisation in the NHS. Um, and also we're going to be talking about how we fix the health service as well. And finally, I'm going to be joined by Phelan McCafferty, who is the leader of Brighton Hove City Council, the only Green Party leader of a council where the Greens are in sole administration. We're going to be discussing the 18 months he spent as leader of the Green uh, leader of the council in Brighton Hove, uh, his record, the Greens, the Greens record in administration and the prospects of them getting re-elected in May this year. If you're just joining us, please do hit that like button. We're aiming to get to 50 likes on the video by the end of the show. We're currently on 26 and we have two and a half hours left, so we have some way to go, but you can help. The reason I'm asking you to hit like is firstly, because it's a fun experience for all involved, but more importantly, it's because if you enjoy the interviews in this show, then other people will enjoy them too. And what liking the video does is it means that this video, this stream will appear in more people's feeds, more more people will get to see the interviews we're putting out uh, throughout the day. Uh, also, if you've enjoyed the show, you can hit subscribe. Uh, if you hit subscribe, you'll make sure you get a notification every time we go live on YouTube. And also you'll see all the other videos that we're putting out in the coming weeks and months. We're aiming for 475 uh, subscribers by the end of the show. I'm just doing my check now to find out how many we have. We have 458, which means we are 17 short. So make sure you get uh, subscribing right away. Um, 
just to go to the chat and look at a couple of comments. Uh, so there's a few thoughts that have come through on the Just Up All Soup action. Uh, very interesting discussion there. Let me know your thoughts about that. Uh, Brian Candlin comments that April 21st is, uh, which is the big day of action that Extinction Rebellion have called, where they're hoping to converge 100,000 people um, in Parliament. Uh, Brian's pointed out that that's right before or right in the middle of the biggest round of local elections in four years. So members of a political party might struggle to be involved. I don't doubt that is the case. Uh, Brian, thank you for pointing that out um please do let me know what you think about uh the interviews we've had so far today including that last one with chloe Naldrop from just stop oil but all the other ones we've had throughout the day as well i'm going to take a very brief break it's probably going to be my last break of the day because then we're in back-to-back interviews throughout the rest of the day so please bear with me i'll be back in about two or three minutes um and we'll crack on with the rest of the show uh, up next we have tom brake from unlock democracy joining us to discuss gordon brown's proposals for the labor party's democratic reform policies i'll see you in a couple of minutes make sure you throw loads of comments questions thoughts in the chat whilst i'm gone so i can pick those up when i come back see you very very shortly
Hello, 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 and welcome back to episode three of Bright Green Live. Thank you all so much for joining us and for watching today. Uh, we will shortly be joined by our next guest in the last two hours of the show. Um, but before I get going with that, uh, I just have to ask you to hit that like button if you haven't already, and to hit subscribe if you're not currently a subscriber, and to apologise for the wave of spam we are getting in the chat. I will uh, remove that. Uh, and I will uh, hopefully <laughs> be able to get rid of all that spam um, and uh, you won't have that in the chat anymore. Apologies for that and robots go away. We don't want your spam. Uh, only real humans in the sacred chat, please. Um, so Steve C in the chat has uh, already lined up our question for our next guest. Please do get your questions lined up for the guests we have throughout the remainder of the day. Our next guest who will be joining us very, very shortly is Tom Brake. Now, Tom Brake is the director of Unlock Democracy, the Democratic Reform Campaign Group. We're going to be discussing the Labour Party, the proposals that Gordon Brown has put forward in his report to the Labour Party as recommendations for them to adopt as their policy on democratic reform. We're going to be looking at whether those proposals are sufficient. We're going to be discussing them in depth and we're going to be talking about things like proportional representation and other forms of democratic reform. That's all coming up at four oh four o'clock, not four o'clock. Um, we also have two other brilliant guests joining us throughout the rest of the day. Uh, at uh, four thirty, we'll be joined by Sonia Adasara, who is an NHS doctor and a campaigner. We're going to be discussing why the NHS is in crisis, uh, the role of privatisation in driving that crisis, the issues that are driving the industrial disputes currently taking place in the health service, and also the policies that are needed to fix it. And finally, at the end of the show, we'll be joined by Phelan McCafferty, the leader of Brighton Hove City Council. And we're talking about his 18 months as leader of the council um, and uh, the time that the Greens have been in administration there um, as the sole, uh, sole party in administration, the only place in the country where the Greens are the sole party in administration. Before we move on to all those interviews, I'm going to have to get up because I left the door open. So I'm just going to have to close the door very briefly and then I'll be back imminently. <laughs> apologies for that brief intermission now you can get all your questions lined up for our forthcoming guests it's much easier for me to ask questions to them if they come in nice and early and i get to see them in advance uh there's a delay on the chat me seeing it so uh please do get them in early so that i can get them put to our guests um in the meantime you can also share the show link on your social medias preferably using the hashtag bright green live if you're enjoying the show then other people will too and the best way to make sure that they see it and they uh, get involved is to share the show on your socials if you've enjoyed the show if you want to see more of what bright green does then hit that subscribe button we're aiming for 475 subscribers by the end of the show we're on 458 at the moment that means we just have 17 to go so please hit subscribe if you haven't already and we're aiming for 50 likes on the video by the end of the show we're on 26 we're over halfway there but we can get more press like it means more people will see the stream in their feeds <clears throat> now we have those three amazing guests still to come but we've also had an absolutely stacked lineup of guests throughout the rest of the show which at your leisure you can rewind the show and go back and watch them or you can wait for the individual clips to come out on our youtube channel if you missed any of the interviews earlier on we kick things off this morning which seems like many moons ago now with Niall Christie and Jen Bell, who are the co-conveners of the Scottish Green Party Trade Union Group. We spoke about the role the Scottish Green Party Trade Union Group is playing in supporting industrial action from trade unions in Scotland. We talked about the record the Scottish Greens have in government of supporting workers' rights, workers' struggles, trade unions, and so on. Fascinating discussion. About 15 minutes into the stream, you can find that. At 11 o'clock, we spoke to Jo Bird, who is a Green Party councillor in the Wirral. She was previously a Labour Party councillor, and we discussed her journey from Labour to the Greens and the difference that she's, different experience she's had in the two political parties. That was at 11 o'clock, so about an hour into the stream. At 12 o'clock, an hour later, we uh, spoke to Laura Webster from The National. We discussed Scottish independence. We discussed her paper's role in the movement for Scottish independence and her plans as editor of the National for the paper going forward. After that, we spoke to John Bosco and Wobo from We Own It at 1.30, so about three and a half hours into the stream, about NHS privatisation. 
about what it is, its impact, how much how much the NHS has been privatised and how we resist privatisation. And then at uh, 2.30, we spoke to Ami Kardaliwal from the Wales Green Party, Deputy Leader of the Wales Green Party, about the role that councillors in Wales, Green Party councillors in Wales, are playing across the country and the future prospects of the Wales Green Party. Uh, following that, and our last interview that we just had a few minutes ago was with Chloe Naldra from Just Stop Oil, discussing their plans for mobilisation over the coming year. And we discussed a lot about the uh, tactics that Just Stop Oil and other climate groups have been using and their various merits. So that's the show. You can scroll back, rewind through all of that at your leisure or wait for the individual clips to come out on Bright Green's YouTube channel in the coming weeks and months. So in five minutes time, I'm going to be joined by Tom Brake from Unlock Democracy. Please do get your questions in the chat and I'll try and put as many of them to him as possible. Um, just to give you a heads up as to what's coming on our next show. So Bright Green Live streams every second Sunday of the month. And our next show will be on February the 12th. On that show, we'll be joined by the former Green Party MEP, Molly Scott Cato. And we'll also be joined by Mark Sawatka, the General Secretary of the PCS Union. We're going to be talking to Molly about the Green Party's position on the cost of living crisis, how its policies would alleviate it. And we'll also be talking to Mark Sawatka about uh, the general uh, surge in trade union activity in industrial action and strike action taking place across the country right now, what it means for the labour movement and for working people more broadly. And we'll also be specifically diving into the disputes that PCS is currently in um, across uh, the the workplaces it's active in. Of course, PCS is the civil servants union. And so we'll be discussing things like the border force strike that took place over Christmas, DVLA strike, and all the other industrial disputes that PCS is involved in. So that's on February the 12th. You can catch that on our YouTube channel here. Put it in your diaries, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. as always. And the best way to make sure you don't miss that show is to subscribe because you'll get a notification when we go live. As I say, get your comments lined up for Tom in the chat and I'll put as many to them, to him, uh, many of them to him as possible. So with Tom, I'm going to be discussing the report that Gordon Brown produced and put to the Labour Party with recommendations for its policies on democratic reform. We're going to be assessing what Unlock Democracy makes of that report and the recommendations. We're going to be discussing uh, the specifics in it, so things like House of Lords reform, um, devolution, a whole bunch of other things. But we'll also be discussing about some of the things that were omitted from it. So, for example, uh, that report does not include a recommendation for uh, elections for the House of Commons to be conducted through a proportional system. And many people have criticised the report for failing to uh, make that recommendation. We're going to be discussing why that is and uh, why proportional representation is important for House of Commons elections as part of that wider package of reforms that Gordon Brown has proposed. So that's what we're going to be discussing. If you have any questions or thoughts on any of that, please do put them in the chat now. And I'll put as many of them to Tom as I can. I've also already got some great questions from Steve C and I think from others as well. So please do um, get them in the chat when you are ready. I think uh yeah we've got a couple of questions for tom i'm looking forward to the conversation apologies uh i'm starting to lose my voice and my uh asthma is kicking off so i'm gonna have to do a little cough i'm gonna go off mic so you don't have to experience it but uh that's why i'm going apologies for that normal service is resumed and we will be joined by Tom Brake from Unlock Democracy very, very shortly. If you don't follow Bright Green on social media, please do. We are on Twitter at BrightGRN, on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash BrightGRN, on the Instagrams at Bright Green Online, on and on Mastodon at uh, Bright Green on the UK server. You can also sign up to our mailing list, uh, which uh, every single Sunday we send out an email with all the best stories we put on our website that week, the things that are the most read, the things that are um, uh, the videos that have been most watched, a whole bunch of other stuff about what we've been doing. You can sign up for that on our website, bright-green.org. Uh, there should be a link in the description to this video somewhere. If there isn't, uh, then apologies. It's bright-green.org. If you Google Bright Green, we'll come up. Uh, other search engines are available. Uh, if you don't use Google for whatever reason, um, you can find us via other means 
and you can sign up to our mailing list. We don't bombard your inbox. We send you an email once a week and occasionally little bits and bobs in between for exclusive stories, for fundraisers, that kind of stuff. But primarily, it's the Sunday email, which rounds up everything that we are doing. So I can see that Tom has just joined the waiting room of the call. So I'm just going to have a quick little sip and then I'll let him in. And so I'll let Tom in now. And as Tom joins the call, I can see Tom is joining now. Uh, I'll do a little bit of an introduction so that you all know who Tom is. So Tom Brake is the director of Unlock Democracy, the campaign group uh, that organizes and campaigns for democratic reform and for a new democratic system. We're going to be talking today about the series of proposals that Gordon Brown put forward uh, to recommend to the Labour Party on its policies on democratic reform. But before we get into all of that, uh, I just wanted to say a big welcome to Tom. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Chris. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. Looking forward to so, it. Brilliant. So I mentioned there Gordon Brown's report on democratic reform. So that came out the tail end of last year with a series of recommendations uh, for the Labour Party to adopt on uh, their policies when it comes to democracy. What do you make of that report? Well, I'm, I'm pleased with uh, a lot of what it says, although I know a subject we're going to come on to later is proportional representation. And on that subject, uh, it is silent. In fact, it wasn't even within the remit of, of Brown to consider that. But I think in terms of what's in it, uh, we produced some research just over a year ago uh, called uh, Local Government in England, uh, 40 Years in Decline. And uh, we, we commissioned some academics to look at how powers for local authorities had been changed and, in fact, how they've been diminished over the last 40 years. And that is under a succession of governments of different political persuasions. And some of the problems that uh, that research identified, and indeed some of the solutions, are solutions that are now reflected in the, the, the Brown Commission report. So, uh, for instance, the idea that uh, local government, for instance, the powers of local government should be locked in. In other words, there should be a, a constitutional uh, guarantee that local authorities can't have their powers taken away from them uh, by central government. So, as I said, there's a lot of good stuff in the, the, the Brown report. Uh, but there are some absences and uh, PR is one of the most obvious ones. So you said there, yes, that proportional representation for elections to the House of Commons isn't something that was recommended by Gordon Brown. Why do you think proportional representation is so important as part of this conversation about democratic reform? I think because if you look at uh, countries, particularly in Europe, that have proportional systems, uh, then, first of all, proportional systems ensure that people's views, uh, people's political views, are reflected accur accurately in those who get elected. I think that is a should be the fundamental principle associated with any electoral system, that how people vote is reflected in who gets elected for different parties in any parliament. And clearly, with our first-past-the-post system, uh, that does not happen. And that's why we've had a series of governments, uh, whether it's the, the, the most recent government or the, the government uh, that, that Boris Johnson was elected prime minister of, or indeed the, the Blair government, a series of Blair governments were elected with a minority of the, the national vote, but got, uh, in some cases, uh, under Blair in particular, a very, very comfortable majority in Parliament, which meant that that the minority view was able to impose a view on the majority. Uh, and often uh, a majority might have been opposed to decisions that, for instance, the Boris Johnson government was taking, but because they ended up with a, an 80 seat majority under first past the post, they were able to push through things that in fact, uh, the majority of people didn't support. The other thing to say about uh, other European countries that use PR systems is that I think what it does is it provides for government that is that is more about continuity, because one of the big problems we've seen uh, is the, the the pendulum that exists in in British politics, where under first past the post, uh, one lot will get elected on a minority of the vote. They will then push through an agenda that four years later, typically. 
the other lot might get elected on a minority of the vote. They undo uh, the, end, the agenda of the previous government before imposing their own agenda. So we have these big swings uh, in political terms, and they don't tend to have that on the uh, in Europe where they use PR systems. And those countries are, are uh, principally, uh, mainly uh, richer than us. They have better health than us. They often have a more, um, uh, you know, a, a more detailed, more appropriate approach to environmental issues than we do. So there are lots of benefits to, to PR. And that's why I think it was regrettable that uh, for whatever reason, uh, the, uh, the, the Brown Commission was not tasked with looking at that. So I'm going to go to a question from the chat now on this topic in particular. And for our viewers, uh, please do get questions for Tom in the chat. The earlier you get them in, the more likely I'm going to be able to put them to him. So now's your call for questions. Um, so Steve C has asked, um, does the report from Gordon Brown lack legitimacy as it doesn't speak about PR, as we've just discussed? And do you think that it, it really that lack of uh, recommendation around proportional representation uh, tarnishes the wider report's recommendations? Well, I think they, as I said, there are proposals in the report which which unlock democracy would be completely, are, are completely supportive of. Uh, so the idea that local authorities, for instance, should be given a, a three-year horizon, fiscal horizon, so that they know uh, over the next three years exactly how much money they're going to have to spend for instance would be a, a, a novel and very sensible approach that that we would we would entirely uh, endorse so I think the I, the fact that PR isn't there I think doesn't actually detract from the other uh, sensible proposals that are in there so I mean looking at those so the idea for instance the that the heading renewing the purpose of the United Kingdom which looks at uh, locking in uh, a constitutional statute, for instance, that would guarantee how powers between the different nations uh, in the UK, how they operate and, and uh, where they overlap and, uh, and so on, I think would be a sensible, a sensible approach. A lot of the proposals around the, the regions and England in particular, about giving more powers to towns and cities for them to determine their future are ones that, uh, again, Unlocked Democracy would be very supportive of. One of the major problems we have in, in the United Kingdom and in England in particular is the fact that we, we are still a very, very heavily centralised uh, nation where Westminster still dictates an awful lot of what happens uh, around the four nations of the United Kingdom, but even at a lower level than that. So anything we can do to push powers down so that the English towns and cities and indeed regions have a greater ability to uh, for instance, raise money uh, themselves to spend, but also are given powers such as a proposal that came out of the um, the Brown Commission report, which I think is a very sensible one, is the idea, for instance, that uh, local authorities should have the powers to take on job centres. As it happens, as a result, uh, principally of, of COVID, th this government did give a certain amount of funding to local authorities, district councils, for instance, which did not have a, a job centre in their area, gave them money to set up, in effect, job centres or, or hubs, uh, employment hubs, as some of them have been called. I think that is something, a sort, the sort of power that uh, should be uh, taken up at a local level because it will be uh, the local district council, the local uh, borough council that will often have the relationships with businesses locally. They will know what vacancies there are. They will know what skills are missing. So all of those things are good things that are in the uh, the report. But but some of the emissions, for instance, there are emissions around the powers that are going to go to Scotland or the powers that are going to go to Wales. A lot of people thought that the report would have a lot to say on that because one of the reasons for the report, or at least that's what we thought, was to try to uh, diffuse the arguments uh, of those who want independence uh, for Scotland. But actually, there's very little in there. So, I mean, again, I've, I've given a very long answer to say that I think there are still very valid proposals in there. Uh, the omission of PR was really regrettable. Of course, what we have had uh, from, from Labour Party members at their conference just three months ago was they voted in favour of proportional representation 
Um, and therefore, at least from the party members and indeed the unions, because the unions also voted for it, there is a commitment to that. It's just that the, the leadership of the Labour Party don't seem to be as committed as the members and the unions are. So I'm going to take that last question from a slightly different angle now. And, um, you know, we've had the the report has had a number of criticisms as we've discussed so far and some of that stuff that you just discussed about scotland and wales and devolution and so on um we had a guest earlier on the show uh, laura webster who's the editor of the national uh, pro-independence paper in scotland who was very critical of uh, that aspect of it in particular and we've obviously discussed the uh, shortcomings when it comes to proportional representation and other elements but even with all those caveats uh, this would still, with things like uh, House of Lords reform, a whole bunch of the other proposals in there, represent probably the biggest uh, constitutional change for the better that we've seen, uh, at least for a generation, if not much, much longer. Uh, do you think that's the case? Yes, but, I, but I, I do think it's the case. And I suppose the first question mark is whether any of it will actually happen. Because the the I think the impression that that I get from the Keir Starmer and the, the the leadership's position is that there are core areas that they will want to focus on, and uh, the economy clearly is one of those. Health is another. Uh, tackling antisocial behaviour, for instance, and it's not clear if that is they're going to be their priority. How much of what is in the Brown Commission report? is actually likely to get taken up by the Labour Party. I mean, or the, a, a Labour government, if that's if that's what happens after the next general election. One thing that does give me some, um, you know, some, some hope, of course, is that what the, the Brown Commission has done and what Keir Starmer, by endorsing it, has done, is highlighted that there are certain problems with our economy um, that are linked to the fact that we are so centralised as a nation, so that those towns and cities in England that I was talking about before, and indeed in other in, in the other nations, don't have the powers that they need. Um, but the, these problems about centralisation are also often the problems associated with our democracy, uh, that people's views are not reflected in those local decisions. They're denied local democracy because too many of those decisions are still focused in Westminster with ministers trying to take decisions for them. One area which I, I, I think we would all need to be careful of is that, for instance, there are some aspects of what the Commission report says about, for instance, every single, every single uh, town or council should have a plan for growth, a plan for prosperity. Historically, um, talking to people who worked in local authorities, for instance, historically under the Blair government, there was a period where local authorities were having to report on something like 200 different targets that the government thought that they should be measured with. We've got to make sure that the balance between giving those local powers, I think the balance should be giving people the flex, local authorities, local people, the flexibility to choose what they want, rather than necessarily having to report to central government, which has said each and every single uh, area has to have a growth and prosperity plan. And I rather suspect that if that's what they are saying, that central government may be drawing up for them exactly what they think should be in that growth and prosperity plan, uh, thereby taking away from local democracy and trying to impose uh, from the centre what they think such a plan should look like. And I think we've got to be very wary of that. So before I let you go and enjoy the rest of your Sunday, I just have one final question for you. And I guess when, when we talk about political democratic reform, uh, I find it's quite often easy for us to uh, get stuck in technicalities. So, uh, you know, often we'll end up talking about the relative merits of a preferential voting system or a multi-member constituency voting system, or we'll talk about the specific makeups of the, uh, uh, the upper chamber in Parliament. And often that can be quite turgid and difficult for people to engage with. So I wondered if you would be able to kind of uh, imagine you're speaking to an audience of people who aren't yet convinced about the need for democratic reform in the UK and 
uh, give your kind of overview and vision of kind of what Unlock Democracy's vision for a new democracy in the UK would be? Sure, that's a, a really good question. Uh, and you've correctly identified that one of the problems I think that organisations have is being able to uh, to put across the, these ideas in ways that are that are relevant to people. But I guess my my sort of elevator pitch, so to speak, my my 60 second explanation of, of what we're doing is, you know, people want to know that when they express views, that they have the chance to, first of all, elect people who are going to represent those views and, uh, and elect them uh, accurately according to how they have voted. That's what a proportional system does. People also want to be able to participate. They want to be party to decisions, not just by voting in an election once every four or five years, but there are other ways in which people can participate. And that's why as an organization, we promote uh, the idea of citizens assemblies. So that's that's a group of people who are chosen to be genuinely representative. It's not a self-selecting group of people who decide they want to, to, to express a view on a subject. It's uh, 200 people typically chosen scientifically with a methodology to make sure that they represent the whole range of views. They, they represent the whole uh, gender range, the whole uh, you know um, demographic range and so on. And that they are then given the task of working out often some quite quite difficult issues or finding solutions to difficult issues. In, in the Republic of Ireland, it was looking at the question of abortion and looking at equal marriage. And so people are given a chance to take part in some really critical decisions collectively and then feed in their recommendations to a political process. So it's about giving, making sure people's voices are heard through the people they uh, who elect, sorry, through the people they elect, but also giving them an opportunity if they want to, to participate uh, throughout the year, in effect, in making decisions that are going to affect their lives. And that's why it matters to people. Tom, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Chris. I uh, look forward to another opportunity, I hope, come back and talk Absolutely. about uh, Unlock Democracy. Thanks, we'll Chris. We'll definitely have you back in the future. So that was Tom Brake, who's the director of Unlock Democracy. I found that in interview and conversation absolutely fascinating. And I always enjoy speaking about democratic reform and the different ways that we can articulate demands for it. Um, if you're just joining us now, you're watching episode three of Bright Green Live. We have two fantastic interviews still to come today. Uh, if you're just joining us, hit that like button so that this show appears in more people's feeds. Um, before I bring our next guest in uh, shortly, I just want to sort my lighting out because I'm having some troubles with it now. Night has fallen. So I'm going to try and get the lighting right because I look slightly like I'm underground and that is too much light, so I'll tone that down. Um, I'm just going to take a moment to try and sort out my lighting. In the meantime, you're going to see me screwing around, carrying little bits of uh, fixtures and fitting. Hopefully, uh, by the end of it, we'll have something that has a semblance of light. Uh, bear with me for one minute. Okay, I think that is slightly better light. Uh, I've got a little bit of a shine above me. How do I counteract that? I will find a way. Uh, whilst I am trying to get my lighting sorted, or preferably without a giant wire streaming behind me like that, um, <laughs> let us know what you thought of that interview and that conversation with Tom in the chat. Uh, that light clearly is not... Right. Uh, let us know what you thought about that interview in the chat. Uh, uh, that interview with Tom in the chat and um, your thoughts on that. Any thoughts you have generally about political democratic reform in the UK and uh, any uh, comments, questions you have for our remaining guests as well. 
I'm wondering is that too much light? That's clearly too much light. Apologies, everyone, for me doing some feng shui towards the end of the show. I think we're going to turn that down, get that off. Okay, that's going to have to do. Apologies for all that messing around. It probably made not a blind bit of difference. Uh, so we are hurtling towards the end of the show. We've got about 90 minutes left. We have two brilliant guests still to come. Uh, so next up, we have Sonia Adasara from... Uh, who is a NHS doctor and a campaigner. We're going to be talking about the crisis in the NHS, what's causing it, and looking at some of the issues that are underpinning the industrial disputes in the NHS right now. We're also going to be discussing uh, privatisation and what role that has had in the um, in the problems facing the NHS. And we're also obviously going to be talking about how we uh, what policies we need to to protect the NHS and save the NHS and improve the NHS. And finally, our last guest of the day will be Phelim McCafferty. Phelim is the leader of Brighton Hove City Council. He is uh, the only Green Party leader, Green Party councillor in the country who leads a council where the Greens are the sole administration. We're going to be discussing the Greens record in Brighton Hove since they took over 18 months ago and also the prospects of them getting re-elected. Um, in May and uh, please do share the the, the uh, show stream on your socials and get any questions for Sonia and for failing in the chat apologies for the pause whilst I drink the only food I've had today I've had no solids today I'm like a baby um I to to keep going throughout the stream. I obviously can't or don't rather don't want to subject you to me eating on the live stream. So instead, I'm drinking blended fruit and oats and yogurt throughout the day. Uh, it's kept me going so far, but occasionally I have to drink from the cup. Thank you all so much for watching. Um, please do get those comments and questions coming in the chat. <clears throat> For those of you who are just joining us, you're watching episode three of Bright Green Live. We have been streaming since 10 a.m. So if I look a little worse for wear, that's because I've been sat here for six and a half hours and we'll be here for a remaining 90 minutes to uh, the end of the show. We have two fantastic guests left, Sonia Adesara and Phelan McCafferty. Please do let me know what you thought about all the interviews we've had so far. And please do get comments and questions in the chat for our final two guests as we close off the show. You can, of course, also tweet on the hashtag Bright Green Live. Any questions that you pop on there, I'll try and pick up as well. Uh, thank you to everyone who's been tweeting throughout the day, who's been in the chat, uh, our regular viewers, our new viewers, and all of our friends. You are all wonderful, and uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, we're aiming for 475 subscribers by the end of the stream. It's looking unlikely we're going to make it unless there's a late surge. We're 17 subscribers away from doing it. So if you haven't already, hit subscribe and you won't miss out on any of the future episodes of Bright Green Live, as well as any of the other interviews, videos and content we're putting out in the coming weeks and months. Hit that subscribe button and uh, have a great time. You'll get a notification every time we go live and you'll also get uh, our videos appearing in your subscription feeds. Uh, we put out loads of videos um, alongside our live streams and the clips from the shows. We also uh, have recently interviewed all the people who are seeking the Green Party's nomination for the 2024 London mayor election. Apologies, I need to... Uh, apologies that was the first sneeze of the day on the stream uh, I told you this morning that I was feeling sneezy and now I was finally hit uh, where was I yes so uh, on our YouTube channel we recently interviewed the three people who are in the running to be the Lin the Green Party's candidate for the 2024 London mayoral election Benali Hamdash, Zoe Garbett and Scott Ainsley uh, all three of those interviews are on the channel now. So after the show, you can go to our channel and watch those interviews at your leisure. It's a really important selection process because obviously whoever the Greens candidate is for, London, for the London mayor election will go into that election and will be the primary advocate in London for the Greens. But also they end up being the, one of the people in the Green Party with the highest profile uh, of everyone. 
because of the nature of that role, because the nature of the way politics in London works, because of the fact that they'll get loads of media gigs, they'll be one of the most followed people on social media. And so getting that candidate, uh, choosing that candidate is a really, really important selection process for the Greens. And whoever that candidate is, is going to be a hugely influential figure. So uh, we want to make sure that people have as much information and as insight into those candidates as they can. Uh, you can watch those interviews on our channel, as I said. Now, I've been sat here for six and a half hours, as you know. Uh, the only reason why this show and everything else that Bright Green does is possible is because we have the kind and generous support and donations of people just like you. We're not backed by billionaires. We're not backed by big business. We get our money exclusively from you. You are what makes this possible. You are what means that we can have an alternative media that can go into depth and have a detailed conversation about electoral reform like we just did with Tom Brake, that can give social movements and campaign groups like Just Stop Oil a fair hearing, that platforms green parties, that platforms the Labour left, that platforms trade unions in a way that no other media outlets will. Uh, so if you are able to, please do head to our donate page, which is bright-green.org forward slash donate. There's a link in the description on this stream. If you are able to, please do set up a regular donation. We ask people to donate about £5 a month. That's what keeps us ticking over. That's what keeps us being able to put out videos like this one. And that's what enables us to be independent of uh, the of, of of business, independent of vested interests, and it's what keeps us able to produce the radical independent media that we are known for. So please do head there if you are able to. It would be massively appreciated. But if you can't donate, one thing that is free is the like button. It does not cost you a penny, but it helps Bright Green out massively, and it means this video will appear in more people's feeds. More people will see it. More people will get to hear from our amazing guests. Our final two guests for the day coming up very, very soon are Sonia Adasara and Phelan McCafferty. We're going to be joined by Sonia at 4.30 and we're going to be talking about the crisis facing the NHS. What's underpinning that? What's underpinning the industrial disputes taking place in the health service right now? Uh, the role of NHS privatisation in driving the disputes and issues facing the health service and we will be talking about the policies that are needed to fix the health service too. That's all coming up in about three or four minutes time when Sonia joins us. After that, Phelan McCafferty, the Green Party leader of Brighton Health City Council, will be talking about the record of the Greens in administration in Brighton and Hove. That's all coming up very, very soon. Phelan, we've been at 5.15. He's our last guest of the show. We're finishing off sometime around 6 p.m. So please do stay tuned. We're on the home stretch, home straight, the final stretch, and uh, then you get to all enjoy your evenings and you don't have to listen to me anymore. But please do get your questions in the chat for Sonia, um, as I'd like to get as many of them as possible in advance so that I can line them up and put them to her when she joins. Uh, it's much easier for me to pick up questions in advance rather than during the interview. If you haven't already, follow us on the social medias. We're facebook.com forward slash brightgrn. We're at brightgrn on Twitter. We are at brightgreen online on Instagram. And we are at brightgreen on the UK server on Mastodon. Uh, that way you can find and keep uh, track everything that Bright Green does, all the interviews we put out on our YouTube channel, all the articles we publish on the website and much, much more. So make sure you give us a follow. The links are all in the description for this video as well. So there's no need to uh, transcribe from what I have said. You can find them all there instead. And of course, the most helpful thing you can do is to share the stream. Put it on your socials, put it on Twitter, put it on Facebook, send it on WhatsApp to your nan, whatever you want to do. Just make sure that more people get to see this because I think our guests are brilliant. From what you've told me in the chat and the feedback we've had in previous shows, you also think our, show, our guests are brilliant. So other people will too. So make sure you share the stream whenever you can. We will be going live with our penultimate interview of the day with Sonia Adasara in the book two minutes time get yourself nice and comfortable hit that like button line up some questions in the chat and uh we'll get going very very soon it's an absolute pleasure to be presenting this show again thank you all so much for joining a big shout out to the people who've been here since 10 a.m with me a big shout out to our regular viewers the likes of steve c and ben samuel and others who've been sat 
uh, pop a question in the chat throughout and so on. And also to all of our new viewers who've been with us for the first time, who've just discovered Bright Green, you are most welcome to. Uh, we're all one big Bright Green family here and you are a part of it. Uh, so thank you so much for watching and for joining us throughout the day. Whenever you've joined us today and whenever you found us uh, throughout your life. Sometimes, you know, you just don't know where a sentence is going to go until uh, you reach the destination. Um, that one was not where I expected it to finish. So Sonia should be joining us in a minute or so's time. And when she does, we'll get going with our penultimate interview. Please do get your questions lined up. and I'll put as many to, of them to her as we can. Anyone who's wondering, the reason I keep peering here is because this is where I have my command station of my running order, all my questions, everything like that. So apologies that sometimes I have to look here. I'm very, um, uh, I'm not very, I'm, a, I'm someone who relies on pen and paper. I'm not technologically advanced enough to get them on the screen or have an auto queue. I like having nice firm bits of paper to use uh, throughout the show. So that's why I'm looking here. Uh, but I can see that Sonia has just joined the call, so I'm going to let her in now. And whilst Sonia is connecting to the call and getting into the Zoom room, uh, I would just do a brief introduction so that you all know uh, who Sonia is. So Sonia Adasara is an NHS doctor and an amazing campaigner and activist. Uh, she's been at the forefront of campaigns against NHS privatisation, uh, against a whole on a whole host of issues, and is a well-known voice in the media. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be joined by Sonia today. Sonia, how are you doing? Good, thanks. Thanks for picking me up. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the crisis facing the NHS at the moment, and we're seeing loads of headlines constantly, uh, news bulletins talking about the crisis in the NHS. What's really going on in the health service right now? Yeah, so I think, you know, I think sometimes we can get a bit numb to the headlines because we keep hearing these same, same headlines of worst situation ever in the NHS. We're hearing about waiting times. We're hearing about, you know, A&E hospital waiting waits. Um, and I think the first most important thing to say is that this is something that hasn't just happened. It's been a situation that's been getting worse, slowly worse and worse year on year. Um, and I'd say for at least... You know, I think we've seen a steady decline in the conditions in the NHS over over the last five years, more maybe more than that. Um, and there's been a steady decline, um, and that corresponds with decline that we've had in funding for our health service. Um, and then it, I think we've now just got to the point where things are just falling apart. And I think the NHS was being held together by goodwill, by people working in the NHS, just making things work and making things happen. But it now has got to that tipping point where things are just disintegrating. Um, and this is not just also because of COVID. COVID did make things more difficult, um, but this was happening before COVID. You know, I remember, um, I remember it was like, I think it was maybe December or January, um, just before 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 COVID, so it was when it would have been um, just after the last general election, and I remember that winter, and I was working in A and E at that time, and it was just you know, it was bad. The situation was bad, and I remember thinking, I think I think it must have been January because I remember like looking at my phone in the in our staff room, and I saw like a news headline about this COVID virus. At the time, we had no idea what was you know what we were going to be hit for. And I just remember saying, like, I think in a sort of jokey way to my to one of the nurses that I was with, you know, imagine if this actually hit us, like, you know, and we sort of laughed about it nervously, and then it hit, and then um, so things were already bad. Things, you know, COVID didn't make things easier. It did did not make things easier. Um, and the situation has got worse. And it's you know, it's a combination of the main thing is like you know, underfunding of the NHS consistently year on year. Um. And 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 that has made you know working conditions more difficult. We've seen a decline in care, um, and we've seen a decline in funding at a time when actually um, the needs of our population, people are living older, people have more health problems. The needs of of the health needs of our population has been increasing, whilst funding has been decreasing. Um, 
And as a result, we've seen the de decline in standards um, as we've witnessed. So alongside all of that that you've described, at the moment we've got a wave of industrial action that's taking place within the health service. So you've got uh, the Royal College of Nursing going taking strike action across England and Wales for the first time in its history. You've had ambulance workers um, on strike and you've got the BMA uh, just starting balloting um, its members as well uh, for industrial action. What are the big issues that are underpinning those industrial disputes? Yeah, so I think it's three things. And I think it's, um, you know, firstly, it is, um, it, it may, I guess the job is becoming more and more difficult as you're trying to work in unworkable conditions. Um, so that, and we know that there is really high rate of stress, really high rate of burnout, really high rate of work related illness among NHS workers. And that's throughout the NHS. And again, that's something that's been getting worse and worse year on year. Um, you know, on, on top of that, you know, uh, the pay for NHS workers, you know, we haven't, seen, there's, for a lot of NHS workers, they're getting less in real terms paid than they did in 2010. So on top of working conditions becoming more difficult, more stressful, we're having a pay cut. Um, and then thirdly, I think probably this doesn't really, people don't think about this enough, but, you know, I guess if you are working in conditions where, um, I guess you can maybe, as NHS workers, you can maybe put up with hard conditions or put up with poor pay if you feel like you're giving good care. But I think for many of us, we feel that particularly in the last few years, that the care patients are getting is just not good enough. Um, you know, I work in general practice now and, you know, I guess I'm having so many conversations with patients where they're not having their cancer treatment or they're in severe pain and they're having to wait like a year to see the hospital, see the hospital consultant. Um, or I'm seeing patients who I can see that their health conditions have got worse um, because they haven't had the care that they should be getting. And that is, you know, that's something that is very um, emotionally quite difficult as a health professional healthcare professional to deal with and when you're having those conversations day in day out you have patients who are understandably angry and upset that they're not getting the care that they should get and that they deserve then that can make just doing a job quite quite emotionally difficult um so that's the three things so it isn't just about pay it's about working conditions and it's also about um it's about the quality of care that we're given and i think you know i think we just you know i guess because I was I was part of the junior doctor strikes. Um, and I think it's really important for people to sort of understand that NHS workers, we don't go on strike easily. And this is a cry. This is a this is not a cry. This is a scream for someone to say for the government to listen to us. And, you know, the declining conditions that I talked about and I've said, you know, it's been going year and year. We've all been us working in the health service have seen that decline happen year on year. And we've been speaking up. You know, we have been making noise about it. We have been raising an arm. We have been saying this is not good enough. In the last general election, there were lots of NHS workers that was really speaking up saying, look, when, you, you know, when you're voting in this election, look at what's happened to our NHS and think about which party is gonna be best to make our NHS fit for purpose. So we have been, we have been really speaking out about conditions and we have been ignored. Um, you know, and I, you know, when I was building the junior doctor strikes, we were, talk, we were, we were saying, look, look, if you don't make, if you don't pay people properly and don't make the conditions better, people will leave. And look what's happened. You know, junior, the reason why we have so many voter gaps is because because doctors are leaving. Um, and in general practice as well, like if you look at, I think I saw a stat, I think it's three out of five GPs are planning on leaving within the next five years. Now, these are not GPs that are retiring. These are GPs that are leaving early in the career. Now, that's, that's not a, that's not a small thing. These are doctors, these are people that have spent years studying then years in the further training spent loads of money you know getting getting to become a gp they are people that really you know i guess are you know gps in their heart and soul but they have been forced to this position where they're leaving general practice um and and that's because they just either that they're burnt out or they're not they know that they're not providing good care all the situations have got so bad that they just just can't endure it anymore so if people are leaving jobs that they've trained spent so much training in for and have spent their you know a good part of their life becoming becoming the doctor or that nurse we have to really stop and like listen um so these strikes are just uh, our NHS workers saying look please listen to us conditions are not good people are leaving and that's making making the conditions worse um you know if you're working in let's say a practice or a hospital where you don't have enough doctors or nurses but you have voter gaps it makes a job even more difficult um so that's that's what the industrial action's about. Um, so junior doctors, nurses have already gone on strike. Paramedics have gone on strike. Junior doctors are balloting. We probably will vote. You know, junior doctors probably will vote for strike as well. Um, and you know, the 
the cause of that is this government who's been refusing to listen and who have overseen the decline in our health service. So earlier on in the show, I spoke to John Bosco from We Own It, the anti-privatisation campaign group, about some of the effects of uh, privatisation in the NHS. Um, what role do you think that privatisation has had in the issues the NHS is facing right now that you've described? Yeah, so, you know, I guess we've seen an increase in private, a steady increase in privatisation over the past few years, I guess a much more we saw that increase go up quite significantly under the coalition government and then under and then under this current government. Um, and I think what's, I think I guess people probably don't often often know what privatization is happening or don't see it because um, it's often outsourcing. So what happens is services get outsourced to a private provider. Um, and so so you as the patient may not realize that it's a private provider providing that service rather than the NHS. Um, and I guess, you know, sort of there are two issues that 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 brings about. Um, number one is that you can get a. You can it can it fragments the NHS when you have lots of different things trying to work together, it can fragment the NHS. Secondly, you know, this won't be the same, won't be the case for all private providers. But, um, you know, I guess there is within the NHS, there is an ethos that you are doing that we work for the NHS. Patient comes first. Patients always our priority. Um, and I guess when you've got private companies, you know, the first priority will be to make profit. Um, and then the second or the third or another priority would be patient care. So, it, you know, there have been quite numerous examples now across the country where we've seen we've seen unacceptable care happen um, by private providers. Um, and then it can, you know, sometimes it's not big things, sometimes it could be small things. But, you know, I remember when in my last hospital that I worked in, um, we they um our patient transport system was done by a private provider and just small things would happen but small things that could really impact patients like you know elderly patients being left at the front door rather than be taken up to their bed bedroom or you know if we're five minutes late with a discharge then they'll say okay we're not, we're not doing it and then the patient then has to wait another few hours to be sent home so small little things but they do really sort of impact can significantly impact when we have you know frail people or elderly people the people that use the bulk of the NHS and I remember speaking to one of the um um uh, one of the guys that worked for the transport for that transport system um, and he said he'd worked previously when it was run by the hospital and then now he was working by this private provider and he said look you know the reason why is because this this company that runs it because first of all they pay us really rubbish and if you're sick or whatever you don't get paid properly secondly the company is actually a part normally it's a parcel delivery company and he goes the problem is this company thinks patients are parcels um, and it's, it's things like that, you know, it's just, you know, they, they, these companies don't always see, see patients as patients. And, and then that's why you then get decline in care. Um, and then, so, and it, and it just, I guess also, if we know, I know there's been lots of talk recently about using private providers to, to put down waiting lists. That already happens, actually, you know, we already have private providers using to, to reduce waiting lists, which you may think, fine, that can be in the good, the short term, bring down the waiting list, fine. But you've also got to remember that people working for these private companies, the doctors, the nurses, they are the same people that would be working in the NHS. So you're actually taking workers that would be working in NHS to these private companies who often sometimes, you know, particularly for doctors and nurses, they pay more than they'd get paid in the NHS. So you will see a shift of workers, which isn't good for our health service, and it does make it easier to fragment and privatise the NHS in the future. Um, and then secondly, so that's one thing, that's outsourcing. Um, the second thing, the increase in private sector in the health service is we've seen, particularly in the past recent years, when we've seen a real decline in standards in the NHS, and we've seen you know, waiting times for basic things like you know, hip hop be... 12 months and um, we've seen more or let's say just to see a hospital consultant you're waiting one, one year to see someone we've we've seen more and more people who are then choosing to go private I've seen that in my surgery and look I, do, I work in you know I work in Tottenham actually many of my patients are not wealthy but because they get so desperate then they are having to force to pay for pay for surgery or pay for things privately which is really expensive. And that, you know, a lot of my patients think you know, it's something that's a massive expense for them. Um, and I find that really worrying because now we've got this, this situation where people, people that can afford to are, are going private. Um, and that also just destroys the ethos of the NHS when you've got people that can pay for it, getting getting better care and getting quicker care than those that can't. Um, so that's really worrying. And that's that's significantly increased, you know, in the past 12 months. And that's set to increase if we don't see an improvement in our conditions in the NHS. 
So I've got one last question for you before I go to some questions from the chat. And so that's a call for viewers to please do pop questions in the chat on YouTube and I'll try and pick up as many of them as I can. Uh, but before we go to the chat, uh, my final question for you is what practical policies do you think that the NHS needs to solve these crises? Big question. <laughs> um, so I'll try and simplify it. I think um, we need to pay workers properly. Um, the reason why that we have 100,000 100, vacancies in the NHS um, and 120,000 vacancies in social care is because NHS workers are not paid properly. So you need to make it a job that people want to do. We need to train more workers, but we also need to make it a job that people want to do. And then also we need to stop the, I guess, the exodus of workers that's happening right now. Um, and make those conditions better. Um, so that's number one. Um, number two, you know, money is important. You know, healthcare costs money. Um, and compared to, if you look at European countries, if you look at countries like Germany, Switzerland, France, per person, they're all paying significantly more on healthcare than we do. So they're paying 10 to 15% more on healthcare than we do. So money is important um, and it is the underfunding of it. And, it, and you can, if you look at it, if you look at the graphs, if you look at standards, and if you look at money that's going to the NHS, it correlates quite scarily so fund the NHS properly healthcare costs but you know but health is important um, and I think if we value value health if we value people's you know being able to contribute to society then it's something that we really need to invest in and invest properly in um, thirdly, you know, social care um, you know the reason why we have these you know we have ambulances queuing for you know outside hospitals, the reason why that we have people, elderly ladies waiting, you know, sometimes 10, 12 hours for a hospital bed is because number one, we don't have enough hospital beds, but number two, that we have patients that can't be discharged because we don't have enough social care capacity. Now, I believe that we shouldn't just be increasing social care capacity, that we actually need to completely reform our social care because it's not fit for purpose, but that's a, you know, a big conversation, but actually thinking about a care system that works for all of us and that's fair and that's equal and that's just and provides good quality care for everyone that needs it. It's really, really important. Um, and then I think, you know, then beyond that, we can thinking about conversations about how to improve our healthcare system. It is, I think if someone's used our healthcare system and I guess young people often maybe don't realize this, but if you do have a serious health issue or if you've got multiple health issues, sometimes your experience of the health system can be quite fragmented. You have different people doing different things. It can it can all be a bit disjointed. And I think and that is also a result, again, of outsourcing and about the internal market has made the NHS quite fragmented. So having a uniform health and social care system is, is what you know I think what should be our should be should be the goal. And, and there needs to be some big thinking about how we do that. Um, and then lastly, you know, I guess health system is one thing, but the issue that we have in this country is that there is a, a there is a 10 year difference in life expectancy between those that are wealthy and those that are poor. And um, if you look at postcodes, you can see, you know, quite someone's postcode can basically determine how long they're likely to live. There is a 15 to 20 year discrepancy in healthy life expectancy. So that's the age in which people um, start to get sick to the point where it affects their ability to, to work and contribute to society. So 15 years, that's massive. You know, that's, and that is purely based on people's social um, and economic situation that's causing them to become, become sick because they are using, most of the time, using the same health service. Um, so we really need to be thinking about what is it what is it that that is making people making people sick and maybe people their lifestyle that what is it people's lifestyles that are making them sick um and that was something that really showed up in covid um you know the reason why we had really high death rates and higher than most countries in europe is yes because the response was bad but also because we had a lot of people who had health conditions and chronic health conditions that made them at risk of dying from covid but that also makes them at risk of dying from flu and all these other things um so having a real understanding that about that and thinking and, and investing properly in public health, which has actually been cut significantly more than the NHS funding. Public health funding has been completely savaged. So some public health departments have had 50% cuts in the past decade. So investing in public health, thinking about um, thinking about the policies that we need at a local government level and a national government level that allow people to live healthy lives, I think is really important and is should be also, you know, be what we think about when we're thinking about what type of health system that we want. 
So I've got a great question that's come through in the chat, which is from Ben Samuel. And it's a bit of a political question. So Ben um, asks, who do you think are currently the main uh, political allies and opponents uh, of the NHS? Yeah, so I think no one would be surprised if I say the Conservative Party, I wouldn't quite call them allies. Um, and the reason why I won't call them allies is because of what they've done to the health service. Um, if you, the, you know, the decline in health service that we saw has been under the coalition government and the current, current Conservative government. Um, and and I think, you know, they have they have watched that decline. You know, this hasn't been a sudden thing. They've watched that decline in standards happen. They've ignored not just health workers, they've ignored, they've ignored the health think tanks, they've ignored the experts. Um, they've overseen that decline in health standards. So I don't think they are a friend of the NHS. Um, I think if you, you know, I can't remember which ones now, but if you look at some of the prominent Tory cabinet people, um, if they are, if you look at some of the books that they've written in their early, early lives, they've, they, they discuss how actually they want to dismantle the NHS. They don't like the service that we have. Um, so I wouldn't call them, I wouldn't call them allies. Um, and I'd say, you know, I get, I would, you know, I guess the other political parties are broadly allies. Um, they should be anyways. Um, and, and, you know, the British public are allies. And I think, you know, we know consistently, even when actually st standards have been at their worst, the British public support the NHS because they know that actually they, people, under, people, I think, um, intrinsically understand the importance of health and intrinsically understand the importance of having a good quality health service to be there for you when you need it. So I think it's just something, it's quite natural that people want the NHS and believe the NHS and love the NHS because it is there for people when they need it the most and it is there for people when they're at the most vulnerable. Um, so, you know, I think it would be, it's, it is it is politically um, stupid for political parties to not have policies that will rebuild our health service and make it fit for, um, you know, make give us the health service that we deserve. Um, and that's about, you know, it's not just about protecting it, but it's also about making sure that our health service is giving quality care to everyone, which I think is just, it's just not happening right now. Thank you so much, Sonia. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks. Okay. So that was Sonia Adesara, an NHS doctor and campaigner, and uh, talking about the issues facing the NHS, the crisis that it's currently in, the issues underpinning the uh, industrial disputes, and much, much more. Uh, please do let me know what you thought of that conversation in the chat. Um, I'd love to hear what you thought. I always find Sonia particularly insightful and engaging and uh, has a wealth of knowledge and experience and understanding of uh, the NHS and, um, and how we tackle the issues facing it. Uh, so we have one final interview today, and that is going to be with Phelan McCafferty, who is the leader of Brighton Hove, uh, Brighton Hove City Council, and he's the sole Green Party, he's the only Green Party leader in Green Party Councillor in the country who's the leader of a council where the Greens are in sole administration. That was quite a mouthful. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the Greens' record in administration in Brighton Hove, the 18 months that the Greens have been in charge, some of the challenges they've faced, some of the successes they've had, and much, much more. He'll be joining us very, very shortly. We're hurtling towards the end of the show. I was hoping to get away with not taking another break uh, before the end, but I am going to have to take one. But please do let me know all your thoughts on the show so far and line up some questions for Phelan in the uh, meantime, and I'll pick up those questions and comments when I get back. We'll be streaming until 6pm. Phelan will be joining us very, very soon. Please do stick around to the end. Uh, I'll be back in a few minutes' time.
Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back. We are hurtling towards the end of the show on this third episode of Bright Green Live. And we have one final guest for you today, which is Phelan McCafferty. He'll be joining us very, very soon. I'm just going to have a quick look through the chat and any comments that have come in. So, Amy, thank you for your comment saying that Sonia was brilliant. I agree. Uh, she's always fantastic. And Steve M has put a little clapping emoji uh, for Sonia as well. Well done for the clap. That's great. Uh, and thank you all so much for watching throughout the day. Those of you who've been with us for a very, very long time. Those of you who are just joining us uh, now. You're watching episode three of Bright Green Live. We have just an hour left for the stream. And we have one final guest for you. If you haven't already, now is your time to do all the things that I've been asking you to do. So hit that like button. It doesn't cost you a penny, but what it does is it means that this video will appear in more people's feeds. More people will see the interviews with all our amazing guests. Uh, if you haven't yet pressed subscribe, press subscribe. It means that you'll make sure you get a notification next time we go live and you'll see all the other videos that we put out in the coming weeks and months. And please, please, please show share the show's stream link. Uh, just hit that share button, put it on your socials, more people will get to see the show. And of course, more people will get to see the fantastic interview we have coming up, but also can rewind and watch through the earlier interviews as well. So our final guest is Phelan McCafferty. He is the leader of Brighton Hove City Council, the only Green in the country that is leading a council where the Green Party is in sole administration. We're going to be discussing the Green Party's record in that administration and the uh, challenges it's faced and the success it's had. Please do get your comments and questions in the chat for failure and I'll put as many to, of them to him as I can. We've had a whole host of amazing guests today. I'm not going to run through them all, um, but I would love to hear your highlights. Who's been your favourite? Who have you learned the most from? What have you learned? And who have you enjoyed hearing from today? Um, we've had the likes of Sonia Adesara, who was just on talking about NHS privatisation. We had um, Tom Brake from Unlock Democracy on earlier. We had Laura Webster from The National. You can rewind and watch all those interviews throughout the show, or you can wait until all the clips come out on our YouTube in the coming weeks. Um, my mind has gone blank. I was going to tell you that we will be going live again on this show on February the 12th. And we have two amazing guests already lined up for that show. We have Molly Scott Cato, the former Green Party MEP for the southwest of England and Gibraltar. And we also have Mark Sawatka, the General Secretary of the PCS Union, lined up for that show as well. We'll have a whole host of other guests uh, still to be booked on that. Uh, I would love to hear your suggestions for guests on that show. Steve C has already suggested that we have someone on to talk about the impact of food on climate change. I'll try and get that book for the next show. It might be the one after. Please do pop your suggestions in the chat for guests we can book on future shows. And also let me know your reflections on the show so far. People, I can see a flurry of people joining. We'll be kicking off our interview with Phelan McCafferty very, very soon. Whilst you're waiting, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. We we're aiming to get 50 likes by the end of the stream. Sadly, we're just on 28, so we're not going to make it, but that doesn't mean we can't hit 40. So make sure you hit like. We were also aiming to get 275 subscribe, sorry, 475 subscribers by the end of the show. We are still 17 shy. I reckon we can make it, but it requires those of you who haven't yet to hit subscribe and make sure that you don't miss out on the future interviews and the videos and the live streams that we're putting out in the future. Whilst I've got you all here, uh, you may be new to Bright Green. To give you a bit of an intro, Bright Green is a online publication that uh, provides analysis, commentary, news, insights from the British left from the UK's Green Parties, social movements, the Labour movement, and so on. We provide ongoing news covering of, of all those things on our website, bright-green.org. We also provide commentary, comment pieces, opinion pieces from the great and good, key thinkers and organisers and activists and campaigners from across the left. We produce uh, this monthly uh, show Bright Green Live, which brings interviews with all those people and more. And we also regularly produce interviews on our YouTube channel, uh, standalone pieces 
for various this, different bits and pieces. So, for example, right now we have three interviews with the people who are seeking to be the Green Party's candidate for London Mayor in the 2024 London Mayor election. This show finishes at 6pm. If you want to spend the rest of your evening watching Bright Green, you can do so on our YouTube channel. You can check out those interviews and you can subscribe to stay in the loop. I have not seen many questions come in yet for Phelim, our next guest, so please do get your questions and comments coming through in the chat, and I will try and pick as many of them up as possible. Um, the easiest way to make sure your question gets asked is to ask it early, because it's much easier for me to line up the questions. Apologies, I need to... I forgot to unmute myself after I sneezed, but that is the second sneeze of the show. I apologize. I uh, woke up very sneezy today. I managed most of the show without sneezing. The last hour, it seems, I have succumbed to the uh, the power of sneezing. <laughs> I apologize for sneezing on camera. So very, very shortly, we'll be joined by Faley McCafferty, who is the leader of Brighton Hope City Council. Please do get your questions lined up for him in the chat, and I'll try and get as many of them answered as I can. As always, I'm also willing to take any of your questions or comments, so please do put them in the chat and I'll read as many of them out as I can. If you're not already, please do follow us on social media. We are at BrightGRN on Twitter. We are at BrightGreenOnline on Instagram. We are at BrightGreen on the uh, UK server on Mastodon. And on Facebook, we're on facebook.com forward slash BrightGRN. Big thank you to all of our regular viewers who've been chatting away in the chat and tweeting away on the Twitters throughout the day. Uh, the likes of Steve C, the likes of Ben Samuel, Vix Lauthier, Meg S. Foster, um, others who've been here throughout the show. You are what makes this show tick. And we couldn't do it without you. So thank you for all your comments, support, and your general viewership throughout the last seven hours. It's been a long old day. But one hour to go. We are nearly there. Let me know who your favourite interview, what your favourite interview has been, things that you've learnt and so on. That is much appreciated. And um, I'd be really keen to hear your suggestions for guests in the future as well. Of course, I'm going to do, I think probably for the penultimate time in the show, my push for you to support bright green financially so bright green doesn't have the support or the backing of big business and billionaires we rely solely on the kind generous donations and support of people just like you if you are able to we encourage people to set up a regular donation it's what gives us the financial security to plan for the future to ensure that we can continue running these shows and to do much 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 more so if you are able to please do set up a regular donation of about five pounds a month or as much as you can afford you can go to our website and there's an eight page bright-green.org forward slash donate. There's a link in the description down below as well. So you can find it there. And please do support us because we couldn't do what we do without our wonderful donors. I know there have been some of our donors watching throughout the day. Thank you so much. You are all wonderful humans, as is everyone that's watching, whether they're able to financially contribute or not. Welcome to the people who are just joining. You're watching episode three of Bright Green Live a eight hour live stream on the second Sunday of every month, which brings you interviews and discussion with leading figures from across the British left, from social movements, from the labor movement, from green parties, from the arts and so on. Uh, you will be hearing from Phelan McCafferty, the leader of Brighton Hove City Council very, very shortly. Please do get your questions and comments in the chat for Phelan as soon as you can. I don't think I've had any questions in for Phelan yet at all. So if you ask one now, you've got a pretty good chance of it getting asked. Just to give you a kind of overview of what we're going to be talking about. So we're going to be talking about the way that the Greens have changed Brighton High since they've been running the council uh, over the last 18 months. We're going to be talking about the big achievements they've had. We're going to be talking about the financial pressures that local councils are facing at the moment and how councils can uh, protect their residents from... Uh, austerity and the uh, protect services uh, for their most vulnerable re residents. We're going to be talking about uh, whether or not uh, the prospects for the Greens to get re-elected as the administration in Brighton Hove. They've got all-out elections coming up in May, uh, and so it's a big 
opportunity for the Greens to maintain control of the council. The interesting thing about Brian Hove is, yes, it is the, the only place in the country where the Greens have been the only party in administration. However, of course, it is also the case that they've only ever been in minority administration, which means there are more opposition councillors than there are councillors from the governing party. Uh, and also, interestingly, the Greens have never yet successfully held the council at a following election. So they, the first Green administration uh, took office in 2011, and then four years later in 2015, they lost uh, uh, power. They now are in administration, have been since for the last 18 months. A big electoral test is coming up this May when Le Brighton Hove has its elections and there's the possibility that uh, the Greens will maintain control of the council. However, it's going to be a challenging set of elections. We're going to be talking to Phelan about that. Uh, I've got great questions coming in in the chat. Um, and uh, sorry, Steve, see that you live in a super safe Tory area. <laughs> um commiserations to you and the residents of your area. I'm sure we can delve into some of the issues that people have raised in their questions in the chat. When Phelim joins us in about five minutes time. I would love to get general feedback on the show, what you like about it, what you don't like, which guests you thought were good, what you want to see more of. So get that in the chat as well before the end of the show. And uh, that's much, much valued. So um, thank you all so much for your comments, questions, thoughts so far on the show. We have hit 459 subscribers, so thank you to the person who was extremely obedient and did what I told them. Uh, we're 16 short of the 475 uh, subscriber target, so uh, you still have time if you wish to subscribe. It means that you won't miss out on anything we are doing you'll get a little notification every time we go live for these shows and you'll get all of the videos and interviews we put out uh in our in in your subscription feed so that you don't miss them uh the best way you can stay on top of everything bright green is doing on youtubes is to hit that subscribe button So a couple of people just joining. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you're watching episode three of Bright Green Live. We have been interviewing uh, just shy of a dozen guests throughout the day. Um, we had some brilliant uh, people speaking, some really insightful, inspiring people from across the left. And we have our final interview coming up in just a few minutes time with Phelan McCafferty, who is the leader of Brighton Hove City Council. Uh, please do get questions in um, the chat to uh, that I could put to Phelan. Uh, the, easier, the easiest thing for me to do is to put those questions to him if you get them in early so that I can see them in advance and I can plan them into the show. It's much harder if towards the end of the interview you start running the chat with your questions. So um, please do get them in nice and early. And if you have just joined, hit that like button, make me happy, make you happy and make this stream appear in more people's feeds as well. And if you're a fan of Brian Hove, if you're a fan of Phelan McCafferty, share the stream on social media because that means that more people will get to see it as well. Just checking, Phelan's not yet here, which is not unexpected because he's not due for another three minutes. So we'll just keep waiting until he arrives and then we'll crack on with our final interview of the day. Um, I wonder... If anyone has been here since the very start of the show, we've had people dipping in and out. I've seen some people who've been around for a while, but was there anyone here who's been here since 10 a.m.? If you have been, let me know in the chat and you'll get a big shout out and a gold star and commendations for your perseverance and your commitment to Bright Green Live. Obviously, people who've joined since then, you also get gold stars. You all get gold stars. You're my gold stars. Uh, you're all stars. Uh, but those who've been around for the full eight hours, you deserve a massive gold star. So let me know if you have been. Um, and I would love to know that because we have some people who watch the whole show. I know it, but they tend to be quiet. They tend to lurk in the background and don't engage with the chat as much, which is sad because I like the company. Thanks, Ami and Steve, for your questions for Phelim. I'm going to put hopefully uh, all of those to him when he arrives, um, but there should be space for other people's questions too, so please do get them in the chat. Uh, so Hannah Albrook, who is Deputy Leader 
of Brighton Hove City Council has just popped in the chat to say that she's sorry to uh, have not been here since the beginning as she was canvassing today with Phelan. Uh, so that is a reasonable excuse, uh, Hannah. I forgive you for that. You are still a star, especially if you're a subscriber to our YouTube channel and you've already hit the like button. Um, brilliant. So let me just see. Elite Sabre Coaching says that they have been here since the beginning. Elite Sabre Coaching, you win the uh, the official Bright Green Medal of Honour uh, in today's uh, episode of Bright Green Live for being here since 10am, for committing your whole Sunday to listening to me rabbit on and talk to much more interesting people than myself. Um, so Phelan has just arrived in the call, so I'm going to let him in and we're going to crack on with the interview once he has connected to the call and is in the Zooms. So Phelan is just joining the call right now. So as he connects the call, I'll just give him a bit of an introduction. So Phelan McCafferty is the Green Party leader of Brighton and Hove City Council. He's the only Green in the country that is leading a council where the Greens are the sole party in administration, which is no mean feat. So we're going to be discussing the 18 months that he's been leading the council for, 18 months that the Greens have been in administration, and the challenges and the successes that they've had. But before we get into all of that, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be joined by you today, Phelim. Phelim, how are you doing? Thank you very much, Chris. Um, and thank you very much for everything that you're continuing to do. Um, Really, really welcome being here and thank you for the invitation. The pleasure is all mine. So as I said earlier, the Greens have been in administration in Brighton Hove now for 18 months. How do you think the city has changed since you've been running it? Um, I think the city has had an enormous amount of challenges facing it. Um, I think we would all be more familiar with the 12 years of Tory government cuts and corruption. They've taken an absolute sledgehammer to your budget. Um, but what, we, what we've been trying to do is continue prioritising, making Brighton and Hove a greener and a fairer place. That's all at the same time as a whole series of events have put the city under enormous pressure. Um, an awful lot of the time, things that um, in local government, there are limits to what we can do about those things. There was the crippling pandemic, the cost of living crisis, chronic problems, hiring staff because of things like Brexit. Um, then we've been uh, heavily impacted by things like trusses, disastrous, mini budget. Um, we have the highest inflation in a generation. And to, to top it all off, we have a recession as well. So in spite of all of those things, um, I think we've done really, really well. And I know, and I know that the team of councillors down here have been uh, putting their heart and soul in uh, week in, week out, quietly getting on with running the place in spite of all of that. And um, we've had everything from a pioneering work on anti-racism to make our city fairer. That's being rolled out in our schools and across our social work teams. Uh, we've been providing free holiday clubs for kids on free school meals. We're building more new sustainable council homes and we're installing things like ground source heat, heat pumps in those. Um, we're providing more housing first payment placements, which provide a uh, wraparound support to people who have experienced homelessness. Uh, we're providing nature with a bit of respite, restoring the kelp off the coast down here. We're returning uh, an old golf course to nature, Waterhall. We're planting thousands of trees with historic investment. Um, we're regenerating our seafront at Black Rock. We, uh, just before Christmas, got um, bold plans through planning for Madeira Terraces. We've launched a school streets programme across the city that reduces the pollution associated with the school run. We're trying to safeguard our environmental and economic future with action plans for clean air and uh, for our precious downland. Um, we've created a fund to help um, some of our most marginalised residents with uh, food and advice through the cost of living crisis. That's now raised over £70,000. We are starting to have food donation points in council buildings. Um, we've won funding from the Department for Transport to improve bus bus uh, services and improve uh, cycling and walking infrastructure. We're uh, putting more support in place to help people with their council tax. We're working with um, a number of our neighbouring councils across Sussex to develop a cost cutting approach to making council homes warmer. And obviously then they'll be cheaper to heat and there'll be a lower impact 
on the environment, we've got a plan in place for council run sports facilities, and we've agreed the first secure cycle storage on streets, and we've opened um, a youth employment hub. So I'm hoping um, that some of that will be understood. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that our residents will really have a grip of some of those things going on. But we have been, in spite of all of the circumstances that I mentioned at the start, I think we've been hard at work um, and uh, we're very, very hungry for more of it as well. So you've rattled off a huge number of things there um, that you've been busy doing in administration. If you were to pick just one of them, what would you say is the biggest achievement you've had since uh, being in administration in Brighton Hove? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I, for, for me personally, I think things like the cost of living crisis and how that has compounded um, the effect on people on the absolute margins, people with nothing. Um, some of that work has definitely been um, really, really important. And um, for the people watching, uh, you'll recall um, that one of the things that we got was the £150 council tax rebate earlier in the year. And my idea with that was, well, OK, if you can spare that, then um, if you can spare that £150 to help someone who doesn't have that sort of money, um, then we set up a fund, we set that up with the Brighton and Hove Food Partnership and Local Citizens Advice here, and that's the fund that I was talking about earlier, that is over £70,000, so an awful lot of very generous people um, across the city have um, determined that they, they want to help people who are not as well off as them or is, uh, in as beneficial a position as them. And I think that does a number of things. It says what a fantastic place uh, Brighton and Hove is. It's got an enormous heart and we saw that the whole way through um, the pandemic. But what we've also been able to see with that is that people, in spite of the circumstances, you know, again and again, the doorstep at the moment, what I'm hearing is people understand that we're under an awful lot of pressure in terms of cuts and then funding. But what they're trying to do with us is um, try and create new systems of support for people in spite of the um the stark circumstances that we're in so let's talk about those stark circumstances then so obviously you've mentioned the more than a decade of austerity that local councils have suffered under and in brian hove you're going through the process now of setting your budget and you're setting that budget in a context where there's essentially a multi-million pound hole to fill so how are you planning on uh ensuring that you're setting a budget which tech services which the most vulnerable residents rely on? Um, I think it's been officially um, some of the worst years. The, the other leaders of unitary councils that I've spoken to the last two years have been among the worst that we've faced. Um, it's, it's not just COVID, it's not just the recession, it's not just cost of living crisis, but it's because they've all come on the back of our 12 years of Tory austerity that had left whole chunks of our kind of key service budgets in absolute tatters. At the autumn statement um, from Jeremy Hunt, uh, which ironically came um, as a Christmas present to local government, uh, gave us another £2 million of cuts. That means the budget gap here has increased to nearly £21 million. That means we're going to have to find um, over £8 million of savings to set a balanced budget this year. Um, people watching um, may or may not know this, but unlike other parts of local government, uh, other parts of government, local government has to set a balanced budget. Um, since 2010, that means that 110 over 110 million pounds has been stolen from Brighton and Hove with, with cuts that are going to significantly harm our most marginalised residents. Through all of it, what has been a, a really a cynical repeat message from the Tories is that they want to shift the blame for that from ministers on to local councils. I think what we are really beginning to see, and, and this budget is going to be no different, sadly, is that cuts are a real false economy. What we've needed like never before is an invest to save approach with uh, with you know quality public services are funded by taxes on the wealthiest and the energy giants. And that, that's what's been so disappointing. I'm listening to Keir Starmer of like kind of talking about how uh, we need to go back down the route of of talking uh, to the private sector. Actually, no, we don't. What we need is, is fair taxation, don't we? Um, one important example for the certs, um, just out of the autumn budget, just how out of touch the Tories are, um, was that they thought that uh, nearly three billion for adult social care was going to be enough. Actually, councils need somewhere in the region of 13 
billion. Um, and I think that just gives you a glimpse of number one, that they do they care? Um, do they know? Um, who will ever know? But also what what we're trying to do with the budget at the moment is set it at a period of time when we know, and this is where all the strikes are. Are, are happening is that wages aren't keeping up with inflation and um, the OBR told us as part of the autumn statement that incomes are going to come down seven percent in the next few, next few years and um, we know that that combined with high interest with colossal cuts residents are going to be paying more for less and then as need has mushroomed from the cost of living crisis the demand then on us as a local council has absolutely skyrocketed look I'm really really clear we as Green Councillors have done and will continue to do what we've done all along, which is protect council services where we can. But the vicious level of the cuts to Brighton and Hove at the moment being there's limited funds and there's limited options left. Um, but that's why we've been really, really proud to work with our value trade unions and indeed the Labour Party for the Chancellor to adequately fund our city. That's been as part of a, a campaign understood as uh, give it back, which rightly keeps the focus on the Tories and the Treasury. There are millions for Tory funders through the PPE scandal, but councils are being stripped of their budgets uh, at the same time. In terms of how we do, how we conduct that discussion, we're conducting the discussions with trade unions and the other political parties, trying to warn them and advise them about the stark reality of the budget. I have to be really clear, it's another very dark chapter for our city and the council is likely to look and feel quite different by the end of the process. Um, I think another thing I really need to mention is that um, we proudly to date been a really high spending council for things like child, children's services. That era may be coming to an end. But I think through all of it, as I, as I said earlier, Greens in the steering wheel in Brighton and Hove um, has meant that things like children's centres, toilets, uh, libraries have been protected and it's no it's no mistake that um, Greens were in control of the council in those first years of austerity and unlike councils across the country um, we didn't cut libraries we didn't cut children's centres we didn't cut toilets and that's why we still have them and um, I think there's a broader discussion here as well about um, if we genuine say over powers if we genuine tax raising uh, abilities locally like other European countries we simply wouldn't be here. I think we would be using things like a tourism tax or locally raised taxes to put our city first. Um, so I think we need to talk, yes, about the direct consequences of, of not just 13 years of Tory government, but we also need to talk about just the, the broken nature of, of local government in this country. We need to talk about why we are one of the most centralised countries in Europe. And we need to talk about why government ministers um, refuse to trust people like me and councils around the country, even though poll after poll tell us local councillors are trusted far more than ministers to make the right decisions for communities. So at the start of this conversation, I pointed out that you are the only Green who is the leader of a council uh, where it's only the Greens in administration. Uh, but across the country, Greens are increasingly entering uh, administration in councils, uh, often in coalition with other, well, always in coalition with other uh, parties at the moment. Um, what advice would you give to Green councillors who are entering administration across the country? Um, I think it's a really, really exciting period of time. It's a, it's a real flourishing of talent um, in our party. We're increasing in numbers, we're increasing in confidence all the time. We're a significant force in local government that we just simply weren't when I was first elected um, 12 years ago. That means there's a lot more advice, there's a lot more experience for colleagues who end up in positions of control. And I know that um, even in the last sort of year, that Greens have been asked to take over the running of, of councils to, 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 um, to help run councils, and, and that will continue. I think my top tip um, is quite simple. It's to keep listening, to keep reaching out, keep talking to the communities that you represent to ensure that you're doing what your communities need. We know full well that um, we rarely get the credit for the amount of hard work, but Greens have to put in so much hard work um, and we don't have the ability to let our work slide like um, some of the other parties. So I think my top tip would be um, just keep that hard work in the communities um, going and keep listening um, and keep talking. And so I have one final question for you before I go to some questions from the chat. And uh, my question is about the 
upcoming elections in Brian Hove. So in May, Brian Hove has all out elections. So every single councillor is up for re-election. Um, viewers may not know, but the Greens didn't come to power in Brighton Hove as a result of becoming the largest party after the last election. Uh, they came to power as a result of the Labour Party losing a series of councillors through uh, through um, defections and through suspensions and expulsions. And so there's a challenging set of elections up coming up in May where the Greens are currently the administration, but didn't emerge from the last election as the largest party. So I wanted to ask you what you think the prospects are for the Greens retaining control of Brighton and Hove um, after May. Um, I, I think you made an interesting point there about an upcoming challenging set of elections, but we've had no overall control in Brighton Hove for decades, um, and I'm not sure you get very good odds on that changing soon. However, we will, of course, be aiming to retain control of the council, and I'm confident uh, we're going to do that. The question will be with how many more councillors. And we've only had two years, so needless to say, there's a whole load of work um, to be done. We're really hungry for more success. We're driven to do what we can and what's best for the community. You've reminded viewers um, that we're an administration now in part due to Labour collapsing. We had to step in and study the ship and guide the city through the worst years of the pandemic when Labour sadly just abdicated responsibility to the city's residents. I think what's interesting now is that Labour are now trying to take back the administration by trying to blame us for um, government cuts and working with us to challenge uh, the Tories. Um, I think I think there's also a, another emerging part of the picture that's quite interesting as well, which is that Labour have determined that they don't even trust their local members to select candidates or to write literature. Those things have been grabbed by the regional and national uh, Labour Party. So I think what's happened in the last few years, sadly, is um, a different sort of relationship with Labour, but I'm I'm really, you know, I'm really, really proud of the work that the team have been doing day in, day out. My focus is to continue delivering just that right up until election day. We've got an outstanding set of candidates standing across the city. They're out every week listening to residents across the city and presenting our vision for Brighton and Hove, and we'll stand by that vision. So I've got a great question that's come through from Steve C in the chat. So Steve says uh, that they live in a super safe Tory area, not in Brighton Hove. Um, and they've asked how much of the Green Party's success in Brighton Hove is due to the city generally being a progressive city with progressive voters? Um, and how much do you think that the success that you've had in Brighton Hove could be replicated for the Greens to break through in other areas? Um, I think both are true. Um, I think you know a, a glance at the a glance at the census figures from last week will tell you that things like LGBT populations have been attracted to moves uh, to the areas of, of Brighton and Hove. And I know that Brunswick, the area of the city that I represent, um, was one of the I think it was number five and in, in the in the top sort of twenty areas um, that have attracted LGBT plus populations. I think that's in part because um, those populations have fled here from other places and um, uh, kind of refugees from from other backgrounds and other places so that lends itself of course it does to a different sort of conversation that we might be having at 20 miles to the north or, or 20 miles to the east or west um, but I also think um, that some of this is about um, the space in which greens have to carve out for ourselves and um, let's not forget that the only way that we broke first past the post to get Caroline Lucas elected um, in 2010 was basically through a national mobilisation of all of our members and our sister parties around the world joining us as well. So actually, I think um, we put an awful lot of hard work into uh, getting elected and staying elected. And I think that's that's definitely part of, of the picture that, that we we um we kind of overlook at our peril in terms of any analysis of, of where Greens are elected. Um, I do think as well that um, when Greens are elected and um, that what the electorate get back uh, on the whole uh, are really hardworking people committed to the local area and when they get those Greens elected they like what they see, they understand the value of a Green in the room and they want more. 
So one final question for you from the chat. And you talked earlier about Brian Ho being in no or, no overall control for forever and that producing particular political dynamics. Um, so Ami has asked, are, are all political parties in Brian Ho working well together? Um, obviously, you rely on votes from other parties to get things through. Uh, you're obviously going to be relying quite heavily on that for the passing of your budget. Um, talk a little bit about the, the, the situation with collaborative working with other parties. Yeah, like I think I think um the the set piece bit, the stuff that will end up being webcast to the public, um, a lot of that will be um done in a, a kind of a pitched kind of pol politics as theatre sort of way. But actually, the way that um most councils and m most democracies, let's be honest, work is through an awful lot of very unglamorous, unseen work that happens in the background. It, it, it'll be done through um, working groups. It'll be done through um member panels uh, for things like housing it, it, it'll be done through um, a whole load of different boards and meetings that councillors otherwise um otherwise do away from the glare uh, perhaps uh, of a webcast meeting but nonetheless really really important in terms of oiling the wheels of democracy to keep churning out decisions and, and to make democracy effective um a really good example of how we've dealt with that kind of new overall control dynamic, if you like, in Brighton and Hove has been that uh, we have monthly meetings of the leaders of the political parties that that um, tries where possible to, to kind of get decision making, keep it as smooth as possible. Obviously, the, the, there's there's going to be um, disagreements. There's going to be um, votes that don't always go your way when you're um, in a um, minority administration with new overall control. And with the committee system, of course, let's not forget um, that particular um, part of the dynamic. But those are all parts of um, a welcome environment for me, certainly in terms of you have to impress upon people around you why then your arguments are good and wh why they're sound and, and why other people need to come with you. Um, whereas, of course, if if, if we had um, the cabinet system, which um, an awful lot of councils still have, but we're we're getting there. We're we're we're, we're convincing others um, every month of coming over to the committee system. Um, means that um, minority control, majority control, um, wouldn't matter. You, you you would simply be able to impose uh, decision making when you don't necessarily have the numbers on the ground, and and that to me. Um, is a bit of an affront to democracy. And I think the committee system wins hands down in terms of allowing backbenchers, the leader of the council, the chair of the committee, as much say as each other in terms of um, in terms of governance, in terms of ownership as well of decision making. Hey Liam, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for joining me. A pleasure. Thanks very much, Chris. Thank you. And of course, best of luck in the upcoming elections. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that was Thalia McCafferty, the leader of Brighton Hove City Council and our final interviewee for the day. Thank you all so, so much for watching throughout the show. Uh, before I let you all leave, I, of course, have a few final things to say to you, uh, and I will read out lots of your comments that come in in the chat before I depart. Uh, the first thing I have to say to you is if you haven't already, please do hit subscribe. If you've enjoyed this video, you will enjoy the other interviews and videos that we put out as well. Um, sorry, there's more spam in the chat. Uh, this, this spam bot thing, it's not something I've dealt with before. Hopefully that's all gone. I was telling you to subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss out on any of the other interviews and videos we put out in the coming weeks and months, including our future live streams, which you'll get a notification for if you hit subscribe. Um, of course, Bright Green doesn't have the backing of billionaires and big business. We rely solely on the kind of generous donations and support of people just like you. So please, if you are able to head to our donate page on our website, the link is in the description uh, and set up a regular donation if you're able to. It makes a massive difference. Uh, it means that we can put out these videos. We can continue to do all the things we do independently uh, without big business and vested interests dictating what we do. So if you value and appreciate independent media that platforms people like <clears throat> Phelim, like Sonia, like all the people we've had on today, then please do set up a donation because we can't do what we do without you. So the donate page is in the link to the, in, in the description. Please do click on it. Set up a regular donation if you are financially able to. And of course, 
You can find all of Bright Green, Bright Green on all the social media channels, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Mastodon. Just search us, we'll be on there. Um, if you've missed parts of the show, don't worry. The whole show will be still on our YouTube channel once we've gone off air. And we will also be putting out individual clips of the interviews that uh, we've conducted throughout the day. So uh, you can catch up there when they go live over the coming weeks. Uh, before I depart, I'll just read some of the final comments that we have in the chat. So Amy says, thanks so much. Awesome video. Well, thank you, Amy, for being a part of it, not just in the chat, but also as one of our guests earlier today. Um, Steve C says uh, that they learned a lot again today. Great interviews. Thanks. Steve is one of our regular viewers and a regular in the chat. So thank you, Steve, for being here throughout the show and for your continued support for Bright Green. I think I've caught up with all the comments and questions in the chat. So the only thing I have left to say is thank you all so, so much for watching. The next episode of Bright Green Live will be on February the 12th, where we'll be joined by Molly Scott Cato and Mark Sawatka and a whole host of other guests. Please do tune in and join us there and put it in your diary. Subscribe to make sure you don't miss it. That's it from me today. And of course, I will see you all very, very soon.